Chapter 12 Hail, sunbeams in the east are spread. Leave, leave, fair bride, your solitary bed. No more shall you return to it alone. John Donne, Epithalamion, at Lincoln's Inn If it hadn't been for Rose, M might have forgotten to move at all. She almost hadn't recognised him. She'd always thought him a handsome man, but now, seeing him waiting at the altar, waiting for her, stern and severe-looking in his uniform, with his tight-fitting, heavily-braided scarlet coat, white breeches, and gleaming high boots, he was magnificent. The sight of him quite took her breath away, and for a few moments had robbed her of all intelligent thought. Thank goodness Rose still had her wits about her. She had given Emma a discreet shove in the small of her back and hissed, Go on, Miss Westwood. And Emma had recollected herself and started the long walk down the aisle. To marry this magnificent man, this stranger that she hardly knew. The church smelled of pine, and when she noticed the little poses with the white wax flowers tied to the end of each pew, she realized the reason for the flurry of wax flower-making that had occupied the girls at the school in the last week, each flower made with love for her wedding. And there they were, all her girls, smiling, nodding, a few waving, all misty-eyed, some already weeping. Her eyes blurred. She blinked hard to chase the tears away and tried to smile. She would not cry. She would not. This was not the romantic wedding they were all dreaming of. It was a convenient arrangement, nothing more. She reached the altar and placed her hand cold and nerveless in his. Dearly beloved, the ceremony passed in a blur. Ordained for the procreation of children. Yes, children, she fastened onto the thought. She ached for a child of her own. If any man can show any just cause. She waited, tense, as if somehow ridiculously there would be a line of people ready to come forward shouting, Stop the wedding! But of course, nobody made a sound. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? There was a small stir of surprise in the congregation when Miss Mallard stepped forward to give M away. It was unconventional, but not illegal. M glanced at Lord Ashenden, but he made no sign of either approval or the opposite. He looked straight ahead, his face stern and unchanging. Wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband? She heard her voice repeating the vows, sounding admirably calm and collected, as if someone else were making the responses for her. She didn't feel at all calm. Serpents writhed in the pit of her stomach. With this ring I thee wed. She felt the gold ring slide onto her finger, and it was warm, not cold, from being held in someone's hand, his hand. With my body I thee worship. She tried to swallow and couldn't. I pronounce that they be man and wife. Man and wife? It was done. There followed prayers and a sermon and psalms and communion and the signing of the register. And she went through them all in a daze, making all the right responses, but all the time one thought ringing in her brain. I am married. I am Lord Ashenden's wife. The wedding breakfast was, M supposed, a rousing success as far as Miss Mallard was concerned. As well as Lord Ashenden's family and a few friends, mostly of his aunt, M had a bare handful of her own friends attending and some acquaintances from church. The rest had been invited by Miss Mallard, apparently with a view to highlighting what she had come to regard as her own personal triumph. Three duchesses, two marchionesses, five countesses, six viscountesses, and now our beloved Miss Westwood has become the Countess of Ashenden. 
If M heard her say it once, she heard it a dozen times. And guess who was the partridge in the pear tree? M talked to everyone, acting much as if this were one of the usual school events involving prospective parents. Lord Ashenden introduced her to his best man, Mr. Galbraith, and a couple of distant cousins who had travelled from adjacent counties to attend the wedding. Her bridal attendants, Rose and Lily and Georgiana, who'd muttered that she only answered to George, looked fresh and young and lovely in varying shades of pink to palest lilac, the first time in forever, Rose told her, that they'd been allowed to wear colours. Lady Dorothea, dressed in deep purple, was busy explaining to everyone that it was her late nephew's desire expressed in the strongest possible terms in his will that nobody should wear mourning for him, and that Ashenden, as the head of the family, had made it an order. You all meet most of my relations when we go to London, Lord Ashenden murmured in her ear. So close she could feel his breath on her skin, she jumped. And when shall that be? M asked, realizing she had no idea where she was going next, not even where she would spend the night tonight, her wedding night. She was wholly in her husband's control now. Soon, he told her, I need to attend to a few matters at Ashenden Court, my principal estate first. And where is Ashenden Court, my lord? He said as if he expected her to know. In Oxfordshire. And when she continued to regard him with a faintly quizzical air, he added, Not far from Stanford in the Vale. You'll see it tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yes, it will be too dark to see anything by the time we arrive tonight. Tonight? Yes. He glanced at a clock on the overmantel. We leave in half an hour. Half an hour? she echoed, feeling somewhat like a parrot. But I haven't... Haven't what? Packed? His brows drew together. Surely you anticipated a bridal trip? I did, of course, she told him. Foolish of me, no doubt, but I assumed I would be consulted on the matter, and at least asked whether I would wish to undertake a long journey by carriage on my wedding day. She gave him a cool smile and went to begin saying her goodbyes, a little knot of irritation stiffening her spine. She supposed an earl would be naturally autocratic, especially one who'd been an officer for most of his adult life. But she didn't have to like being ordered about like one of his soldiers. She'd assumed he would have engaged a suite at York House or one of the other premier hotels in Bath, or that they would spend a few days at some grand home belonging to one of his friends or relations. It had even occurred to her that they might sleep the night at Lady Dorothea's, though that was not ideal. She would rather have as much privacy as possible for her wedding night, because that was a hurdle yet to come. The carriage pulled away to a chorus of goodbyes and well-wishes, some of them surprisingly tearful. M waved through the carriage window until the school was out of sight. Battling with unexpected emotion herself, she sat back against the well-padded leather seats and found Lord Ashenden's hard grey eyes observing her closely. Without a word, he handed her a large white handkerchief. She took it and wiped away the few tears that dampened her cheeks. You are sad to leave. She thought about it. Not really, but I've lived there for most of my life, pupil and teacher, and... I have friends there. She'd been content enough at the Mallard Seminary, but never really happy. She had been granted refuge there seven years ago and was grateful. She'd loved working with the girls but they passed through the school and went on to make new lives for themselves, no doubt never giving M or any of the teachers another thought. M's future prospects had been depressingly predictable. Now, 
Married to Lord Ashenden, she had no idea what the future would bring. It was exciting. And a little daunting. You will be able to visit your friends when you visit my aunt. I know. But it wouldn't be the same. What friendships she'd made had developed through proximity and habit mostly. He glanced at her maid, sitting quiet as a mouse beside her. You will too, uh... Millie, M told him. Miss Mallard had told M that Millie should wear her thickest coat and take a rug as she had been riding at the back of the carriage, but Lord Ashenden had handed M up then turned to Millie and indicated she was to ride inside as well. The conversation for the next few miles was general and a little stilted, consisting mainly of comments on the passing scenery. Millie's presence prevented anything intimate or personal from being discussed, for which M was grateful. Was that why he'd seated the girl inside, or was it kindness on his part? It was a cold day, and his coachman was wrapped and muffled to the eyebrows. She hoped it was kindness. At the first stop to change horses, Lord Ashenden produced pillows and rugs from a compartment inside the carriage, saying, Get some sleep if you can, it's a long journey and we won't arrive until long after nightfall. M and Millie wrapped themselves warmly and snuggled down. The carriage was comfortable and beautifully sprung. Millie dropped off quickly, but M found herself feigning sleep. She was too aware of Lord Ashenden. At first, he simply watched the scenery slip by. Then his gaze came to rest silently on her. She could feel the weight of it even though her eyes were shut. Was he also thinking of the wedding night to come? She was wound tense as a spring. A blast of sound woke M from a fitful doze. Hawkins requesting the gates be opened, Lord Ashenden explained. We're here then, she tried to peer out, but could see only the carriage lights and shadowy darkness beyond. She heard the coachman grumbling. Who, who, Lord Ashenden and his lady, of course, who did you think? And you knew we was coming, so why the hell didn't you have the gates open and waiting? The gatekeeper mumbled something she couldn't make out, and the gates opened. The carriage passed between two large brick pillars and continued along an avenue of twisty old trees so ancient their branches met overhead. It was like passing through a tunnel. Use, Lord Ashenden commented, planted by some long-dead ancestor. Ashenden Court came into view. Lights were blazing from a dozen windows. It was originally built in the 16th century, a manor house, but my great-grandfather had it extended and modernized last century. He added the wings, but you'll see it all in the morning. The carriage halted and half a dozen servants came running down the front steps to greet them. Lord Ashenden introduced them all to M, then said, Mrs. Moffat, the housekeeper, will show you to your room. Wash? Refresh yourself, and when you're comfortable, come down to the dining room. You must be famished. M wasn't in the least bit hungry, quite the opposite. Entering the house, she followed the housekeeper and caught a glimpse of what must have been a medieval hall, a great, gloomy cavern of a room. It was panelled in dark wood with an arched, smoke-darkened ceiling crisscrossed with heavy wooden beams. The walls bristled with weapons, swords, blunderbusses, pikes, shields, and antlers. Knights, or rather their suits of armour, stood sentry at each corner of the room, watched over by the dull, reproachful eyes of a dozen or more mounted and stuffed animal heads and half a dozen portraits of dour and disapproving gentlemen, presumably her husband's ancestors, a roaring fire blazed in a huge old stone fireplace. The light thrown by its flames causing the knights and weapons to glitter and the dead eyes of the dead beasts to gleam. This way, my lady. 
M followed the elderly woman upstairs. Twenty minutes later she was seated at one end of a long, highly polished table. Lord Ashenden sat at the other end. Servants flowed back and forth between them, serving what the housekeeper called a simple meal. Soup, roast chicken, a dish of vegetables, and a custard tart. And wine. Several different kinds. One with soup, one with chicken, and so on. M ate very little, and drank even less, though she knew that wine might help relax her. It might also cause her to throw up. There was little talk exchanged. They were seated too far apart for it to feel in the slightest bit conversational, and she wasn't about to shout commonplace pleasantries at him. After what seemed like an age, Lord Ashenden made a gesture and the servants silently withdrew. He set his napkin aside. You're not eating. I'm not hungry. The serpents were back, writhing in her stomach. There was a short silence, then he said quietly, Would you prefer to delay the wedding night? Wait until you are less tired and we are better acquainted? No. He gave her a searching look. You're sure? I'm sure. She wanted to get it over with. Very well, then. I'll join you in your bedchamber in half an hour. Cal sipped his cognac slowly. He had never lain with a virgin before. He'd have to take it slow and careful. Gently does it. He closed his eyes, like restraining wild horses. He had wanted her, dreamed of taking her ever since he had kissed her that one time. One taste and fire in the blood. But he would control himself, tonight at least. He finished his cognac and went upstairs. His valet was still abroad, but his father's elderly valet, Higgins, had unpacked and put all his things away and was waiting with hot water. Higgins seemed to have been kicking his heels here for the last year. Had Henry done nothing at all to organize the estate? Cal had no need for a valet, but Higgins waited hopefully, so he allowed the man to help him remove his coat, waistcoat, and boots, then dismissed him for the night. Higgins left, carrying Cal's boots. He stripped to the waist, washed, cleaned his teeth, and then, as an afterthought, shaved himself carefully. Her skin would be tender. He dried his face, splashed on a little cologne water, and combed his hair. He turned and saw that Higgins had laid out a nightshirt and dressing gown on his bed. A nightshirt? He never wore the things. But she was a virgin. Maybe he should wear it, so she was not too shocked by the sight of a naked man. A naked, erect man. His body was already thrumming with anticipation. Start as you mean to go on, he stripped off the rest of his clothes and shrugged into the dressing gown. Would she even know what to do? What he was going to do to her? He'd heard stories of ladies who had no idea of what passed between men and women, who'd screamed and fought on their wedding night, who'd been horrified and disgusted by the whole process. Of course, the first time was supposed to be a little painful, but he'd always heard that if you took care with a virgin, took things slowly, made sure she was well warmed up, her passions ignited and her juices flowing, the pain would be negligible. Trouble was, he'd never taken a virgin before. His previous lovers had all been experienced women who knew what they liked and demanded he give it to them. Cal prided himself on his ability to ensure a woman's satisfaction as well as his own. This was his wife. First time or not, he would do his best to make it good for her. He knocked softly on the connecting door. M lay in bed, waiting, tense as a violin string, straining her ears. She could hear him moving about in the dressing room that connected their two bedrooms, 
the low hum of male voices. Talking to a servant? A few splashing noises. A lot of silence. She'd washed quickly using the French rose vanilla soap that was a gift from one of the girls and cleaned her teeth. She slipped on her bridal nightgown. A gift from a favorite former pupil, Sally Destry, now married and a countess in London, arriving in a box from something called the House of Chance. It was unlike any nightgown she had ever seen, peach silk almost transparent, with soft, loose ruffles that almost, but not quite, preserved her modesty. If ever she needed a nightgown like this, it was tonight. Then a knock, and before she could say a word, the door was open and there he stood, a dark silhouette against the light in the room behind. You haven't fallen asleep then, he murmured. Her laugh was a little forced. He was wearing a silk brocade dressing gown in dark reds and golds. There was a deep V of bare skin at his throat and a slight dusting of chest hair. She had left just one candle burning beside the bed. I suppose you would prefer darkness, he said. She made a non-committal sound. She'd prefer some light. She wanted to see him. But that wasn't very bridal, she supposed. He snuffed the candle out. The room was dim, lit only by the light from the fire dancing and ephemeral, just enough for her to see him. She was glad of it. He was worth looking at. He sat on the edge of the bed and leaned over her, his arms braced on either side of her body. He smelled clean and warm and his cologne was light, bracing, enticingly masculine. It will be all right, you know. Em hoped so. She was trembling a little. She shouldn't be, but she couldn't help it. She ran her tongue over her dry lips. He made a low sound deep in his throat, bent and touched his mouth to hers. The lightest of caresses, a bare brush of skin against skin. Masculine aromas teased her senses, heat spice, a beguiling hint of tooth powder and brandy. He teased, tantalized, aroused. She wanted more, heard a soft murmur and realized it came from her. His fingers were in her hair, cupping her head, angling her mouth to him as he eased her lips apart. The taste of him flowed into her, potent, dark heat of man. His mouth, sought, demanded a response she hadn't expected, hadn't known was in her. His mouth enslaved her. Ripples of sensation washed through her. She melted, mindless, clutching onto him as if she were falling, not pressed beneath his hard, heated body. He cupped her breast, brushed fingers across her nipple, and a jolt of pleasure pain heat speared through her. She arched herself against him, moving restlessly, not knowing what she craved except more. He sat back, a sudden withdrawal that abruptly chilled her. Her eyes flew open, he rose and pulled off his dressing gown, his eyes locked with hers. He stood naked before her, a Greek god sculpted in alabaster, his member proud, erect. She had never seen a man wholly naked. She devoured him with her eyes, knowing she ought to be more modest, more bridal, more virginal. But she couldn't help herself. He was magnificent. He bent and flipped the sheets back, cooling her heated body. He stood looking down at her for a long moment. She couldn't read his expression. His face was in shadow. Pretty nightgown, he murmured. But we don't need it tonight. He lifted her nightgown up over her legs. Lift your bottom. She lifted. Then it was over her belly and breasts. Raise your arms. She was naked before him exposed. She wanted to hide to cover herself, and not out of modesty. She was too tall, too thin, not endowed with the kind of curves that women should have. But she was what he had married, for whatever reason, and she braced herself for his examination. You're beautiful, he murmured, and lay down beside her, 
his body half covering her, skin to skin from thigh to breast, all hard, masculine heat. She supposed all men said that to their brides on their wedding night. She appreciated his kindness. She slipped her arms around his neck and pulled him to her. She wanted more of his kisses, heated, drugging, luscious kisses. He explored her then, thoroughly, with hands and lips. He ravished her with his mouth, nibbling, licking, finding places on her body that she had no idea were so sensitive or arousing. His hand slipped between her thighs, and he lavished attention on her breasts, while all the time his cunning fingers drove her mindless, teasing, soothing, drawing ripples, waves, shudders from her body. Her body vibrated to his every touch, absorbing him, enraptured by the relentless, seductive ravishment of his mouth and hands. She slowly lost all sense of herself. She was nothing, a being consisting of nothing but sensation and aching, desperate need. He moved over her, and without conscious volition, her legs parted, trembling with anticipation. She felt him, hot and heavy and blunt at her entrance, and her body clenched with longing. He hesitated, and without thought, she pushed herself against him. He entered her with a long, hard thrust and a loud moan. She took him with something between a whimper and a gasp. He paused, lodged deep within her, then began to pull back. She locked her legs around him, hauling him closer, taking him deeper, and then with a heavy guttural sound he was moving inside her, plunging, thrusting, driving her to frantic need, desperation and ecstasy. Lost to everything, she shuddered and thrashed around him. A final husky groan, a gush of warmth within her, she trembled on the pinnacle of something. And then... The room was dim when she finally opened her eyes. The candle in the dressing room had burned to a stub. The fire was down to coals. She must have fainted, or something. But only for a few minutes, she was sure. He lay beside her, breathing heavily, as if he'd just run a mile. She was panting too, but she felt loose, floaty, totally relaxed, euphoric. Why had nobody ever told her that lying with a man could be like, like that? The chill of the night was creeping over her bare skin. She reached for the covers to pull over them. Awake, are you? He sat up and turned to look down at her. She could just see his profile, limbed by the dying firelight. When were you going to tell me? His voice was hard, accusing. Oh, God. Tell you? She managed in a voice that shook only a little. That you weren't a virgin. There was a long silence. A thousand possibilities raced through M's mind, but only one was the truth. I hoped you wouldn't notice. Chapter 13 A girl, no virgin either, I should guess, a baggage thrust on me like a cargo on a ship to wreck my peace of mind. Sophocles, Women of Trachis Translated by E. F. Watling Cal couldn't believe his ears. You hoped I wouldn't notice? She swallowed and nodded. He waited for an explanation. She pulled the bedclothes up to cover her nakedness, then sat there silent and unmoving, making no attempt to explain or justify herself. Anger licked at him, He'd striven so hard to ensure that her first time was the best he could make it, and it wasn't her first time at all. It didn't help to know that, far from exerting total control over himself, he'd utterly lost it. But that was her fault responding like, like... He grabbed his dressing gown and flung it on, shoving his arms into the sleeves so violently he heard something tear. He didn't care. 
he seized the candle, marched to the dressing room, and lit it from the stub that was about to gutter. He lit two more candles. This wasn't a conversation you could have in the dark, and placed them where they would light her face best. He stood over her, arms folded. Who was it? For a long moment, he thought she wasn't going to answer him. Her eyes were wide and dark. Her skin glowed, honey and silk in the soft candlelight. Her expression was unreadable. The scent of their lovemaking filled his nostrils. Rose and vanilla aroused woman and musky, salty, raw, unbridled sex. His body stirred in response. He wanted her again. Already. His patience snapped. Damn it, I asked you a question, and don't bother giving me a pack of lies. Who the hell was it? She seemed to be considering what to say. Eventually, she said, It doesn't matter. I'll be the judge of that. She gave him a long, thoughtful look, tucked the bedclothes more tightly around her, and said with a tiny shrug of one tantalizingly bare shoulder, I was seventeen. I thought I was in love. There's been no one since. The cool, bare-bones summary infuriated him. She showed no contrition at all. If she'd wept, apologized, begged his forgiveness, he might have, after a judicious period, forgiven her. But this, this matter-of-fact account that explained nothing, nothing, drove him wild. He wanted to throttle her. He wanted to beat her. He wanted to take her back to bed and make love to her until they were both insensible. We will talk of this in the morning, he said, and stalked from the room, slamming the door behind him. M winced at the slamming door. She'd thought her lack of virginity wouldn't matter so much because their marriage had been made for purely practical reasons, and because it had all happened such a long time ago. How wrong she had been. When the accusation had come, she had been stupidly shocked. She had been floating on a cloud of bliss, exhausted, drowsy, and yet somehow exhilarated, not thinking of anything. And then the question, harsh accusing, for which she had no answer, no acceptable answer. On reflection, she admitted to herself that she could have handled it better, handled him better, instead of being stiff-necked and stubborn and refusing to apologize or beg his forgiveness. His anger had shaken her, as if somehow it was personal, a personal betrayal. But how could it be when they hardly knew each other? Her emotions were all over the place. Perhaps she should have made more of an effort to tell him beforehand. But he'd shown no interest in her as a person, apart from that kiss. And the opportunity hadn't arisen. She punched her pillow. Why should she expose herself, rip open old wounds and humiliations and grief, open herself to the judgment of a man she barely knew? If he had ever asked her anything about herself, ever shown the slightest interest in her life, her past, even her opinions, she would have felt obliged to tell him about Sam. But he hadn't. She pulled the covers around her and lay staring into what remained of the fire. The glowing coals were turning to ashes of grey. The room was growing colder. Life was so unfair. He had obviously lain with, oh, probably dozens of women, and she had lain with one man and that only three times almost ten years ago. But she was the sinner and he was the righteously wronged. Male pride and possessiveness. She turned over in the bed again, unable to get comfortable, because despite her attempts to justify her actions to herself, the strongest emotion she felt was regret, 
because until then it had been so lovely between them, so unexpectedly sweet, tender. She had no idea it could be like that. Until tonight, her admittedly limited experience of congress between a man and a woman was that it was hasty, rough, and uncomfortable, but wildly exciting. Lord Ashenden had shown her it could also be glorious, transcendent. She had felt cherished. And then, the moment had shattered, like a delicate rainbow glass bauble crushed beneath the heel of a boot, leaving her dazed among the shards. She would not cry, not over this, not over anything she could not change. Spilled milk, story of her life. There was nothing for it but to mop it up and go on. But how to mop this mess up? She closed her eyes, borrowed a nest into her bedclothes as she had when she was a child and tried to sleep. His lordship sent me to wake you, miss, I mean, my lady. Millie threw the curtains back, letting sunshine stream through. Such a lovely day it is. I expect he doesn't want to waste it. She brought a tray over to M. I got you sweet rolls and some hot chocolate, miss, but if you want anything else... No, that will do nicely. Thank you, Millie. M blinked at the bright sunshine. She went to sit up, then recalled she was naked. She pulled the covers around her. What time is it? After ten, but then nobody expects you to get up early after your wedding night. Millie blushed as she picked up the silk nightgown from the floor and folded it. It's ever such a grand house, miss. I mean, my lady. She fetched a dressing gown and handed it to M. M slipped it on gratefully, then reached for her breakfast tray. She was famished. She poured the chocolate. Are they treating you all right, Millie? Oh, yes, my lady. As your personal maid, I'm at the top end of the servant's table. At the ducks, I was right down the other end with only the scullery maid below me. She tossed M a quick grin. Of course, they're all thrilled that the young master's come home after all these years, and they're beside themselves that he's married. Everyone here adores him. The previous lord, his older brother, they weren't that keen on him. But Master Cow... That's what they call him when they forget he's the Earl now. He's always been their favourite, so I reckon you being his bride, you can do no wrong in their eyes. M sipped her chocolate. That remained to be seen. Oh, and I forgot to say, the master said to tell you when you're dressed he wants to speak to you in the library. M's appetite vanished. She put her breakfast tray aside. Draw me a bath, please, Millie. Best to beard her dragon in his den and get it over with. Very good, my lady. When should I have told you? M stood before him, placed on the mat like a naughty child before the headmaster. It was petty, Cal knew, but he was feeling petty and cross. He hadn't a wink of sleep, and when he'd looked in on her this morning, he had found her sleeping the sleep of the just, looking rumpled and delectable, and infuriatingly, deceptively innocent. It had put him in a fine temper, because, of course, what he wanted was to pull back the covers and take her again. And again. But just because his body was rampant and aching with desire for her didn't mean he'd let her undermine his common sense or self-discipline. A man should be master in his own house. A night of sleep hadn't made her the least bit more amenable or apologetic. She seemed almost indignant at his question. When? The day you proposed? You took me so much by surprise. Two minutes beforehand, you'd offered me a job as a chaperone. I could hardly even believe your proposal was serious. If you recall, we spoke the next morning, madam. No, you did most of the speaking that day. You set out the conditions of our marriage, what you expected me to do. 
you never once mentioned a requirement for virginity. Because it was understood, he grated. Of course it was. Bride and virginal were practically interchangeable terms. You never asked me a single thing about myself, not about who I was, about who my family was. You told me you had no family. And you never wondered why? Or thought to ask how I'd come to be working at Miss Mallard's when I'd attended the seminary as a pupil? I assumed. Yes, you assumed. She was pacing now, back and forth. You assumed I'd fill the position you wanted, perform the duties you required of me, undertake the care and protection of your sisters and niece and launch them on the marriage mart, and I will, leaving you free to pursue your important government duties elsewhere. He clenched his jaw. There was some justice in what she said, but... It wasn't me you wanted, it was a convenient wife, and that's what you got. But now you want more, you want a perfect wife. Well, I'm not perfect, but I will do right by your sisters and niece, and I will do right by you. I didn't mean. He hadn't meant to insult her integrity, but was it too much for a husband to ask who'd deflowered his bride? After you left that day, I realized I probably should have told you then, but you'd gone to London, and then, because of your desire to have a quick wedding, by the time you returned, the invitations had gone out, the school was in a frenzy of anticipation, and everything was arranged. And when I finally did see you, it was at the church. What was I to do, ask you to step into the vestry and say, Oh, by the way, I'm not a virgin. No, of course not, but he began irritably. How did women do it? She made it sound like it was all his fault. Anyway, the more I thought about it, the more I decided that it wasn't relevant. He almost choked. Not relevant? She made an impatient gesture. Surely the whole reason for wishing a bride to be a virgin on her wedding day is so that the groom can be assured that any child resulting from the marriage is his. Well, it's almost ten years since I had Congress with a man, and I cannot possibly be pregnant. A faint blush stole across her cheeks. Not unless last night. She lifted her chin. But if my word is not good enough, you can refrain from... Any further efforts to conceive until my monthly courses have passed? Cal couldn't fault her logic, but he wasn't going to last a month, not knowing she was in the next room, all soft and lissom, coming alight for him at the merest touch. And if you conceived a child last night? She lifted her chin and said almost defiantly, Then I will count myself most fortunate. You want a child, then? Her eyes went dark and dreamy. It is my dearest wish, she said softly. That was something, then. Cal was tempted to whisk her back upstairs and get to work on giving her one, but he had a position to maintain, and he wasn't going to let her get off too lightly. She hadn't bent an inch, damn her. She hadn't yet apologized or told him who her lover had been. You still haven't told me who he was. His voice was quiet, but he hoped she heard the underlying steel beneath it. He would not give up until he knew. There was a short silence, and for a moment he thought she was going to refuse to tell him again. Then she sighed, all the spit and vinegar drained. She sat on the chair opposite. Sam was a... He worked on my father's estate. His eyes narrowed. Your father's estate. She lifted her chin. My father was Sir Humphrey Westwood. Our home was in Berkshire. That explained her assurance, her manners. Was? My father is dead. The estate? She shrugged, as if to say she had no idea and possibly didn't care. It was entailed. 
She shook her head. Papa disowned me after. He waited. She waited a long, stubborn moment. He didn't take his eyes off her, and eventually she gave a sigh, as if giving in. I was just seventeen, naive, innocent, and wildly romantical, as girls that age often are. Sam was five and twenty, dark and dashing, as handsome as... as sin. She made a rueful gesture. I fell madly, blindly, carelessly in love. Nothing else mattered to me except... him. What happened? Papa caught us. Together. She swallowed. There was a lot of shouting. And? He prompted after a time. He offered Sam five hundred pounds to leave the country and never contact me again. Cal's fists clenched. He wouldn't have offered him a penny. He would have horsewhipped the placard to within an inch of his life. Seventeen and innocent was no match for twenty-five. The swine took it? He did. There was a long silence, then she gave a little shiver. There has been no one since. Cal frowned. There were gaps in her story. If her lover had been so easily bought off, why had she been disowned? And if she had been seventeen when she was disowned, she was six and twenty now, and she had been at the Mallard Seminary for seven years. It didn't add up. A thought occurred to him. Did he leave you with child? Her eyes widened with surprise. No, there was nothing like that. She seemed genuinely surprised by the question and showed no self-consciousness when she replied. He believed her. Then why? So, if you need assistance with the management of your estate, I can help you. I did much to assist my father before. I can, for instance, read and keep accounts. Papa had no head for figures. Then why were you disowned? A... A misunderstanding. She rose and smoothed down her skirt. So now you have the answer to your questions. I hope the knowledge of my youthful imprudence will not prove an insuperable obstacle to the smooth progression of our marriage. She gazed at him a moment with those clear, sage green eyes and said firmly, I have not lain with any man since, except you. Nor will I. It was a promise, and apparently as good an apology as he was ever going to get from her. Part of him wanted to assert himself and demand some sort of gesture of contrition for not telling him about it until after they were married. But fundamental honesty forced him to recognize he hadn't exactly given her the opportunity to explain. They were both new to this business of marriage, and they'd married not knowing much about each other. If they were both a little tense and prickly, well, that wasn't surprising. This was what a honeymoon was for, he supposed, to get to know each other better. That and the bedding. He rose and rang a bell. Thank you for your frankness, madam. I suggest we put last night behind us and go on as intended. I have work to do. This estate has been neglected for the last year, and I wish to get everything organized before I leave. When will that be? I'm not sure, not for a week at least. The girls will be arriving tomorrow. The girls? I cannot trust them to Aunt Dottie's care. You know that. She bit her lip. Of course, it is, after all, why you married me. Denial trembled on the tip of his tongue, which was nonsense. It was why he'd married her. But he was aware it wasn't quite fair to give her a honeymoon of only two days before her chaperone duties commenced. The fact that she didn't complain as most brides would galled him somewhat. I have much to do here, he gestured to the pile of paperwork on the desk. Later this afternoon, I will be riding out to make a brief inspection of the estate. Oh, may I? She broke off as a knock sounded at the door. The housekeeper entered, and whatever his wife had been going to say remained unsaid. You rang, sir? Yes, Mrs. Moffat. 
Lady Ashenden would like a tour of the house. He turned to his wife and bowed slightly. I will see you at dinner. M inclined her head. Is there any part of the house, any rooms or furniture or, or anything decorative that you are particularly attached to, my lord? He glanced up, frowning. What do you mean? In case I want to make a few changes. It is your home, after all, and I wouldn't wish to make any changes that would upset you. I haven't lived in this house since I was a boy, he said indifferently. You have carte blanche to make whatever changes to the household you desire, madam. Madam? He was putting her in her place. Lady Ashenden would like a tour of the house. He hadn't even asked her if she wanted one. She felt dismissed like a maidservant. But she didn't have the energy or the will to argue. The interview with her husband had stirred up a past she had done her best to put behind her, and the emotions that went with it. For the first part of the tour, most of what the housekeeper told her went right over M's head. She kept thinking of things she'd said and regretted, and things she wished she had said and hadn't. Never mind the things she'd done and wished she hadn't. She'd taken one look at Sam and fallen recklessly, blindly, desperately in love. And he, or so he had claimed, felt the same about her. Even knowing it was wrong, that their love was hopeless, or maybe because it was hopeless, star-crossed and impossible, she had been determined not to have a Romeo and Juliet ending. So when Sam had pushed her, begged her, tumbled her down in the hay and thrust his hands under her skirts, shocking and wildly thrilling as it was, she had let him. Physically, it had been painful and a little disappointing, but the closeness, the thrilling intimacy of his hands on her breasts and under her skirts, the half-panicked, half-shocked sensation as he'd pushed himself into her and pumped hard for a few short moments, then collapsed with a loud, satisfied groan. Foolish, ignorant, dreamy young girl that she was, she had believed it was true love. But for Sam, it was simply an opportunity. It was a lesson she would never forget. Pointless to be ashamed or to apologize or make excuses at this late date. What was done was done. She was an adult now, a different person from that young girl. She could continue to wallow in the disaster of her past and endlessly punish herself for it, or she could forgive the naive girl she'd been and accept that she was flawed and imperfect, and learn from her mistakes. The only reason I will ever marry is for love. Oh, the irony of that youthful, impassioned statement, the opposite of what she had actually done. But it was better this way, a practical, unsentimental arrangement with clear, down-to-earth expectations and no messy emotions. She would have to be vigilant about that. The feelings her husband had engendered last night when he had coupled with her. But they were not emotions. They were physical sensations, and no doubt she would get used to them and not confuse them with anything else. The way she was with Sam, she would have done anything for him, had, in fact, let him do whatever he wanted. She hadn't actually been ready to give herself to a man, but he hadn't asked. He'd just taken, and she, lost in the dizzy, rapturous state she'd imagined was love, she had allowed it. She would have allowed him anything. Looking back, she could hardly imagine that girl was her, giving herself to love, to Sam. She had lost all sense of herself, all sense of what she wanted, what she believed in. Everything was Sam, Sam and love. And it was all a lie. And then, two years later, it had come back to haunt her, and she had almost lost herself again. She had lost her father's respect and faith in her, and her trust in him. When he'd heard the fresh rumours about her, when he'd been carefully fed those rumours, drip by cunning drip, 
he had struggled against them for a while, but had eventually succumbed. Because two years before, he had seen how blind, how reckless she had been with Sam, and it had frightened him. Knowing what she and Sam had done, and never having come to terms with it, that Sam had been a mere groom made it even more shocking to him, her father had eventually come to believe the rumours, that she was doing it again. The breach with Papa was like an open wound in her heart. He had believed in the rumours and not the word of M, his only daughter. He'd loved her, but he had no faith in her. That lack of faith, that betrayal of trust or love, had cut deep. It was another life lesson. That trust, once shattered, could never be mended. And what was the point of life if one didn't learn from it? She might regret Sam. She bitterly regretted how things had ended with Papa. But she couldn't, she wouldn't let her past destroy her future. She had a new life now, and she would make of it the best she could. Mrs. Moffat conducted a most thorough tour, giving a history of the house and family, as well as showing M every closet, cupboard, and storeroom, and all the stores. It was the family stories that M was most interested in, and with a little encouragement, Mrs. Moffat opened right up telling stories of Master Cal, who was, boy and man, very dear to her heart. M got the impression of a solitary little boy, growing up under the eye of a cold, demanding father. He had had no playfellows. His father wouldn't allow him to associate with village boys, and his brother was ten years older and away at school. Very stiff rumped was old Lord Ashenden, always knowing what was due to his consequence, and not accepting anything less, Mrs. Moffat confided. But he did allow Master Cal to spend a deal of time in the stables, and the lads there were companions of a sort. And what of his mother? Oh, she died when he was a little lad. I doubt he even remembers her. But his father married again, M prompted. Mrs. Moffat sniffed. A beauty she was, and a good mother to her little girls, but... She screwed up her nose. Not the sort who wanted the children of her predecessor hanging around especially not sons when she had only given her husband daughters. She clucked her tongue in disapproval. No, little Master Cal was sent off to school just seven he was, poor little lad, and we hardly saw anything of him after that. But didn't he go home for holidays? Even as she said it, she remembered that after their mother had died, Rose and Lily had spent all their holidays with Lady Dorothea, even Christmas. Not much. He usually stayed at school or stayed with friends. She turned to M with a smile. Oh, but when he did come home, well, those little girls followed him around like baby ducklings. Master Cal it was that put them up their first ponies. Soul of patience he was with them. The elderly woman darted M a sideways glance. Make a fine father, he will. Now he's home and in his rightful place. M didn't have the heart to tell Mrs. Moffat that he was leaving again, and who knew when he'd return. I haven't lived in this house since I was a boy. And where had he lived since then? No wonder he didn't care what she did to the house. It hadn't been a home to him at all. M determined then and there that she would make this place into a home if not for her husband, who seemed to prefer life abroad, then for her and the girls, and, pray God, for any children she might have. Mrs. Moffat continued. And then he finished school, and was off to the army fighting that nasty Bonaparte. The fighting that boy did, well, it was a miracle he wasn't killed. Mentioned in dispatches, I don't know how many times. Of course we all prayed for him, now the linen press, my lady, needs a deal of refurbishment. The stories continued, much to M's fascination, 
and it wasn't until they were in the west wing, looking into dusty room after dusty room with furniture shrouded under holland covers, that she finally turned her full attention to the task at hand. Mrs. Moffat, what are these rooms? There seem to be a great many of them all seemingly deserted. For years by the smell of stale air and dust. Old Lord Ashenden's orders, my lady. He wasn't one for entertaining, and Mr. Henry never came near the place, neither. Not even after he became Lord Ashenden. I don't remember when these rooms were last used. Well, then, we must do something about that, M declared. This is going to become a family home. I want every room opened up, aired, cleaned, and the furniture inspected, to see what we shall retain, and what can be mended, and what shall be replaced. She shuddered. Who knows what may be lurking beneath those covers? Every room, Mrs. Moffat faltered. M knew what she was thinking. It was far too much work for the few servants who remained to run the grand old house, many of them quite elderly. We will hire more staff, of course. I'm sure you know some girls in the village who can be relied on to give this place a good scrub and polish. Send for them at once. I want every room shining and clean throughout. Yes, my lady. Mrs. Moffat's eyes gleamed with a martial light. How many girls? As many as you need. You will know that better than I. And some men to beat carpets and carry furniture about, and do what needs to be done. His lordship gave me carte blanche, if you remember. She smiled at the housekeeper. But we won't try to do it all at once. We will start with the rooms most likely to be used— the hall, the dining room, that little sitting room you showed me that seems likely to get some sun and work toward the least likely. And first on the list is to prepare bedchambers for the young ladies. The elderly housekeeper's face lit up. Lady Rose and Lady Lily, my lady? They're coming home at last? Indeed they are, as well as Lady Georgiana, my husband's niece. Mrs. Moffat looked doubtful. I've never heard of any Lady Georgiana, my lady. His niece, did you say? A newly discovered addition to the family, I believe. All three girls are arriving together tomorrow. Now show me which bedchambers you think they will like. Mrs. Moffat sent a message to the village to send up anyone who wanted a day's work, and in less than an hour her workforce had doubled. Under Mrs. Moffat's supervision, M set some housemaids to scrubbing and polishing the girls' bedchambers, airing their bedding, washing the curtains, and beating the rugs on the floors. Meanwhile, she gathered every able-bodied man available and set to work on the great gloomy hall. She ordered the removal of all the grisly weapons and animal heads and banished them to the attic. The portraits of grim-looking ancestors she had removed to the portrait gallery— a place she had been told of but hadn't yet inspected. Heavy curtains covered the windows, shutting out the daylight. M had them taken down to wash, and when they shredded with handling, she sent them to be burned. The room lightened considerably without them. She would commission some new ones in a lighter, less oppressive pattern. She set two men to washing the mullioned windows, and another two rolled up the carpets fine axminsters, and took them outside to be beaten. There wasn't enough time to wash down the walls. The family would no doubt use this room for general gathering at night. But she had the floor mopped and polished and, after a good culling of all the most uncomfortable furniture, had the rest waxed. A few hours later, M stepped out into the garden for some fresh air and to see whether there were any flowers or greenery she could cut for the house. The rigid formality of the interior had been quite gloomy and oppressive. Greenery would freshen and soften it. Hearing the sound of hoofbeats, she glanced up in time to see her husband riding out with a man who was presumably his estate manager. Her husband, could she call him Calborn or Cal, or would he insist on Ashenden, or even my lord, 
was mounted on a powerful black gelding. He rode well, as if born to the saddle, which he probably was. She watched him disappear into the distance, feeling a trifle wistful. She would have loved to ride out and see the estate. Nonsense, she told herself. She had no reason to feel wistful. She had been given carte blanche to make whatever changes she wanted. He couldn't have made it plainer. Her duty was to the girls and the house, and if she wasn't to have a honeymoon well, it wasn't a love match after all. She wasn't about to complain. She was very lucky to have this beautiful old house to work on and the prospect of the girl's company when her husband returned to Europe. She was her own mistress. She was much better off here than at Miss Mallard's. And when Lord Ashenden was cold and dismissive, when he treated her as some kind of superior servant, well, that would serve as a good reminder. She had a foolishly tender, susceptible heart and his coldness would remind her to reserve her love for her children and for the girls. She gathered an armful of greenery and returned to the house. Chapter 14 Happy the man whose wish and care a few paternal acres bound, content to breathe his native air in his own ground. Alexander Pope, Ode on Solitude the whole household is excited at the prospect of your sister's returning, she told her husband at dinner that evening. He had arrived home just on dusk and hadn't apparently noticed any change in the house. M was simultaneously relieved and irritated. According to Mrs. Moffat, it's been several years since they were here. It surprised me, since we aren't very far from Bath. He shrugged. My father probably didn't want to be bothered with them. Not be bothered with his own daughters? She tried to hide her outrage. He disliked children. There was no resentment in his voice. He sounded quite matter-of-fact. M thought of the boy who had been sent away at seven and had rarely come home again. They're hardly children now. He snorted. Possibly not, but they're still brats. He cut himself another slice of chicken pie. She had consulted with Cook and Mrs. Moffat and arranged for some of his lordship's favourite dishes to be served. None of the servants seem to have even heard of your niece Georgiana, she probed. She only came to light after Henry's death. Turned out he had made a secret marriage when he was very young. A mess alliance, so he kept the girl hidden. How... How unfortunate for her. She'd been about to roundly condemn his brother, but her husband was obviously trying to be pleasant, so it wouldn't be tactful to insult his brother, yet. What kind of a family had she married into? Though with her history, she couldn't talk. It was a damned disgrace. Henry was a selfish swine. He sipped his wine, his eyes silver-dark in the candlelight, and said almost apologetically, Georgiana is a rare handful, I'm afraid, stubborn as a mule and utterly undisciplined. She smiled. She's in good company, then. Cal shook his head. She makes Rose and Lily look tame. He looked at his wife seated across from him, her skin glowing softly in the candlelight. She had had several leaves of the large table removed, and dining was now a much cosier affair. There were flowers in the room too, and branches of greenery. He didn't remember anything like that when he was a boy. Their conversation over dinner had been pleasant, easy. She had encouraged him to tell her about his day. The last remnants of his anger with her faded away. She was trying to make things work. She needed to know what she'd be dealing with, so he told her how he'd met Georgiana, first by reputation from the members of the local hunt, whom she'd apparently terrorized and thwarted for years. They positively begged me to take her away. She'd laughed, the first time he'd heard her laugh properly, a warm, low, infectious sound. 
He told her how, misliking his plans for her, Georgiana had leapt onto her horse, a truly magnificent beast that ought to be far too strong for her but wasn't, and disappeared into the hills. For several cold, bitter nights, the girl is impossible, but quite fearless. He told her how he'd had to trick his niece into wearing a dress, and how she'd ruined one to spite him, and how he had had to kidnap her to get her to bath. He told her about Finn, the great gangly, smelly wolfhound, and how he had followed the carriage until Cal was forced to let him come. I hope you like dogs, he finished, because she won't be separated from the animal. I love dogs, she assured him, laughing. She was a good listener. This dinner had been the most pleasant and relaxed evening he'd had for, well, he couldn't recall when he'd last enjoyed a woman's company so much, or had such a pleasant evening in his childhood home. He was almost sorry now that the girls were coming so soon. But of course he had no choice, he didn't trust them an inch, and he had a job to do. Three Oxfordshire men were on his list and the sooner he checked on them, the better. I've sent for Georgiana's horse, too. All three girls are keen horsewomen. It will be something to keep them occupied, and, with any luck, tie them out for any further mischief. I could, she began. You'll have your hands full with house whiffery, I know. As long as a groom goes with them, they'll be all right. He paused then feeling he had something to make up for, asked, You don't mind, do you, that your honeymoon involves refurbishing my house and that your peace will be invaded by three difficult young ladies? Not at all, she said, and somehow the warm, laughing woman had been replaced by the cool schoolteacher. We married for convenience, after all. The unspoken words hung in the air between them, his convenience. He came to her room that night, knocked and, at her response, entered. Are you willing? She was sitting up in bed reading. She looked a little surprised but answered, Of course, as a dutiful wife should. She put the book aside and moved over in the bed to make room for him. He hoped it wasn't only duty, but did it really matter if it was? The result would be the same. Somehow it mattered. The thought of those unaccounted for couple of years had nagged at him from time to time during the day. If her false swain had been bought off when she was seventeen, why had her father disowned her two years later? What had happened? But now was not the time to ask. Not if he wanted to lie with her tonight, and he did. He hadn't planned to, he'd decided to punish her, ignore her for a few days until she came to him with a proper explanation and an apology. But despite his pique at her lack of virginity and his exasperation at her refusal to show any proper contrition, his body had hummed with lust and anticipation all day. He hadn't been able to get the scent of her skin and hair out of his mind. He'd eaten an apple at ten, a sandwich at noon, but the taste of her still lingered, and her skin glowing gently by firelight, those breasts, those long, slender legs that wrapped so hungrily around him. So he had decided to forgive her. Besides, he owed it to his ancestors to get an heir. Now, the mere act of opening the connecting door, the sight of her sitting in bed reading, perfectly decent and covered to the neck in a voluminous, thick flannel nightgown, had him hard and ready. Rain started to fall outside, spattering hard against the windows. The air in the room was chilly. He moved to the fireplace and added a few logs to the fire. The dry wood caught quickly, lightening the room and perfuming it with the clean, smoky scent of yew. Cal straightened staring into the flames a moment. He was on fire for her. He didn't understand it, hadn't been quite so 
so consumed by lust since he was a green and randy youth. He returned to the bed, leaving the candles burning. No need for discretion on behalf of virginal shyness now, and removed his dressing gown. She took her time, examining him with frank appreciation, or so he hoped. Her gaze moved across him like a touch, warming him despite the chill of the night air. He was erect already, but when her wide grey-green eyes studied him so thoughtfully, he couldn't help but say, Everything as it should be? She blinked, then blushed. Sorry, was I staring? It is just that you are the first naked man I have ever seen. And it was in the nature of a gift, he decided, that he was first in something. You approve? Vanity, thy name is man. It shouldn't matter whether she approved or not, they were married. Oh, very much so. Her voice was soft, a little husky. He felt himself harden further. Would you care to return the favor? It took her a moment to understand his meaning. Her blush deepened and she nodded, but made no move. He reached beneath the bedclothes and found the hem of her modest cream flannel nightgown. He glanced at her again, a query in his eyes, and she nodded. Slowly he drew it up over the long, lovely legs past the dark thatch of curls at their junction, easing it under her bottom and up to reveal the smooth curve of her belly. Her breasts emerged briefly, small and exquisite, the nipples high and pink, and he hesitated. She pulled the nightgown over her head and held it clutched against her chest, hiding behind it. He drew the garment gently from her tight grip. Not quite the confection of silk and nonsense you wore last night. He tossed it aside and turned back to find her swathed to the chin in bedclothes. Modesty or shyness? I did not think you would come to me tonight, she said in a low voice. Not come to her? The truth was he couldn't stay away. He looked at the way she was huddled in the bedclothes. You sure you don't mind? She shook her head. It was the light making her shy, he decided. She had probably never shown herself to anyone. They'd been naked together last night, but it had been dark and shadowy. He drew the covers back, exposing her nakedness. She made a move, as if to cover herself with her hands, then with a sigh dropped them. He looked his fill in the soft candlelight. Her cheeks, chest, and breasts turned rosy under his heated gaze. She swallowed and did not meet his eyes. Her nipples lifted. Cold or aroused? She wasn't comfortable being looked at. You're beautiful. She was too. So beautiful his mouth dried. Her mouth made a small movement, a moo or a grimace, as if she didn't believe him and was too polite to say so. Or maybe she was just cold and getting fed up with being stared at. He slid into the bed beside her and drew her into his arms. He'd planned to take her with no nonsense, hard and fast and immensely satisfying, for him, and show her who was master in this marriage. But she came to him with a sigh of acceptance, wrapping her arms around his neck and bringing her mouth so sweetly up to his, he found he couldn't do it, couldn't bring himself to take her hard and fast and have it over within minutes. He took his time, lavishing her with tender care, nibbling gently, slipping his tongue between her soft, cherry-dark lips, caressing lightly at first, but sweeping deeper, tasting tea and tooth powder and musky dark honey, and woman, this woman, his wife. Her taste heated his blood like the finest brandy. He kissed her, deeply, passionately, his tongue echoing the rhythm his body already rocked with. A low hum deep within her throat was his reward. 
He caressed her with hands and mouth, caressing the warm, soft skin, the smooth, firm female flesh. He cupped the slight, silky breasts, his thumbs caressing the hard little pink nubbins, upthrust and aching for his attention. She trembled beneath his touch, caressing him in return, blindly, frenziedly, as if she did not quite know what she wanted or could not think. He covered first one breast, then the other with his mouth, teasing, nibbling, and sucking. She arched beneath him, making soft little noises that might have been protest, except that her fingers were tangled in his hair, holding him fast. He stroked the smooth, shallow curve of her stomach, feeling the quivers starting deep within her. His fingers slid into the thatch of dark curls at the base of her stomach and parted her. She was hot and slick and slippery, more than ready for him, but he wanted more. He sought and found the small sensitive pearl between the hot, sleek folds, stroking it until she was writhing and trembling helplessly beneath him. And then he slid down her body and put his mouth there, where his fingers had been, tasting heat and honey and salt-dark woman, his woman. She stiffened, uttering a small exclamation, but before she could make any objection, he sucked deeply and she arched beneath him on a high quivering moan. His pulse thundered, his body craving release, vibrated with the effort of control. Deep spasms rocked her, blind, oblivious, out of control. He lifted himself and entered her in one long, smooth thrust. The ancient animal rhythm possessed him, and he moved deeper within her, thrusting fast and hard in glorious abandon until his climax took him and he lay gasping and spent. She came back to herself slowly and turned her face toward him. He lay on his side watching her. A damp curl straggled across her face. He reached out and smoothed it back with one finger. All right? Yes, more than all right. She sighed and gave a small, sensual shiver. I never knew it could be like that. You never... She shook her head, blushing. Only with you. It was another small gift. He was the first there, too. He tried not to let his satisfaction show. He hadn't planned to spend the night in her bed. He never usually slept with a woman after Congress, but somehow he couldn't make himself move. He drew her against him, curving his body around her. Get some sleep now. Another busy day tomorrow. She slipped into sleep almost immediately. He lay there holding her, listening to the rain and the wind outside, and wondered how he had come to this. The marriage was supposed to be for purely practical purposes. He had never considered there would be feelings involved. His friends had all fallen in love at some time or other, usually with some impossible or unsuitable female. Drowning in the throes of love, there turned into hopeless, muddled wrecks of men, unable to think of anything except their beloved inamorata. Cal had watched with amusement and a touch of disdain. Rutherford men didn't fall in love. Cal certainly never had, even though he'd had several mistresses and conducted the odd few affairs over the years. None of the women he'd slept with had ever touched his heart. And at the age of Eight and twenty, he was obviously immune to it. His friends' love affairs had never lasted long. Eventually, they returned to their senses, usually because the woman had moved on to drive some other unfortunate fellow insane and went on with their lives, sadder but wiser. And when they married, they married sensibly, as he had. Lust, that was all this was. He'd made a convenient marriage, and it was very convenient that he lusted after his wife. But he didn't want any emotional tangles. As soon as he'd tracked down his assassin, he'd be leaving England again, 
for who knew how long. He liked his job and he needed to keep his mind clear for it. And in the meantime, he'd do his best to give her the child she wanted. He'd made love to her again during the night and again at dawn, having woken hard and aching and unable to resist the temptation of her lying next to him, all soft and enticing. She woke as he slowly entered her, and she welcomed him with sleepy sensuality. He took her slow and leisurely, and it was just as intense. He woke an hour later. The candles had long since guttered. The fire lay in ashes. His wife slept curled against him, one cheek pressed against his shoulder, her breathing even and steady. He wanted to take her again, but that would be too much. He slipped out of bed and felt her stir behind him. Where? I'm going for a ride. She sat up and made as if to get up. I'll come with... No, I have work to do. Go back to sleep. The door shut firmly behind him, and M battled with mixed emotions. Why couldn't she just ask if she could go riding with him? She wasn't usually so hesitant. It was seven years since she had ridden, and she would have loved to accompany him as he reacquainted himself with his estate and his tenants. But perhaps it was something he felt she had no part in. He was the earl and this was his home. She was the newcomer. He had made it quite clear what he wanted of her, house refurbishing in preparation for the girl's arrival while he dealt with estate matters. Take responsibility for his sisters and niece and free him to get on with his work. Whatever that work was. Companionship wasn't any part of their bargain. She lay in bed, listening to the noisy chatter of birds outside the window. It had seemed like an offer she couldn't refuse. Security, position, riches, and best of all, a family. And now, after barely two days of marriage, she wanted more. She wanted to ride with him, to talk to him, get to know him better, to make a friend of him perhaps even make a real marriage of their convenient bargain. Was she dreaming again, making castles in the air, or simply greedy? Or was it simply the after-effects of lying with him, giving her body to him? There was a reason they called it making love. It created the illusion of love, and she knew enough now to be wary of ascribing emotions to the purely physical sensations he engendered in her. Mostly, she thought, her desire to know him better was rooted in simple compassion for the neglected and lonely little boy of the housekeeper's stories, the child who'd been sent off to school at the age of seven and had never, it seemed, been welcomed back. Was there still some remnant of that small boy in the brusque, decisive, self-contained man she had married? She suspected there was. There was a kindness in him, even though he tried so hard to hide it. It was probably why he found it so hard to manage his difficult sisters. He couldn't bring himself to be harsh with them. And there was kindness. Just now, in his telling her to go back to sleep, because he'd woken her several times in the night to make love to her. She hadn't minded being woken at all. The whole physical side of marriage had taken her utterly by surprise. She hadn't expected to find such, such pleasure in it. Pleasure being a wholly inadequate word. Two nights she had been married, Two nights he'd amazed her, shocked her a little too, but taken her to ecstasy. She stretched, her body tingling with lazy, sensual awareness as remembrance washed over her in slow, pleasurable waves. Perhaps she was just being impatient. She had a whole new privileged life before her. There would be plenty of time to go riding, she had duties to perform, a homecoming to prepare. 
The girls would be here this afternoon. She was determined to make this big old mausoleum into a place of welcome. A home. Cal hadn't intended to ride out so soon in search of the next man on his list, but this one lived close, just a few hours away. He didn't like the thought of someone who might turn out to be the scorpion living on his doorstep, not with Emmeline and the girl so close. Best he check and be sure. He'd dealt with the most pressing of the estate needs. The manager was a good man, and though Henry had caused problems by ignoring all the manager's correspondence, a year's neglect was not so much to repair. When Cal returned to Europe, he could leave the place with a clear conscience. He reached a crossroads, consulted the sign, and turned left. After this fellow, there were only two brothers living locally, though some distance away. A good day's ride, there and back. The rest of his portion of the list lived in more distant places and would involve overnight stays. He came to the village and was at first treated with some slight suspicion. Clearly gentlemen didn't often venture there in search of ordinary folks. But on production of a silver coin, he was soon directed to a shabby little cottage on the outskirts of the village. It backed onto the forest. The man's wife answered the door, pregnant, if he wasn't mistaken, and her immediate reaction alerted his suspicions. She blanched at the sight of him and clung to the door with white-knuckled hands, peering past him to see if anyone had come with him. When he asked after Saul Whitmore, she pretended not to know who he meant. But she was a poor liar. All Cal's instincts prickled to life. It might have been better to have brought someone with him, but Cal was armed with two loaded pistols and a knife in his boot. He could see at a glance that the mean little one-room cottage concealed nobody. So he decided to investigate further afield. The woman followed him, wringing her hands and saying variously, Me lord, there ain't nobody called Saul Whitmore living around here. He left long ago, he did. He ain't here, I promised you. Cal ignored her. He was heading toward a tumble-down outbuilding when he caught a glimpse of movement from the corner of his eye. A man emerged from the forest carrying a load of wood. Two dead hairs dangled from his waist. Run, Saul, run! The woman screamed. She jumped on Cal, nearly knocking him over. He staggered and tried to shake her off, but she clung fiercely to his arm, dragging him down with her weight, determined to hold him back. Cal could have knocked her out in an instant, but he'd never hit a woman in his life, let alone a pregnant one. The man dropped his load of wood and took to his heels. Observing the manner of his retreat, Cal instantly stopped struggling. The man ran with a pronounced, ungainly limp. He disappeared into the trees. What's the matter with his foot? Cal asked the woman, who still clung to him with all her might. Unless the injury to the fellow's foot was recent, he couldn't possibly be the assassin whom Cal had last seen escaping fleet-footed and nimble over Portuguese rooftops. She took a moment to understand his question. Oh, for heaven's sake, let go of me, woman, he told her irritably. I'm not going to chase after your husband. He probably knows that forest like the back of his hand. Just tell me what's wrong with his foot. She eyed him suspiciously, then loosened her frenetic grip slightly. Got his foot shot off in the war, she said eventually. Makes it hard for him to get work, especially in winter. Then he's not the man I'm looking for, Cal told her. He's not? Cal felt the tension drain out of her. You're not after him for, for, she broke off, biting her lip. It's just a couple of hairs. And suddenly Cal realized what he'd seen. A crippled former soldier, carrying illegally gathered wood and poached game, providing winter warmth and food for himself and his pregnant wife. Hanging offences in some places, 
transportation to the other side of the world at the very least. No wonder she was so frightened. I have no interest in you or your husband, he told her gently. It was another man I was looking for. This was a mistake. She gave him a troubled look and slowly released his sleeve. You won't say nothing about... I saw nothing untoward at all, he assured her, and I apologize for any distress I caused you and your husband. He pressed a couple of gold sovereigns, all he had on him, into the woman's shaking hand, mounted his horse, and rode off. Damn. For a moment there, he thought he had the bastard. Chapter 15 Uncertainty and expectation are the joys of life. Security is an insipid thing. William Congreve, Love for Love Dusk was falling as the carriage bringing the girls to Ashenden turned into the driveway. At the same time, Em saw her husband riding across the park from the opposite direction. He rode slumped in the saddle, as if weary and dispirited. M hung back as he dismounted and waited for the girls to alight, greeting each one with a nod and words M couldn't quite catch. She wanted to give them a little private time together. They were family, after all. She was the stranger here. It was not for her to welcome Rose and Lily to the home in which they'd been born but they could have been strangers for all the warmth they showed. Of the girls, only Lily made any attempt at a warmer greeting, reaching up to plant a shy kiss on her brother's cheek. He seemed not to know quite how to respond, bending toward her slightly so she was able to reach his jaw. Watching their caution with each other, their awkwardness, M felt a rueful pang. Somehow she was going to make these disparate, wary people into a family. She was determined on it. She hurried down the front steps to greet them. You made good time then, Rose, Lily, Georgiana. Did you have a pleasant journey? The weather was in your favour, though. It's getting quite chilly now. She hugged each of the girls, even Georgiana, whom she barely knew and who responded awkwardly allowing the embrace rather than welcoming it. And who is this fine fellow? She went to pat the dog, but he was more interested in sniffing out his new territory and leaving liquid calling cards on every nearby tree. She exclaimed over his size and noble carriage and heard her husband snort behind her. She turned to him and was on the verge of holding out her hand to him when she decided to take the bull by the horns and begin as she meant to go on. She stood on tiptoes and planted a light kiss on his cheek. I hope your day was productive, Lord Ashenden. He frowned and opened his mouth to say something, then stopped. M didn't wait for any further reaction. If he disliked the familiarity in front of the girls, he would no doubt tell her later. She turned to the girls. But what am I doing letting you stand around in the cold? Come inside. You're just in time for dinner. We won't bother changing for dinner tonight. Just freshen yourselves up. I've just ordered hot water sent up to your bedchambers. It should be there in a few minutes. They entered the house in a group, the girls chattering about the journey, responding to the questions she threw at them. M turned toward the stairs, but Rose's gaze fell to the great hall. With a small exclamation, she walked forward and entered the room. What have you done to this place? Rose stood in the center of the hall, her brow wrinkled, gazing around her. It's almost unrecognizable. Her words gave M a guilty pang. She hadn't even considered the girl's feelings when she had had the great hall stripped of the items she found repugnant. She had briefly considered her husband, but he hadn't seemed to care what she did. But for the girls, this place had truly been their home, 
apart from the years they'd spent at school. She'd done her best to make it less like an armament museum and more like a family gathering place. A roaring fire burned in the enormous fireplace, and she had had comfortable chairs gathered around in groups, instead of the hard chairs that had been placed formally around the perimeter. She had covered the stone flags with warm and colorful rugs, and some embroidered screens that had been found in the attic helped protect the inhabitants from drafts. Yes, it's all lighter and emptier, but somehow cozier, Lily agreed. She pointed and gave a little laugh. All the heads and antlers are gone. Heads? Georgiana looked around. Antlers? Rose nodded. Deer heads, antelopes, a nasty-looking boar, all kinds of heads, and swords and pikes and things, the bloodthirsty trophies of our ancestors. Most of Papa's beloved prizes have gone. She turned to M with wide eyes. What have you done, Miss Westwood? Lady Ashenden, Lily corrected her. Oh, heavens no, call me M or Emmeline, M said. Now that we're sisters-in-law, you two, of course, Georgiana. George, the girl muttered. I only answer to George. M turned back to Rose. I'm sorry if the removal of your father's things distresses you, Rose, but your brother gave me carte blanche to... Oh, it doesn't distress me at all, Rose interrupted, her eyes dancing. It was ghastly before. George, you can't imagine, with dead eyes staring down at you from every corner, so gloomy and depressing. People who cut off the heads of animals and nail them to a wall are nothing but savages, George declared. Lily hugged M enthusiastically. It's wonderful, miss, I mean M, so much friendlier. All the hollow knights and the dismal ancestors that's what Rose and I called them, have gone. You didn't throw the ancestors out, though, did you? Because George might want to see her family. There's a painting of Cal as a boy that looks just like her. Or is that in the gallery? I wouldn't mind seeing a picture of my father, too, George muttered diffidently. Not that I care, but I've never seen him. M smiled relieved and delighted with their reaction. All the ancestral portraits are safe and will be hung with the others in the portrait gallery, she assured them. I haven't yet had time to have a proper look at them myself. And now that Lily had mentioned it, she wanted to see that portrait of her husband as a boy. A sudden silence fell as her husband entered the great hall. He surveyed the room silently. M waited breathlessly for his reaction. I see you've begun, he said, then gave a brusque nod and headed upstairs, leaving M not knowing what to think. What did he mean by begun? Begun to take over the house? Begun to ruin his home? Begun to interfere? There was no way of knowing. She turned to the girls who were regarding her with slight consternation. Men are hopeless about interior arrangements, she said lightly. Either they don't notice or they hate any kind of change. Now, let me show you to your bedchambers. The girls didn't move. Is he planning to dump us here? Rose asked bluntly. M gave her a surprised look. Dump you? What do you mean? He said back in Bath that we could go to London, make our come out in the spring. We thought when the carriage came that we were going to London, but here we are. So he's planning to immure us in the country, isn't he? So we can't make any scandals. No, of course not, M told her, though in truth she had only the sketchiest idea of her husband's plans. The only reason he married me was so that you could all make your come-outs next season. The only reason? Lily interrupted, her face a picture of dismay. But I thought... No, not the only reason, of course, 
M hastily covered her blunder with a smile. Lily obviously wanted to believe she'd married for love, and M was not going to disillusion her. I didn't mean it like that. We married for all the usual reasons, of course, but your brother did make it very clear that he wanted me to assist with your come-outs, which, of course, I am more than delighted to do. As for your being immured in the countryside, there is no such plan. Besides, scandals can happen as easily in the country as in the town, believe me. Now upstairs to wash before dinner. She linked her arm through George's. Rose and Lily have their old bedchambers, though I've made a few changes, now that they're grown up. But let me show you your room, George. The girl hesitated. Can Finn come too? Of course, he's part of the family, too. Rose didn't move. You promise we're not going to be stuck here? I promise, Em said. He came to Em's bed again that night and made love to her with the same focused intensity, bringing her to the edge of climax again and again, before driving into her hard and fast, powerful and passionate, until with a loud groan he took them both over the crest of ecstasy. Normally M drifted straight off to sleep, but tonight she lay sated, dreamy but wakeful. Her husband slept beside her, his big body curled around her possessively. He was an enigma, this man she had married, during the day he seemed so distant and unapproachable, every inch the brusque stranger she had married. But at night, oh, at night he took her to a state she had never dreamed was possible. She had come to crave his attentions, the embrace of his strong, hard body, the feeling of total possession, of utter abandonment. Only a few days before, she couldn't imagine what it would be like to sleep with a relative stranger, to reveal her nakedness to him, to have him handle and invade her body. Now she couldn't imagine life without it, without him, this odd, spiky, difficult-to-know man. She needed time, time to get to know him better, time for him to know her, not just her body, time to make a real marriage of this arrangement but he would be returning to his position abroad in a few weeks. She woke not long after dawn, feeling him slide out of bed. She blinked sleepily as he wrapped his dressing gown around him. Going riding again? Bars of sunlight came through the gaps in the curtains. Yes, go back to sleep. I won't be home until very late. Take the girls with you. I can't. I'm not going for a recreational ride. This is business. She sat up, drawing the bedclothes around her against the morning chill. Take them anyway. This is their home. I'm sure they'd like to renew their acquaintance with, and in George's case, meet the people of the estate. It's not that kind of business. You can't put it off, not even for just a day. I'd prefer not to. The girls, Rose and Lily at least, know the estate well. They can show Georgiana around. Make sure they take a groom with them. His indifference irritated her. That's not the point. Do you realize those girls think you've brought them here to keep them out of trouble? He blinked. I have. Yes, but they think you plan to dump them in the country. I do until it's time for them to go to London. I thought you understood. They thought the carriage was going to take them to London. You did say they would go to London. Yes, but not yet. They weren't to know that. They thought you lied to them, tricked them into coming here. His brows snapped together. Lied? She shrugged. From all I can gather, none of the girls has had much reason to rely on the men in their lives. His frown deepened. They think you don't care about them. She softened her voice. 
I know you care, of course, but how do you think it will look to them if, on their very first day here, you abandon them? He shook his head as if that made no sense. I'm not abandoning them. You're here. She threw a pillow at him in frustration. Yes, but I'm not their brother or their uncle. Rose and Lily have not been home for years. They were sent away to school and practically forgotten. In all the time they attended Miss Mallard's, the only person who showed the slightest interest in them was dear Lady Dorothea. Your father never wrote or visited. Your brother never wrote or visited, and you... Yes, I know you were abroad, but you still never wrote. She was pleased to see him flinch. As for George, from all I can gather, the poor child has been raised as a stranger in her own family, neither acknowledged nor cared for. I know you were ignorant of her existence and cannot be blamed for that, but it's no wonder the poor girl is stiff and wary, hauled away, practically kidnapped from all she knew and expected to fit in as part of a family? He had caught the pillow. He put it aside and eyed her cautiously. I'm doing my best. It's difficult. She made a scornful sound. He scowled. Why are you so cross with me? Because you're oblivious to those girls' needs. Don't you want to be part of a family? No. Don't bother answering. It's patently obvious you don't have the first idea. Go on, then. Go off on your wretched estate business. I'll do what I can to make the girls feel welcome. It's what you hired me for, after all. I didn't hire you. I married you, he growled. She snorted. Her attitude annoyed him. And it's not estate business. It's government business. She rolled her eyes. Of course, the same mysterious but important government business that conveniently arises whenever you want to avoid other family duties. He stiffened. It is important, and it's not in the least convenient. And the reason I won't take the girls with me is because there is a possibility of danger. Danger? She raised her brows, not caring that her expression was entirely sceptical. Cal compressed his lips. It was obvious she didn't believe him. He hesitated, about to leave, then changed his mind. He was married now. She had a right to know. He returned and sat down on the end of the bed, forcing his mind off the awareness that beneath the bundle of bedclothes she was all warm and soft and naked and delicious. I'm in pursuit of an assassin. An assassin? She sat up straighter, hugging the blankets around her. Tell me more. He told her about his job, how it had changed since Waterloo, and the army of occupation, how it had become more subtle. You mean you're a spy? No. He hated that term. But the world is changing, and in the wake of Napoleon, Europe is being remade. Countries and principalities are merging, being annexed or absorbed. New alliances are being made, and it is in our government's interest to make sure that we are not, shall we say, disadvantaged in the balance of power. She nodded. It's made the teaching of the globes very difficult, too. The changing borders and disappearing countries... I could hardly keep up. Cal opened his mouth to point out it was not quite the same thing, but decided discretion was the better part of husbandly valor. He told her about the scorpion then, and how the pursuit had become personal when his friend Bentley had been shot. I wish you could have known him. He was a scraggly, awkward, odd-looking boy, all ears and elbows, and Adam's apple but he had an unquenchable spirit. Nothing defeated him, even though he was a walking target to the bullies of the school. Such an odd bod he was. He gave a rueful half-laugh. 
He never did learn to box worth sixpence, though he tried. Lord, how he tried. He was silent a moment. But a fine, fine brain. I've seen men twice his age stunned at his clever reasoning and brilliant ideas. And then... His voice broke, and for a moment he had to fight for control. She slipped her hand into his and squeezed, and the calmness with which she waited and the warmth of her quiet presence steadied him until he could go on without disgracing himself. He explained how he had half recognized the assassin and come back to England on nothing more solid than conjecture and how he and a couple of others had been working through the list of men who'd been dismissed from the rifle brigade. We're lucky it's a relatively short list. The rifle brigade is one of the few regiments that has remained at almost full strength. Those sharpshooters are too valuable to lose. So you're what? Looking for someone who left the regiment, but who has been absent from their home at odd periods? He nodded pleased with her quick understanding. Exactly. And today, I'm going to check on the last two in my area, Bert and Joe Gimbel, two brothers, so I can't take the girls with me. Besides, it's a long ride, and I won't be returning until well after dark. I see. She was silent a moment, resting her chin on her knees. I don't suppose I can argue that the girl's needs are greater than the capture of a notorious assassin, she said eventually. Go on, then. I'll do my best to make them feel welcome and wanted. Cal rose from the bed. I appreciate it. He headed toward the connecting door when she called after him. Lord, um, Ashenden? He turned. We are not in public, madam. You may use my Christian name. She raised her brows humorously. And yet I am madam? He inclined his head in rueful acknowledgement. What should I call you then? Emmeline? Yes, or M. And what do I call you? Cal or Calborn, suit yourself. The girls call me Cal. Ashenden, if you prefer. It's what Aunt Agatha calls me now. He turned to leave. Cal, she called. What is it now? If it's dangerous for the girls, it must be even more dangerous for you. You're not going alone, are you? He shrugged. I work best alone. Then I hope you're well armed. I am. Cal closed the door behind him and rang for hot water. Somehow telling his wife about Bentley had lifted a weight off his chest. She was very easy to talk to, a good and sympathetic listener, when she wasn't arguing with him. As he shaved and dressed, he considered what she'd said about the girls. Did they really think he didn't care about them? He damned well turned his life upside down for their sake. He supposed they didn't realize that. M rose and rang for hot water. I'll wear my riding habit, Millie, she told her maid when she arrived. And wake the girls up, will you? We're going riding this morning. Her old habit was faded and a bit shabby. She hadn't worn it for seven years, and she had had Millie move the buttons as she'd filled out in the bosom and hips since then. But M was looking forward to riding again. She would get Rose and Lily to show her and George the estate. With any luck, they would not even notice their brother's absence. She had given some thought to keeping the girls occupied and happy while they were here. As she had told their brother some weeks ago, Lily and Rose were bright but bored, and when young women were bored, they got up to mischief. Vigorous exercise was one way of keeping them out of trouble. Millie came back shortly afterward with the news that the girls were already up and dressed, that the master had summoned them for a ride before breakfast. So he had changed his mind about the urgency of his mission. Perhaps he had listened to her after all. 
Encouraged by the news, M hurried downstairs and let herself out the back door. As she headed around the back of the house toward the stables, she heard voices raised in argument. I won't, and you can't make me, it's stupid. The unmistakable tones of George. You will, my girl, or you won't ride at all. Her husband's voice. She hurried toward the stables. It's a perfectly ridiculous way to ride. How can I control Sultan perched up on that silly contraption? A rider, a good rider, needs only his knees to control their horse, but this way... It is how ladies ride. Well, not me, and you can't tell me how to ride my own horse. Sultan belongs to me. I can always send the horse and his stable boy back to where they came from. A silky-voiced threat. M picked up the pace and half skidded around the corner to see her husband standing in the middle of the stable yard, glaring in frustration at his niece. Rose and Lily mounted on side saddles, watched in wary silence, as did the hound Finn. Both girls were dressed in riding habits that M noticed were almost as out of date as hers. The curriculum at Miss Mallard's seminary did not include equestrian skills, so M guessed it had been nearly as long for the girls as for her. George, on the other hand, was dressed in masculine breeches and boots. She wore a scowl that matched her uncle's so exactly that M was hard put not to laugh. He stood holding the reins of his own horse and a black stallion that M hadn't seen before. Apparently, the horse George had raised herself. The stallion bore a side saddle. Good morning, everyone, M said blithely. You're quite right, George. A side saddle is a ridiculous affair. If it were not, then men would use them too. But I'm afraid your uncle is also right. If you wish to ride when we go to London, you will have to ride side saddle. To ride astride would brand you as a hoyden of the worst kind. George looked mutinous. M was sure the girl was about to declare that she didn't care, so she added lightly, and that would make things very unpleasant for Rose and Lily, as well as for you. Black brows drew together. George cast a doubtful glance at the other two girls. Why should it make things difficult for them? Because we are a family now, and what one family member does affects the reputation of the others. She let that sink in a moment and added, If one girl is held to be badly brought up, people will assume the other girls are just as wild and ungovernable. She let that sink in, and not only to George. M produced an apple core and offered it to Sultan. His lips were velvety soft as he nuzzled the fruit from her palm. You accepted necessity when you trained this beautiful creature, George. It's the same thing. George looked puzzled. What necessity? You raised Sultan, didn't you? Trained him from a foal? George nodded. M continued. You could have left him to grow up wild and free, unbroken and untamed, but you wanted him to be able to go anywhere, to be respected and admired by all who saw him. So you broke him to bit and bridle and taught him his company manners. She saw from George's expression that she understood. Your life has changed, George, she said softly. You can continue to fight against bridle and bit or you can learn to accept a different kind of freedom and find joy in your new life. It's up to you. There was a short silence, broken only by Sultan snuffling and waffling down M's front in search of another apple. I really do understand how you feel, though, M continued in a sympathetic tone. Before I was sent away to school, I always rode astride and wore breeches all the time. It's far more comfortable and practical, I agree. You did? George exclaimed. Didn't your parents mind? 
Lily asked curiously. My mother died when I was an infant, and my father, well, let's just say he found it easiest to treat me as a boy. I'd probably still be wearing breeches and careering around the country astride had not the good ladies of church and county descended on my father in a pack when I was thirteen and informed him I was becoming a complete hoyden and would, if left to continue my pathway, become quite unmarriageable. They convinced him to send me away to school to learn to be a lady. She smiled at Rose and Lily. Miss Mallard's. She said to George, Your uncle told me you are an excellent horsewoman. The girl blinked and gave her uncle a surprised glance. M continued, It won't take you long to master the side saddle. Teach your beautiful sultan how to go on with it and show him off to the world. But there are a few tricks to it. May I? She gestured towards George's horse. George hesitated, then nodded. M checked the fit of the saddle. Perfect. The worst aspect is that you need a mounting block or another person to help you mount. Quite irritating if you want to be independent. She turned to her husband. Boost me up? He hesitated, his expression unreadable. Just to demonstrate the seat, he said reluctantly. We don't yet know how the horse will react to the side saddle. Of course, Em said with a sweet smile. He passed the reins of his horse to a stable boy, cupped his hands to make a cradle for her boot, and tossed her lightly into the saddle. Sultan, unused to the weight and balance of rider and side saddle, fidgeted and stamped restlessly. You seat yourself like this, George. It's actually much more balanced and comfortable than it looks. In riding, as in life, everything is balance. M gathered the reins, hooked her right knee around the lower pommel, and slid her other boot into the stirrup. And by the time Sultan decided he didn't like the strange saddle or the strange rider, she was ready for him. The horse reared up a little, snorting and plunging. Right, that's it, off now. Cal came forward, obviously intending to grab the bridle and force the head down. George and the stable boy did the same, but already disturbed, and with people coming from two directions, the horse danced nervously away, shying and tossing his head. Stay back, I can manage, M called. It's just temper, isn't it? You beautiful boy. Come on, then. Let's see how you can move. And she urged the horse out of the stable yard and headed briskly down the drive. Sultan seemed a little unsure at first, champing restlessly at the bit and tossing his head in annoyance. But M had him firmly under control, and as she urged him faster, his gait lengthened, first into a smooth canter, then a hard gallop. It was utterly exhilarating. The thunder of hooves behind her warned her that her husband was in hot pursuit. She glanced back to see Rose and Lily following at some distance. Cal drew level with her and reached out for her bridle. Don't you dare, she cried, raising her whip at him in a teasing threat. I'm having a glorious time. Race you to the gate. And she urged Sultan faster. They were neck and neck when they reached the gate. What the devil do you think? He began. M wheeled her mount around. Race you back. As they neared the stable yard, she reined in her horse and entered the yard in a demure trot. She leaned forward and patted the horse's neck. He's an absolute beauty, George, she said as George and the new stable boy came running toward them. You did a marvellous job training him. He's taken to the side saddle remarkably well. Lord, but you can ride, Em, George gasped. You beat him. Cal, I mean, even with that silly saddle, I didn't think anyone could ride like that on one of those things. Em laughed. I had a head start. But I'm certain once you and Sultan are used to the side saddle, you'll beat everyone to flinders. He moves like a dream. 
she lifted her leg over the lower pommel and slid lightly to the ground, only to find her arm seized in a hard grip. A word with you, madam? Her husband tossed his reins to the stable boy and marched her into the stables. Rose slipped off her own horse and came forward, looking concerned. Stay out of it, Rose, he growled. M nodded to reassure the girl and send a quick smile to Lily and George, who were watching wide-eyed. He was in a fine old temper, but M wasn't the least bit worried. She was, however, interested to know why. You out, he snapped to a pair of gawking grooms. Everyone outside until I say so. The grooms fled. He pushed her into a stall, shut the door and glared at her, his eyes sparking flinty gray. Another magnificent beast with a temper. Chapter 16 If this be not love, it is madness, and then it is pardonable. William Congreve the old bachelor. Now, madam, what do you have to say for yourself? She was breathless, her heart racing, and not just because of the ride. It was the way he was looking at her, so darkly furious. He had never looked at her that way before, not in daylight. He wasn't the cool and controlled Lord Ashenden now. Somehow that look thrilled her. She gave him a bright smile. Wasn't that utterly exhilarating? I haven't ridden for years. That horse of George's is wonderful. How dare you ride off like that on an untrained horse? He really was rather rattled, she saw, and decided to push him a little further. Oh, Pooh, he took to it like a lamb. His jaw tightened, and he took a step forward. You weren't to know that. It was a damned foolhardy act. Nonsense. I've been riding since I could walk. I can tell when a horse is merely nervous and uncertain, and when he's... You could have been thrown. But I wasn't, she said calmly. I don't know why you're making such a fuss. He gave her a goaded look. You vowed to obey me, he grated. He took another step forward. He was close enough for her to smell him now, the clean scent of linen, shaving soap, and a faint tang of fresh horse sweat, and man, angry, aroused man. Oh, you're just cross because I beat you in the race, she said provocatively. It's nothing to do with that, it's... Damn it, woman! He wrapped one powerful arm around her, hauled her against him, and kissed her long and hard. It was a conflagration of anger and arousal, compelling and possessive. Heat and frustrated anger radiated from his body. His arm enclosed her waist like a steel band as his other hand wrapped around her throat, cupping her chin, tilting her mouth to accept the demand of his kiss. He moved forward, taking her with him, trapping her between his hot, hard body and the cold stone of the stable wall, not breaking the kiss for an instant. Plundering. Demanding. His taste, the urgency of him flooded her senses, his heat seeping into her body, setting her aflame. She felt the heavy thrust of his arousal against her belly. Her knees weakened, a hard masculine limb thrust between her thighs, anchoring her. She had braced her hands behind her against the cold, rough wall, but as he deepened the kiss, scalding her with inflamed passion, she slipped them up his body, twining them around his neck, sliding her fingers through the damp tangle of his hair, gripping the thick locks fiercely as she returned kiss for kiss. Never, never had she dreamed kissing could be like this. Cal wasn't sure what brought him to his senses. A sound, a thought, a cold dash of sanity, but whatever it was, it was enough to let himself wrench his mouth from his wife's, release her and step back. His breath was ragged, as if he'd run a mile. For a long moment, they stared at each other. She was panting too, 
her mouth damp and red from where he had ravaged it. Good God, what had he been about to do? He'd been on the verge of taking her, here in the stables, up against a rough stone wall, with the girls and the stable boys outside? Madness. Em? Cal? Is everything all right? A hesitant voice called. It was his little sister. Stay outside, Lily, he said hastily. He was still aroused. It's perfectly all right, Lily, his wife called, sounding satisfyingly breathless. Your brother and I are, um, having a discussion. Remembering that he'd been furious with her, and still was, for risking herself on an untried horse, he groped for something conclusive to say. Let that be a lesson to you, madam. Her eyes widened, and then, incredibly, she laughed. A lesson? I see I shall have to annoy you more often in future, then. The light in her eyes was soft, not challenging, inviting him to share the moment. His lips twitched in response. I wasn't annoyed, he began. I was... Oh, to hell with it, just don't be so reckless in future. You gave me a hell of a fright. I'm sorry, it was... Oh, it was so very good to be on horseback and out in the fresh air again. I couldn't resist. There really was no danger. He's a beautiful animal and very well trained. But I'm sorry I worried you. She slipped her arm through his. Shall we return to the girls? Lily sounded quite worried. He was fit to be seen again, so he opened the stall door and led her back outside to where the others were waiting. You're a magnificent horsewoman. I had no idea. Why did you not tell me you rode? She shrugged. You never asked, and besides, you'd made it clear you wanted me to get on with the house refurbishment. He felt a pang of compunction. He really should have taken the trouble to learn more about her. I borrowed horses from a neighbor for Rose and Lily and had Georgiana's horse and his groom brought from her former home. He had thought it might make her feel more at home. His wife glanced up at him. So there isn't a mount for me, not even a mule or a donkey? He shook his head. But I'll send for one at once. Which, a mule or a donkey? She was teasing him again, he saw, and felt something loosen in his chest. The mount you deserve, he told her in a severe tone. She laughed again, and there was a sense of companionship in her attitude, as though they'd crossed some threshold. He didn't know what, but it pleased him. Are you still going after your assassin today? She asked quietly. No, I'll go tomorrow. I've been chasing the swine for two years. Another day won't make much difference. They emerged into the morning sunshine, where the three girls waited apprehensively. Their gaze immediately shot to his wife, examining her for signs of violence, he supposed. Emmeline clung to his arm and said gaily, We've discussed the matter and Cal is going to find something for me to ride so we can all ride out together. A donkey, Cal growled. A donkey? Rose began, a belligerent expression on her face. But she... It's a joke, Rose, Emmeline assured her with a laugh. Your brother didn't know I could ride, so he only borrowed horses for you and Lily for while we're here. And of course, he sent for George's beautiful sultan because he knew George would be fretting about him. And I must say... George, he is a beautiful creature. I quite envy you. Rose turned a surprised look on Cal. You arranged horses especially for us? He shrugged. I knew you'd want to ride, and this place hasn't been occupied since father died. Henry sold off all the horses. And you brought Jem here as well as Sultan, George said. Thank you, Cal. It was the first openly friendly thing the girl had said to him. We'll drop in on Sir Alfred Chisholm. He 
He's the neighbor I borrowed the horses from, and see if he can spare a mount for Emmeline. He turned a stern look on his niece. He's the master of the hunt, and if you bother him in any way, shape, or form, George, your horse is going straight back to Alderton, and that enormous hound of yours. To his surprise, his niece grinned at the threat. You called me George, she said triumphantly. Slip of the tongue, he said gruffly. Now, since you're dressed in those wretched breeches, you can ride up behind me. Emmeline can take Sultan, and we'll all ride over to Sir Alfred's together and presume on his generosity one more time. Cal's horse's hooves crunched on the frozen grass, leaving a trail of round green hoof prints. The bare branches of the trees were rimmed with frost, a landscape of silver and white with darkly etched silhouettes and shadows of grey and lilac. He crested the hill and turned to look back at the house. The weak winter sun was just beginning to touch the tips of the chimneys. He'd left well before dawn this morning, taking extra care not to wake his wife, telling himself it was to get this task done in good time, but knowing he'd taken the coward's exit. The events of the day before had disturbed him. First, his loss of control in the stables. He never lost control. And then, he didn't know quite why he'd found the day he'd spent with his wife and the girl so disturbing, They'd ridden over to Sir Alfred's and borrowed another horse for M, and of course Lady Chisholm had insisted they come in for a bite of breakfast first, and it was quite late by then, and they were all hungry, and besides, it would have been rude to refuse. Sir Alfred's eyes had bulged at the sight of Georgiana in her disgraceful breeches. He'd turned bright red, made several loud harumphing sounds, and for the rest of the visit had carefully pretended the girl was not there. He'd waxed eloquent in praise of Sultan, wanting to know his breeding and paces, and was noticeably disconcerted when Cal referred him to Georgiana, the invisible girl who owned, raised, and trained him. Lady Chisholm, much more tactful, had simply assumed Georgiana had had an accident with her habit and had produced an old riding habit of her daughter's for her to wear. To Cal's surprise, after a silent exchange of glances with Emmeline, Georgiana accepted the gift politely and donned the skirt over her breeches without fuss or argument. Cal had to assume his wife's influence was at work in producing this unaccustomed docility in his niece, though how she had achieved it was a mystery. All he knew was that if he had tried to get the girl into a riding skirt— She'd have resisted furiously. After breakfast, they'd spent the rest of the morning and early afternoon riding around the estate, Georgiana learning the way of riding side saddle, Emmeline and the girls showing her how. Of course, she managed perfectly. The girl was a natural, but it was an occasion of much laughter and spirited debate, though somehow all in fun. And of course... As the places they visited jogged memories in himself and his half-sisters, various stories and tales had emerged. It became, as well as a pleasant ride, an afternoon of recollections, family stories and laughing disputes about the truth of various events. His wife was at the heart of it, of course, asking questions, prompting the stories, and encouraging them all to share memories and impressions of times past. She even got George to open up a little. Listening to his niece's stories, Cal was forced to admit that when she wasn't spitting and snarling in defiance of his edicts, Georgiana could be quite charming. She told a number of amusing tales, several at her own expense. But reading between the lines, he could see she had led a lonely and often difficult life and he cursed again the selfishness of Henry, who had deprived her of all that her birth entitled her. He would make it up to the girl, he vowed silently. Or Emmeline would, in his name. Cal also found himself recounting tales of events and boyish adventures he'd almost completely forgotten about. He'd shown them his favourite fishing spot, 
a tree in which he'd tried to make a secret hideout. The remnants of it were still visible, and even a place where hawks nested, and he told them he'd always wanted to try training a hawk, but had never been allowed. He'd never told that to anyone. Emmeline hadn't said a word about herself except once when Lily had asked her whether she'd liked school. She pulled a face and laughed, saying, Not at all, I was thoroughly miserable for ages. I was most unladylike and was forever in trouble, and I missed the horses and my dog desperately, but I got used to it, and then changed the subject. Cal wanted to know more. He had gone over her story, well, the few grudging shreds of it she'd shared with him, over and over in his mind, and it still didn't add up. If she had hated school as a pupil, why had she then returned to become a teacher there? And why had she been disinherited by her father? But he didn't want to question her in front of the girls, and so the moment passed. Emmeline got him and his sisters talking about things they never would normally have discussed. Things about his father, his memories of his mother, of the girl's mother, of their grandparents and Aunt Dottie and Aunt Agatha. She had even somehow coaxed him to talk a bit about the war, something he never did, not to civilians. Not the worst stuff, of course, but several stories and anecdotes that in retrospect turned out to be somewhat amusing. It was, as Emmeline had said when they returned home, tired, hungry, and happy, a wonderful family day. Why that should make Cal feel unaccountably restless and uncomfortable, he didn't know. But it did. He wasn't used to being in a family, being part of a family, doing family things. He felt, he felt like Gulliver being slowly trapped by a multitude of tiny strings, none of them strong enough in itself to entrap a man, but together. A story, a smile, a pair of long, graceful legs, sparkling grey-green eyes, a mouth as ripe as berries. He needed to get back to work, to focus on the task at hand. He couldn't afford to be distracted. That night, after dinner, while the girls were distracted with a clever puzzle, he'd spoken to Em in private and raised the subject of Georgiana's about face, the transformation from recalcitrant brat into demure young lady. How did you do that? Made her do what you wanted without any fuss and bother. Rose, too. I ask them to do something, and it's the worst thing in the world, and I'm an evil bully. You ask them, and they're as sweet as honey. She smiled. Young girls, especially bright and spirited young girls, need to be handled delicately. Delicately? He made a rude noise. There's nothing delicate about those girls. Perhaps Lily. Delicate in the sense of how you would handle a spirited filly. With praise and reward, not force. In the army, discipline was all about force and leadership and trust. She nodded. Trust is vital here too, but it goes both ways. The girls are coming to trust you. But they need to know you trust them too. Show them what you expect. Trust them to do the right thing. Give them responsibility and some freedom. Freedom? He shuddered. I hate to think what they'll get up to. She laughed. And praise, lots of praise. The girls, for all their apparent confidence, are full of doubt, particularly self-doubt. Even Rose? She nodded. Even Rose. He frowned. He didn't want the girls to be full of self-doubt. He wanted them confident and strong. Trust and responsibility, you say? And praise for everything they do right, or every attempt they make to do the right thing. Praise them, you'll see. He looked doubtful, so she added. They admire and look up to you, you know. He snorted. They do not. She laughed. They do. 
They just don't show it to your face. But have patience. You did well today, and so did they. It gave him something to think of. And then later that night, when he'd entered her bedchamber and found her lolling sleepily in her bath, soaking out the stiffness of her long ride. The bath had been placed in front of the fire. The flames made her glow, her skin gleaming with water and bath oils. She was stiff and sore from her long, unaccustomed ride. He should have left her to soak, left her to sleep in peace, by herself. If he'd touched her at all, it should have been to rub her briskly with horse liniment. That would have soothed her aches. But he hadn't. He hadn't been able to resist the sight of her, all creamy and pink and damp. She had welcomed him with a sleepy smile, and that was all it took. He had scooped her out of the bath and made love to her, once in front of the fire and then again in bed. He never lost control. Now it escaped him on the smallest of excuses. Cal eased his horse into a canter, and the house fell away from sight. This business of being married, of being part of a family, of handling wild and unruly hoydens delicately— he was much more comfortable hunting assassins. The two sagging cottages were joined by one wall. Both dwellings seemed deserted. Cal knocked on each door, then peered in the windows. The rooms were sparsely furnished, but there were signs of recent occupation. Told you you was too late, the ancient hood directed him to these cottages, called out in a creaky voice. Cleared out they have gone to America. Cal swore. The old man had told him, while puffing on an evil-smelling pipe, and with the encouragement of the occasional coin, all he needed to know to be sure that he'd found his man at last. The Gimble brothers were as like as two peas in a pod. And close. They'd even married two sisters. They'd left the rifle brigade when the war was over and returned to their village, but times were tough, and they'd decided to migrate to America. Bert had gone ahead, while Joe had taken some jobs abroad to earn the money for fares for the wives and children, and to give them a good start in a new country. Cal was sure he knew what those jobs had been. When did Joe and the women and children leave? Cal asked. It couldn't have been long. There was the end of a loaf of bread on the table. It was not yet mouldy, nor eaten by mice. The old man contemplated his pipe and waited until Cal produced another coin. Left yesterday morn in a rush, don't know why. They've been talking about going to America for a couple of years. Bert, he went first going ahead, like to make things ready for their wives and the little uns. Got a farm, he has, all ready for em. Wrote him a letter to say so and all. When was this? The letter from America? He puffed a cloud of reeking smoke as he considered it. Couple of months back, I reckon. Don't exactly remember, but it was afore Christmas. Lots of excitement when it comes, see. Cal jerked his head at the cottages. Looks to me like they left in a hurry. The old man nodded. Joe come back sudden, like day afore yesterday. Well, he comes and goes, does Joe. Never know where he be. But this time he come back from Lunnon, and whatever he told them got em all stirred up, and by the next morning they was all packed up and gone. He grinned knowingly and sucked on his pipe. Told ye I did. They've gone. Cal swore under his breath. Obviously Joe had been tipped off by someone that people had been investigating the activities of former riflemen. Where did they go? Which direction? The old man gestured with his reeking pipe. London. London? Cal queried sharply. You're sure it was London, not Liverpool or Bristol? Ships bound for America most often left from Bristol or Liverpool. The old man shook his head. No, it was London for sure. Heard Joe say he was owed money there and would collect before he left. Thank you. 
Cal tossed the old fellow a last coin, mounted his horse, and headed for home. Damn it. If he hadn't spent the day before with the girls and his wife. Chapter 17 All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. William Shakespeare, as you like it. I'm leaving for London first thing in the morning, Cal told M over a late supper. He told her how he'd just missed the man he was sure was the scorpion. He would have left while we were riding aimlessly around the estate. It wasn't aimless in the least, she said calmly. It was exactly what you and the girls needed and I was glad to get to know the estate a little. Besides, if the fellow you're chasing left at first alight yesterday morning, you still would have missed him, albeit by a few hours instead of a whole day. Still, I'm sure you'll catch him. She rose and moved to the door. I'll tell the girls to be packed and ready to leave after breakfast, then. He frowned. The girls? No. I'm not taking the girls. He hadn't planned to take anyone, not even his wife. She turned back, one eyebrow raised. You can't possibly leave them here. Why not? This is their home. She gave him a pointed look. Don't imagine one day of riding and brotherly pleasantness will rid them of the suspicion that you mean to dump them in the country, particularly if you then do dump them here while you go swanning off to London. I'm not swanning anywhere. I'm pursuing a criminal. Yes, in London, she said serenely. And we will come too. We'll need to order a great many clothes if all three girls are to make their come out this spring, you know. Men never have the least idea how much preparation is involved. Oh, the girls will be so excited. I must tell them before they retire for the night. Madam, he began. She paused, her brow crinkling. Do you think the antiquated old coach in the stables will be up to the journey, or should we hire a second carriage? We'll need at least two carriages for all of us, including Millie, my maid, and the dog, of course. Madam, I'm not taking the carriage anywhere, it's far too slow for my purposes. I'm riding, which is why... She gave him a dazzling smile. Oh, good. That will work nicely, then. It'll be a squeeze, especially with the dog, but we'll manage. And you can ride ahead and inform the staff at Ashenden House to expect us. Excellent. I wasn't planning to go anywhere near Ashenden House, he informed her. I'm in pursuit of an assassin. Send a message to the staff when you get there, then. It won't take but a moment, she said blithely. I have a job to do in London, a dangerous job. He reiterated in a firm voice. I don't have time to be looking after... He was going to say a wife, but decided on discretion at the last minute. My sisters and niece... He didn't want any of them there. He wanted to keep his mind clear for his pursuit. Of course not, she agreed. That's what you married me for. And she sailed through the door, leaving him glowering and slightly baffled. It was what he'd married her for. It was just that when she said it like that, it sounded... wrong. London was damp, the sky overlaid with a dirty, yellowish gloom. Cal headed straight for Gil Radcliffe's office in Whitehall. I think I found the scorpion, only he just slipped through my fingers. He explained his reasoning, and at the end, Radcliffe nodded briskly. Sounds like our man, all right. You don't know where in London he was headed. No, just that it was London, and that he was owed money here. But he took two women, his wife and sister-in-law, their sisters, and three children with him. He shook his head. 
I know. Needle in a haystack. Radcliffe frowned thoughtfully for a moment, scribbled a note, then called for his clerk. Run over to the Rifle Brigade headquarters and see what information they have on these two. Most urgent status. The man took the note and hurried off. The writing of the note jogged Cal's memory. Is there some paper I can use for a note? I need to inform the staff at Ashenden House that my wife and sisters and niece are to arrive shortly. God knows what state the house is in. My late brother seemed to have neglected everything. Radcliffe's brows rose. You seem to have acquired a few more dependents since we last met. My felicitations on your marriage. But the niece? Henry's daughter by a secret earlier marriage. The selfish swine. Eighteen years old, and the family knew nothing about her. Oh, that will please your aunt, Agatha. Radcliffe said dryly. Cal raised an ironic brow. Does anything ever please Aunt Agatha? When I last saw her, she was none too pleased about your, uh, rather swift marriage. Was doing her best to ferret out what I knew about your wife's family. Of course, I told her nothing. Cal frowned. Do you know anything? Radcliffe spread his fingers and looked mysterious. Typical. Secrecy was Radcliffe's middle name. He was like a bank vault. He only opened up when it suited him. Well, if you happen to run into Aunt Agatha again, don't tell her I'm in town. With any luck, I'll be back in Europe by the time she discovers I've been in London. You're still planning to return to your former occupation? Of course, why not? he added, seeing Radcliffe's expression. Isn't that what we agreed in the first place? You gave me four weeks' leave. Yes, but with the title and estate and now this marriage, I assumed... Cal shook his head. The estate affairs are all in order and my wife is happy to launch the girls, so nothing much needs to change. Radcliffe gave him a long look. That glint of amusement returned. You just got married, have taken custody of three spirited young ladies, all heiresses, I assume, and you don't expect your life to change? Why should it? My wife handles them brilliantly. I didn't marry a silly young chit, you know. I married a good woman with brains, character, and common sense. Radcliffe chuckled softly. All the more reason your life will never be the same again. No, don't bother to argue, time will tell. As for sending a note, it will take at least two hours to unearth the information we require from the Rifle Brigade, which leaves you plenty of time to drop by Ashenden House yourself and make what arrangements need to be done. I'll see you back here at six. Having nothing else to do, Cal rode over to Mayfair and rang the bell at Ashenden House. Were any servants in residence at all? If not, he'd have to put Emmeline and the girls in a suite at the Pulteney while domestic arrangements were made. To his surprise, the door was opened by a butler, a man he'd never seen before. The two men stared blankly at each other. The butler was young, as butlers went, about forty. He bowed slightly. I'm afraid the family is out of town at present, sir. No, we are not, Cal told him. I'm Ashenden. This is my house, and you are... Burton, my lord, I'm terribly sorry, I... Cal waved his apologies aside. Who hired you? Mr. Phipps, your man of affairs, my lord. Cal handed the man his hat and coat. He should have known it. Phipps trod a fine line between being ultra-efficient and interfering. I came to warn you to expect my wife, Lady Ashenden, and my wards, Lady Rose, Lady Lily, and Lady Georgiana. The butler's eyes widened slightly, but he said smoothly, When do you anticipate they will arrive, my lord? Cal glanced at the hall clock. Sometime this evening, I expect. Mid-morning tomorrow at the latest. Very good, my lord. The staff will be in readiness. 
There is a staff, is there? Yes, my lord, all new like myself, but I fancy we are working well together. Shall I fetch them for an introduction? Cal waved off that suggestion. No need, my wife will do all that. The running of the house is in her hands. Burton inclined his head. Do you require anything at present, my lord? No, I just dropped in to let you know to expect the ladies. I'll be going back out shortly. What shall I tell Lady Salter, my lord? Cal blinked. Aunt Agatha? Why, nothing, of course. He frowned at the man's expression. What's she got to do with anything? It was Lady Salter who instructed Mr. Phipps to hire the staff for the house and prepare for your arrival. She didn't know the date, of course, but she's been checking up on us and giving orders. Cal swore under his breath. Giving orders would be right. Nothing Aunt Agatha liked better. Is there a problem, my lord? No, just... just don't tell Lady Salter anything. Burton gave him a pained look. She visits daily, my lord. Daily? Good God! Cal gave a hunted glance behind him. Has she been here today? This morning, my lord, the butler said in a soothing voice. She normally comes each morning around eleven. Cal made a note to be out of the house every morning around eleven. I'm going out again now. I'm not sure when I'll be back. Is there a key? Burton fetched him a key. Cal pocketed it and left. Robert and Joseph Gimble have no relatives listed, except for their wives, Radcliffe said when Cal returned to Whitehall. He didn't look unhappy, though. And the good news? Cal asked. Radcliffe tapped the file in front of him and allowed himself a small grin. One of the wives listed as next of kin. The two wives are sisters. Exactly. And they have an aunt who lives in, wait for it, Whitechapel. She's married to a weaver. You think that's where he'll be? Cal felt a surge of excitement. Whitechapel was just a short distance from Whitehall. Radcliffe nodded. They have small children, don't forget, so they can't stay just anywhere. I've sent men to the aunt's house. Cal's jaw dropped, but I... He broke off. Wanted to be in at the kill, understandable, but we can't risk losing him. There's a rabbit warren of lanes and alleys around the aunt's house. I've sent a dozen armed men. Don't worry, you'll get the credit for his capture. I don't care about that, Cal said impatiently. I just wanted to lay hands on the bastard myself. Radcliffe gave him a cool look. Revenge for Bentley, yes. But you know as well as anyone that the work we do is a team effort, and no one man matters as long as the outcome is the one we want. Cal glanced at the clock. When did they leave? An hour ago. They'll be in position by now. We should hear one way or the other sometime in the next hour or so. He produced a bottle and two glasses from a drawer in his desk. Brandy? Cal nodded. If he had to wait and do nothing, he might as well have a drink. An hour crawled past. Radcliffe had busied himself with paperwork. Cal did his best to tamp down on his impatience. He tried to read a newspaper but couldn't concentrate. After all this time, a hunt across the continent and England to have to wait tamely in an office while other men captured that swine. When the clock softly chimed the passing of the second hour, Cal stood up. We should have heard something by now. I'm going to Whitechapel. Radcliffe opened his mouth to forbid it, but Cal held up his hand. Don't worry, I'll stay well back and out of your men's hair. I know better than to interfere in an operation. But I want to be there when he's taken into custody. 
to see him and be certain he's the man I saw. And if something goes wrong, I might be able to help. Radcliffe frowned. It's dark. I'll be invisible in the background. You know I can do it. After a moment, Radcliffe nodded. Very well. But stay well back. It started to drizzle around ten. Cal propped up against a cold and grimy brick wall in the shadows of a dim and noisome alleyway, pulled his coat collar up and wished he'd had a little more of that brandy. The rain sputtered to a halt just after midnight. Radcliffe's men had reported that the little house in Whitechapel had contained three women, a huddle of small children, and only one man, the weaver, Joe Gimble. The scorpion was nowhere to be found. The women tried to pretend they knew nothing about his whereabouts, had never heard of him, in fact, but they weren't very skilled liars and were obviously frightened. Two of Radcliffe's men had remained inside the house, waiting for Gimble's return. The rest of the men melted into the shadows, posted at every approach to the house, watching and waiting. Cal lurked in a dark alleyway, his every sense primed for the appearance of the man he had pursued for so long. The alleyway reeked, the odours of the filth and rubbish of the streets intensified by the rain. Despite the rain and cold and the late hour, the streets were far from empty. A rag-and-bone man pushing his cart, a pie man, workers, prostitutes, beggars, drunks and thieves, the usual rabble of the poorer streets of London. Cal scanned every face. He had donned enough disguises to look beyond the obvious, even the women. But the only face he recognized was that of the drunk he had interviewed weeks before, the skeletal wreck of a man whose hands shook so badly he could barely hold the gin bottle he now hugged to his chest. A new gin bottle. The man glanced at him, stared, reeling and befuddled, as if he recognized Cal from somewhere but couldn't place him, then staggered on. He was in even worse shape than he had been when Cal saw him last. He stumbled into a narrow alley that Cal knew from previous investigation was a dead end and collapsed in a heap. As the hours passed, Cal became increasingly certain that Gimble wasn't going to return. Someone must have warned him. Radcliffe joined him around 4 a.m. and told him to go home. There's no point in you hanging around all night. Go home. My men will stay on for as long as it takes. If there's development, I'll let you know. Cal was cold, wet, tired, and dispirited. The investigation was out of his hands and only stubbornness was keeping him here. All right, but keep an eye on that drunk. He indicated the huddled shape collapsed in a corner of the alley. He's not Gimble, but he's a former rifleman, and I don't trust coincidences. It was almost five in the morning when Cal entered Ashenden House again. The gas lights in the entrance burned low. He shrugged off his wet coat and hung it on a hook in the cloakroom, then made his way upstairs, then paused. Which room was his bedchamber? The half dozen or so times he had stayed at Ashenden House in the past, he had had a small bedchamber on the third floor. Now, deciding that the new servants would probably have put him in his father's old room, he made his way there. He opened the door and glanced in. The room was unoccupied, but a lamp had been lit. A fire was burning in the grate, and the bed had been turned down. He began to undress, pulling off his neck cloth, unbuttoning his waistcoat and pulling his shirt tails free, looking around for somewhere to put his damp clothes. He saw a partly open door. His dressing room? 
He went in and saw that it connected to another bedroom. Emmeline's? Quietly he entered and, in the dying firelight, stood gazing down at his sleeping wife. Her dark hair was spread over the pillow. She was sleeping on her back, one hand curled to her breast, one hand flung across the empty half of the bed, palm up, fingers slightly curled. She looked young and peaceful and utterly enticing. A lock of hair lay straggled across her cheek. He bent and smoothed it back. Still fast asleep, she made a breathy little sound and snuggled into his hand. He stood there a long minute, cupping her soft cheek in his palm, hoping she would waken, but unwilling to disturb her. She must be exhausted. She had just made a long trip squashed in a carriage filled with noisy young women and a gangly great dog with a flatulent habit. He could just slip into her bed, to sleep, not for any other reason. He wouldn't have to wake her. He pulled his shirt over his head, intending to slide in beside her, then stopped, wrinkling his nose. Not only was he damp to the skin, but his clothes, and possibly his skin and hair, had been imbued with the stench of the street. He looked down at his sleeping wife and sighed. He couldn't bring that to her bed. He turned away and stripped in the dressing room, leaving his clothes piled on the floor, then slid between the cold sheets of the master bed. He lay there waiting to get warm, his body aching for Emmeline. How long had he been married? A week? And already he missed sleeping with her? It wasn't a good sign. A sliver of cool grey light pierced a gap in the drawn curtains. Daylight. Cal yawned and stretched lazily, peering through sleep-filled eyes at the ormolu clock on the overmantel. And blinked and looked again. After ten? He never slept that late. He rose and rang for hot water, and while he was waiting, he tiptoed through the dressing room and glanced in. His wife's bed was empty, neatly made up as if she'd never been there. A man who claimed to be his new valet arrived with the hot water. Another of Phipps's appointments. Did the man not realize Cal was leaving in a few weeks? Cal shaved himself, waving away the valet's services, completed his ablutions and dressed in the clothes the fellow insisted on laying out for him. Cal shrugged himself into his coat, glanced down at it and frowned. Emmeline must have packed all his clothes and brought them up to London for him. Used to travelling light, he'd shoved a few things in a saddlebag and ridden out. Another convenience of a wife, he felt mildly guilty. He went downstairs intending to have a quick breakfast and head off to Whitehall to see what had happened overnight. He was halfway down the stairs when a voice accosted him. There you are, Ashenden. A thin, immensely elegant elderly lady stood in the middle of the hallway, watching him critically through a lorgnette. Aunt Agatha the elder of his two aunts. Her hair was iron grey with two dramatic wings of silver swept up from her temples. Like Aunt Dotty, she had aged, though in quite a different fashion. The two sisters had always been chalk and cheese. She wore a smart black and white outfit that nobody would imagine was for mourning. Lolling abed till all hours were you. I cannot abide slugger beds. Cal hoped his sigh was not audible. Good morning, Aunt Agatha. She sniffed and held out her gloved hand to him. That remains to be seen. Where is this wife of yours? I wish to meet her. Cal looked around, hoping to see Emmeline somewhere about. Burton, the butler, cleared his throat. Yes, Burton. 
Lady Ashenden and the young ladies went out earlier, my lord, shopping, I believe. Aunt Agatha made an exasperated sound. No doubt she'll purchase all the wrong things. Nobody's from the country invariably do. Now, explain to me, Ashenden, if you please, the reason for this disgracefully hasty marriage to a complete and utter nobody. Did you give any consideration to what you owe your name? Obviously not. I beg your pardon, said Cal, outraged by this description of his wife. Apology accepted, Aunt Agatha said regally. But you still haven't explained yourself. My wife, he began stiffly, is not a nobody. She is... Oh, pish tosh, of course she is. Nobody has ever heard of her, and those that have know nothing good of her. A governess, Asherdon. Could you find anyone less distinguished? A washerwoman, perhaps, or a milkmaid? Milkmaids have good skin, or so I've heard. Does she have good skin, at least? Cal leashed his temper. My wife is well-educated, well-born, and... Well-born? Nonsense. According to my sources, she is a nobody, a spinster long past her prime with neither background nor looks to recommend her. Rubbish, snapped Cal. She is the daughter of a baronet. Exactly, not even a member of the nobility. She is perfect for my needs. I wrote to you and asked for your help with the girls, remember? And you washed your hands of them and me, told me to solve my own problems, and I did. Marrying Emmeline was the best thing I could have done. Nonsense! If you had asked me to find you a suitable wife, I would have found one. Someone with birth, breeding, background, and looks. A wife you could be proud of and you would have been married decently in front of everyone all the ton, not in some hasty scrambled marriage in the wilds of... in Bath Abbey by the Bishop of Bath and Wells. I know that, she said irritably. I wrote to the bishop, if you recall, and arranged for him to conduct the ceremony. Otherwise, you would no doubt have married in a wayside chapel or, heaven forbid, a civil ceremony in a dusty office somewhere... Emmeline has done wonders with the girls already. Well, of course she has. She's a governess. That's her job. But you don't marry women like that. You hire them. Cal clenched his jaw. He'd rather have all his teeth pulled than admit to Aunt Agatha that, in fact, he had tried to hire Emmeline at first. If she ever got hold of that, he'd never hear the end of it. I am very satisfied with my marriage, more than satisfied. She snorted. You have to say that. Rutherford men never admit to an error of judgment, or any other kind. For that matter, pig-headed. Your father and brother were just the same. Cal's fingers curled into fists. Why nobody had yet strangled his aunt was beyond him. Delightful as it is to chat with you, Aunt Agatha, I'm afraid I have an urgent appointment and must leave you now. Burton instantly glided out of nowhere with Cal's coat and hat. He must have been listening. He probably couldn't help but hear. Not that it would have made the slightest difference if he'd remained by Cal's side the whole time. To Aunt Agatha, servants' ears existed for one reason only, to take orders. Otherwise, they were deaf, dumb, and blind to their betters conversations. That's right. Rush off. Don't even offer me tea. No manners at all this generation, Aunt Agatha declared. Cal, stupefied by the statement, opened his mouth, closed it, bowed over her hand, and made his escape. Cal made straight for Whitehall, but when he got to Gil Radcliffe's office, he found it empty. Mr. Radcliffe, he was informed, had just this minute left for Whitechapel. Cal headed immediately for Whitechapel. 
He arrived at the same time as Radcliffe. He glanced at his surroundings, but could see nothing much different from the previous night. What's going on? There's no point in maintaining this vigil, Radcliffe told him. Gimble obviously knows we're here. We'll have to flush him out by other means. How? I'm going to take the women and children into custody. I'll put the word out that they will only be released if Joe Gimble comes forward. Cal frowned. That didn't seem right to him at all. You'd lock up innocent women and children, but they've done nothing to deserve that. Radcliffe shrugged. You don't know what they know, whether they were in on the Scorpion's activities or not. But it doesn't matter. Seems to me everything Gimble and his brother have done has been to get the women and children to a better place, to give them a better life. If I've read him aright, he won't abandon them now. What if he does? How long will you keep them imprisoned? Radcliffe gave him a hard look. For as long as it takes. He beckoned to one of his men who came over. Radcliffe issued a series of terse instructions. The man nodded and signaled to the rest of the men to come out of concealment. A short briefing, and then they approached the house in a tight semicircle, some with pistols at the ready. They banged on the front door, shouting, Open up in the name of His Majesty! People stopped to watch, speculating as to what was going on. Do they have to brandish those damned pistols? Cal asked. They're women and children, for God's sake. You'll terrify them. I want them terrified and for people to see it, Radcliffe responded coolly. Gimble needs to know we're serious. He glanced at Cal. They won't be hurt if that's what you're worrying about. This is theatre, not war. The more people see this, the more pressure Gimble will be under to rescue them. Theatre or not, Cal didn't like the use of women and children. But that was why Radcliffe had the job he had. He had to be ruthless. He operated on the demands of the larger picture, where individuals didn't matter, as long as the greater good was achieved. Cal, after half a lifetime at war, had decided that individuals mattered. It was why he'd never make a general. He watched as the women were led from the house, red-faced and weeping. One of the women was visibly pregnant. Three children followed, a young boy of about eight or nine leading them. He was thin as a lathe, with short, ragged hair from which his ears stuck out woefully. He held the hand of a little boy about four years old and carried a toddler, a little girl. The two small ones were sobbing, but the boy was silent and grim-faced. His eyes burned dark and intense, stark against his pale young face. Cal ached for the lad. Radcliffe's men led them into a waiting, high-barred cart. Ignoring the shouts from the gathering crowd, they loaded the women and children into it. The boy, handing his siblings up himself, refusing the aid of the soldiers. It looks like a damned tumbrel, Cal muttered. The women clutched at the bars. The little ones cried out piteously. The crowd was turning ugly and started pushing at the barrier of Radcliffe's men. Theater, Radcliffe reminded him. If they look as though they're going to their execution, all the better. His head man glanced at Radcliffe, who gave a crisp nod. The cart rumbled off. The women wailed, the children screamed, the crowd shouted. Cal turned away from the sight in disgust. It was not at all how he had envisaged the conclusion of his hunt for the assassin. As he turned, he met the accusing gaze of the drunk former sharpshooter across the other side of the road. A night in the cold rain seemed to have sobered him up a little. He gave Cal a filthy look, then spat in his direction. Then he lifted his gin bottle, drank deeply, and staggered away. Cal felt like doing the same.
Chapter 18 A woman would run through fire and water for such a kind heart. William Shakespeare, The Merry Wives of Windsor M and the girls arrived home around noon. They'd spent a delightful few hours exploring the London shops and had decided to go back to Ashenden House, have a quick luncheon, and then visit the Tower of London. It was their first time in the great city. Even M had never been there before, and they were determined to see all the famous sights. The tower was first on the list. Rose wanted to see the grim place where so many famous people had met their doom. She liked grisly stories, while Lily and M were keen to see the crown jewels. George, once she had heard about the royal menagerie, was eager to see the exotic animals. You have a visitor, my lady, the butler, Burton murmured as he opened the door for them. Really? Who is it? Em couldn't imagine who it could be. She didn't think she knew anyone in London, and, more to the point, nobody knew she was here. Lady Salter, Lord Ashenden's aunt, she's waiting in the green sitting room. Oh, what a lovely surprise. M handed him her hat and glanced in the mirror to tidy her hair and check that she was presentable. I gather you've never met Lady Salter, my lady, Burton murmured. No, not yet. M turned to the girls. Rose, Lily, your Aunt Agatha has come to call. Isn't that delightful? George, come and meet your first London relative. She led them to the green sitting room. An elegant elderly lady looked up as they entered. She had been perusing a magazine. She set it aside, raised her lorgnette, and directed it at M. She said not a word. M came forward, saying warmly, Lady Salter, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I didn't know you intended to call. I am Emmeline, Lady Ashenden. The title still felt odd on her lips. Lady Salter made no attempt to rise. She glanced at M and pursed her thin lips. So I gather. She looked at the girls clustered reluctantly in the doorway. Well, come in, girls. Don't stand there loitering. Let me look at you. The girls shuffled forward. The old lady scrutinized them carefully through her lorgnette. Don't any of you girls know to curtsy when greeting your elders and betters? She watched critically as they hastily curtsied and snorted when they were finished. You, girl at the end, where did you learn to curtsy? You're about as graceful as a bear. George lifted her chin. Thank you, she said. I like bears. The old lady stiffened. Cheek, I suppose you're Henry's bastard. George clenched her fists. M placed a soothing hand on George's shoulder and said, This is Lady Georgiana Rutherford, your nephew Henry's perfectly legitimate daughter, tragically lost to the family for some years. But we're thrilled to have her here, where she belongs with us, aren't we, girls? Lady Salter's lip curled. Speaking for my family, are you, Gell? And you a bride of how many days? Almost a week, said M composedly. She had this old woman's measure now, but was determined not to come to cuffs at their first meeting. Why are you and the girls not in mourning? Henry's not been dead much more than a month. My father's will forbade it, George told her. Pfft, Henry, forbidding the wearing of mourning, I don't believe it. That boy never gave a moment's thought to anyone else in his life. Be that as it may, my husband, as head of the family, has ordered that his brother's wishes be respected, M said. There was a long silence, then Lady Salter said, Well, 
If that's true, it's the first sensible thing that boy's done since his return to England. She jabbed her lorgnette in the direction of the girls. From what I've heard, those girls need to be married off as quickly as possible. No, M said pleasantly. The old lady's eyes sparked flint. What do you mean, no? There's no rush. The girls will take as long as they wish. I won't allow anyone to put pressure on them concerning marriage. You won't allow? That's correct, I won't. M gave her a steely smile to underline her message. Now, may I offer you some refreshment, Lady Salter? Tea? Something to eat? The girls and I were planning to have luncheon shortly. We'd love you to join us. Lady Salter sniffed and glanced at the girls. She pointed her lorgnette at Lily. That one could do without her luncheon. Put her on a reducing diet. Potatoes boiled in vinegar was what did it for Byron. Give her nothing but potatoes in vinegar for a month. Then she might look... M put her arm around Lily. Nonsense, she said briskly. Lily is a beautiful girl and we love her just exactly the way she is. I would no more think of putting her on a reducing diet than, she smiled sweetly, trying to fatten you up after your long illness. What illness? I've never been ill a day in my life. Oh, said M with false sympathy. I thought you must have been ill. So many recovering invalids are excessively thin and crabby and bad-tempered. I'm so glad it's not illness that has caused it. The old lady's flinty grey eyes narrowed. Her thin bosom swelled and M decided to get the girls out of the way before the explosion came. As it was, both Rose and George looked to be on the verge of saying something rude to their aunt and Lily was on the verge of tears, real ones. Girls, run along now and get changed for our outing this afternoon. Rose, will you ask Cook to hold luncheon for another half hour? George, that dog of yours will be needing a quick walk, don't you think? Lily, dear? She groped for something to ask the girl to do that would make her feel good about herself. Would you run up to my room and select a scarf for me to wear this afternoon? The wind is getting brisker and you have such exquisite taste. I can rely on you to choose the perfect one. Say goodbye to Lady Salter. She's not staying for luncheon. The girls dropped a hasty curtsy and fled. M resumed her seat and smiled at Lady Salter. They're lovely girls, aren't they? The old lady sniffed. Rose is a beauty. She'll do well enough. Lily needs to reduce no matter what you say. And as for the other one? She rolled her eyes. No breeding at all. What was Henry thinking? George is an original. I think she'll take the ton by storm. You do? Do you? Lady Salter said acidly. Know a lot about the ton, do you? Whom precisely do you know in London? Since I have no idea who is in London at present, I cannot say. Who are your people? M gestured to the house around her. They are here. I meant your family. They are here. Lady Salter's lips thinned. Don't be obtuse, girl. I meant your father and mother. My father was Sir Humphrey Westwood. My mother was Alice Carsgood. The old lady leaned forward. Of the Hampshire Carsgoods? She was, in fact, but M couldn't resist saying, Of the nowhere in particular Carsgoods, it was a love match, you see. Lady Salter snorted. Love? Tawdry middle-class sentiment. But so romantic, M produced a gusty, sentimental sigh and fluttered her eyelashes. Pshaw! Blood is what counts in marriage, blood breeding and land. 
Really? How interesting. It's important when breeding pigs, too, M said brightly. She rose from her seat. Are you sure you can't stay for luncheon, Lady Salter? The old lady glowered at her, and for a moment, M could see the resemblance both to Cal and to George. Send for my carriage, Gail. M inclined her head. With the greatest of pleasure. Cal, feeling soured and depressed by the morning's events, needed a distraction, and as he wandered past Covent Garden, he decided an evening at the theatre was just the thing. Among the various entertainments listed on the playbill was As You Like It, which he felt would please Emmeline, who, as a former teacher on her first visit to a London theatre, might want something Shakespearean. But since it was also comedy, it should suit him and the girls. He sent a message to Ashenden House to let them know he'd be home for an early dinner before escorting them to the theatre. He then decided to visit Tattersall's and came away quite pleased with himself. He'd conducted several very satisfactory transactions and had also run into two old friends who, learning he was here with his new bride, invited him and Emmeline to a party and a musical evening in the following week. The commencement of the season was still several months away, but a few small parties would ease his wife into the London social scene gradually, and by the time the season started, she had been much better prepared to make her way in London society. I met your aunt today, M said over dinner. Lady Salter. Cal almost choked on his soup. Damn, I mean blast. I meant to warn you. Her brows rose. Did you know she would visit then? No, but she was waiting when I came downstairs this morning. According to Burton, she's been coming every day around eleven. She nodded. To check up on the domestic arrangements before we arrived, yes? Burton told me after she left. It was very kind of her. Kind? Cal gave her a cautious look. You liked her then? Oh, yes. I'm sure we're going to become fast friends. George, dear, could I trouble you for the salt, please? Fast friends? Cal repeated, stunned. Aunt Agatha's few friends were a small collection of well-born but downtrodden ladies whom she ruled with a rod of iron. Unfortunately, some of those ladies were very influential in society. Yes, indeed, his wife said enthusiastically. We had a thoroughly delightful exchange. I enjoyed myself immensely. Cal could hardly believe his ears. You're sure it was Aunt Agatha you met, not some other lady? Skinny, elegant, dressed in black and white, tongue like an asp? That's her. She was utterly charming. We simply adored her, didn't we, girls? It was at that point that Cal realized his sisters and Georgiana were smothering giggles and that his wife was teasing him. Ah, I see. Well, sorry I didn't warn you beforehand. Emmeline laughed. I quite enjoyed myself, as a matter of fact. You should have been there, Cal, Rose interjected. M gave Aunt Agatha as good as she got, but so perfectly politely, there was no way the old horror could take offence. I mean, she knew M was saying cutting things back, but they were on the surface of things polite, so she had nothing to get hold of. It was brilliant, M. You shouldn't call your aunt an old horror, M said. Whatever you think of her, outwardly at least, we will all show her the utmost respect. She is an old horror, Cal said. M shrugged. You can't choose your relatives. She's also my godmother, Cal said. And mine, Lily said gloomily. I've always hoped she'd turn out to be some kind of fairy godmother, 
but all she could say to me was that I was fat and should be forced to eat nothing but potatoes boiled in vinegar. What? Cal exclaimed. That's disgusting and wrong. You are not in the least. Oh, don't worry, M had the perfect response, Rose said warmly. Yes, thank you, M, Lily said. I was ready to sink until you spoke up. Don't you dare let her get the better of you, Lily, Georgiana said fiercely. She's not a fairy godmother, she's a feral one. There was a short silence, then they all burst out laughing. Stop maligning your relatives and eat up, you disrespectful females, Cal said a few minutes later. We don't want to be late for the theatre. Who knew that Aunt Agatha would turn out to be the very thing he needed? It should have occurred to him sooner. In the face of a common enemy, a disparate group would usually unite. Good old Aunt Agatha. Has something happened to disturb you? Emmeline asked Cal that night as they were undressing for bed. You've been very quiet all evening. What do you mean? He'd done his best to be cheerful and entertaining. He'd thought he'd done quite a good job. We've had a lovely night. I think you can tell from the conversation in the carriage coming home from the theatre how very much the girls and I enjoyed ourselves. It was so thoughtful and kind of you to take us. But you haven't said a word to me about how it went with your assassin this morning. Oh, that. He shook his head. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want the ugliness of the morning spilling over into his marriage. It doesn't matter. Come to bed. He made love to her then, using all the skills at his disposal, seeking forgetfulness, oblivion, finding comfort in the warmth of her acceptance, in the sweet response of her body. But after they'd climaxed and lay spent, exhausted and satisfied, sleep didn't come. Not to Cal, and not to Emmeline. He could tell by her breathing. She lay wrapped around him, their legs intertwined, her cheek resting on his chest, her palm pressed against his heart, one finger caressing him softly. They often fell asleep in that position, but not tonight. In the hearth, the coals glowed and hissed, sending out a soft, dim light. The silence stretched between them. She murmured. It sometimes helps to talk, you know, and I really would like to know what happened. You don't. She raised her head and looked at him, her eyes dark and troubled. Was it really so bad? He sighed. No, I suppose not. It's just... He didn't know why he felt so. He didn't even have a word for how he felt. He supposed it wouldn't hurt to tell her. Nobody was injured after all. Nobody killed. So he told her about the decision to imprison the women and children as hostages for the assassin. Told her about the tumbril cart and the weeping women and children, and about the young boy carrying a burden too great for his scrawny young shoulders, stiff with pride and shame. But they will be released, won't they? They won't be hurt. No, they won't be hurt. Not physically. He tried to think of words to explain how he felt. The trouble was he didn't know how he felt. He was a turmoil of contradictory thoughts and feelings. Their father did murder your friend and many others. I know, and I despise him for it. But it's not as simple as it seemed before. When I was hunting him, it was just him and me, clear-cut, straightforward. As it had been during the war, you didn't think about it. There was the enemy shooting at you, so you shot back. Now. It was different now, but he couldn't explain how. Cal lay quiet for a while, trying to gather his thoughts. The fire was dying. 
He got out of bed and added coal, poking savagely at the embers until he had a bright blaze going. He slid back into bed, gathered her against him and tried to give words to the jumble of feelings inside him. A man's wife and children should not be punished for what he has done. It's bad enough during a war, when innocents get caught up, their homes looted and destroyed, their crops ruined, robbed of their livestock, their women despoiled and their children. He broke off as images came to mind that he'd tried for years to forget. He closed his eyes, breathing deeply. She hugged him, stroking his skin, pressing herself against him, not seeking anything, not trying to comfort him with empty clichés, not saying anything. She simply listened. The soft warmth of her body, the grave, sympathetic attention she gave to his words was more comforting than any words could be. Savagery and destruction and the ruination of the lives of innocents were inevitable in wartime. It had sickened him at the time, but he had become resigned to its inevitability. But the war was long over. This was England in peacetime. Theatre, not war. But it wasn't theatre today for those women and their children, he said. They were terrified, distressed, taken away like criminals with the whole world watching. The memory of that, the shame of it, will stay with them the rest of their lives. Perhaps not the little ones, but the women and that boy. He would never forget the burning shame in that boy's eyes and the youthful dignity with which he bore it. He remembered thinking when he'd first returned to England how green and pleasant and peaceful his country was. But it wasn't the England he thought it was. Not any more. Not since he'd embarked on the search for the assassin. He'd seen a different side of his country then. Oh, there was wealth and abundance and beauty, for some, vast estates and glittering mansions. But behind all that, beneath the prosperity and the glamour, there was poverty and desperation and despair. Cal, she said softly. He looked down at her. Don't blame yourself. You did what you could. It's not your fault and now it's time to sleep. She drew him down and kissed him. They made love again, slowly, tenderly, without words. It was a kind of healing. Emmeline fell asleep almost at once. Cal lay spooned around her, breathing in the scent of her skin and hair, and thought about their conversation. He had told her more about his life and shared more of his private thoughts with her than he had with anyone else in his life, and he had only known her a few weeks. He had never talked about this kind of thing with any of his male friends. Men turned such concerns into a joke or didn't mention them at all, shoved the doubts and fears and questions and feelings down deep as far as they could go, pretending they didn't exist or didn't matter. Women were different. No, that wasn't right. He'd never talked to any other woman like this. Maybe it was wives who were different. That wasn't right either. He thought of the females who'd pursued him since he arrived in England. He couldn't imagine talking like this, sharing such thoughts with any of them. It was Emmeline who was different. He pulled her closer, closed his eyes, and slept. I thought you said you'd hired a few hacks for us to go riding this morning, Rose said, staring as a couple of grooms led five horses up to the front door of Ashenden House. They don't look like hacks to me. And look, that's my sultan, and Jem's with him, George exclaimed and ran down to greet them. Cal shrugged, trying to hide a grin. Well, we couldn't borrow Sir Alfred's horses from this distance, and I couldn't let Georgiana outshine us, could I? Rose turned to him breathlessly. 
Do you mean to say these horses are for us? He nodded. The grey one is for Emmeline, and you and Lily can decide between you which of the other two you want. The two girls immediately began to confer in low voices. Em looked down the road at the approaching horses and gasped. The grey? You mean that beautiful Arab mare is for me? Cal, but when? Yesterday. I called in at Tattersall's after I bought the theatre tickets, saw the mare, took one look at her and thought, well, that you would need a horse, and the girls too, of course, he added hastily, but they weren't listening. M struggled for words. He'd seen this beautiful creature and thought of her. Do you like her? She's spirited, but I tried her out, and her paces are lovely. She's fast, too. She might give Sultan a run for his money. At a signal from her husband, the groom leading her brought her up at a trot, and oh, the high-stepping elegance of her gait. M was breathless with admiration and emotion. She's graceful as well as beautiful. She moves like she's floating. The mare was silvery white, with soft clouds of light grey dappling, large dark expressive eyes, and a silky dark mane and tail, held high and carried proudly like a banner. I never did give you a wedding present, he said gruffly. Go on and see how you like her. Come with me, M grabbed his hand, and they hurried down to meet her new mare. She was exquisite, dainty, aristocratic, and strong. M had a quartered apple in her pocket. She proffered a piece on her palm. Her mare tossed her head and eyed M and the apple coquettishly from liquid, dark, long-lashed eyes, then stretched out her neck and sniffed, her velvety black lips woofling delicately against M's skin. She downed it in two crunches, then came back for more, nudging M's arm suggestively. M laughed with delight. Well, will she do? Will she do? She's a darling. M threw her arms around her husband and kissed him warmly. Thank you, Cal. I've never had such a wonderful present in all my life. He looked a little self-conscious. The whole street could see her kissing him, and it was not done to do such things in public. But M didn't care. She was torn between being thrilled and being moved, and kissing him was better than bursting into tears in public. She was so touched that he'd done such a generous and thoughtful thing for her and the girls, especially after his miserable, shameful morning. Rose had chosen the black gelding, and Lily chose the pretty bay mare. Come on, girls, M said gaily. Let's try out their paces. Cal, your services, please. She put out her booted foot. He cupped his hands and tossed her into the saddle, and they rode off in a cavalcade with Kirk, the new Scottish groom her husband had hired for the girls, coming up in the rear. M did her best to appear carefree, but this, coming after the thoughts and feelings he had shared with her last night. On the outside he was a hard, stern soldier, but beneath that disguise, and she was starting to think it was indeed a disguise. He was a sensitive, thoughtful, and deeply honourable man. He'd ached for that family, the family of his enemy, and for that little boy. And then, having no power to change their situation, he'd turned his mind to how he could make his own little family happy, taking them to the theatre and buying them horses, saying not a word about his own deep unhappiness and frustration. And despite his anger, he'd made love to her, twice, with unbelievable tenderness. They reached the park and the girls raced off joyfully on their new mounts. The silent, dark man who'd made this possible quite forgotten. He kept a protective eye on them, but as soon as he saw Kirk, 
the new groom following them. He turned to see how M was getting along with her beautiful new mare. The quiet concern, the protectiveness in his expression. It was this in him she wasn't proof against. It wasn't the gifts, the quiet kindnesses, or the bone-melting pleasure he gave her in bed. It was nothing she could put a finger on or explain away. But the barriers she had erected around her closely barred heart were slowly unraveling. Chapter 19 To look almost pretty is an acquisition of higher delight to a girl who has been looking plain for the first fifteen years of her life than a beauty from her cradle can ever receive. Jane Austen, Northanger Abbey Lady Salter was waiting for them when M and the girls returned home. Like a crocodile at the river, George muttered. Be nice, George, M said, her look taking in all the girls. She supposed such a glorious morning had to be paid for in some fashion. Cal had gone with the grooms to check on the horse's accommodation. The stables, except for Hawkins the coachman and Jem the stable boy from George's old home, were also newly staffed, and he wanted to ensure all was to his liking there. He'd be back shortly, expecting breakfast and a little more laughter and nonsense. They were becoming a family and this elegant, bone-thin old woman looking down her nose at them was part of it. But M would not allow her to destroy the fragile happiness they'd achieved so far. She mentally girded her loins and entered the sitting room with a warm greeting. Aunt Agatha, how delightful to see you this morning. Have we kept you waiting again? I hope not for long this time. You really must let us know when you plan to visit, so we can be out, muttered Rose sotto voce. You don't mind if I call you Aunt Agatha, do you? M hurried on. My husband told me I should, now we are related by marriage. You've been out riding, the old lady said accusingly. She pulled out her lorgnette and raked M and the girls with it. Those habits are atrocious. Yours, Emmeline, is positively shabby, that one. She pointed the lorgnette at Rose. Is dowdy and out of date, that one. She pointed to Lily. Is just as dowdy and too tight. And as for that one, she fixed her beady gaze on George. I cannot believe that habit was made for you at all. It wasn't, George said cheerfully. It used to belong to Lady Chisholm's daughter, but she grew out of it, so Lady Chisholm gave it to me. A Rutherford wearing cast-offs from the village squire? Lady Salter closed her eyes in horror and shuddered delicately. After a moment, she opened her eyes and fixed M with a gimlet gaze. You must never be seen in public in those, those garments again, none of you. You will order new habits at once. We intended to do so this afternoon, now that we have horses of our own. M sent a swift smile to the girls, reminding her of Cal's wonderful surprise. They grinned back. Lady Salter pulled out a visiting card, turned it over, scribbled something on the back of it, and handed it to M. M glanced at it. Madame Veste? My habit maker, she will provide you with all that you need, and everything of the first stare. Thank you, but my patronage in that area will go to George Meredith and son, M said. He made all my habits when I was a girl and my mother's before me. Meredith's might not be of the first stare, but it was an old and highly respected firm, and their habits were beautiful. Loyal, are you? the old lady said mockingly. M gave her a direct look. In all matters. There was a short silence. She sniffed. So you refuse my advice? In this case, yes, but thank you for thinking of us. 
Lady Salter gave her a narrow look. She took the card back, crossed Madame Veste's name off, and wrote something else down. That, she said with awful majesty, is the name of my mantua maker, Hortense, the foremost dressmaker in London. Show her my card when you order your gowns, and she will give you special treatment. Of course, it is ridiculously late to be ordering your gowns for the season and bringing three girls out at once. No one was left in doubt of her disapproval of that scheme. But she will wish to oblige me and will do her best to fit you in. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. M took the card and tucked it in her reticule. And do it soon the old lady ordered. The dresses you and the girls wore the other day were quite provincial. M stiffened. She loved those dresses, the first new fashionable dresses she had had in years, and the girls always looked lovely. She lifted her chin and said proudly, they were made by Madame Floria in Bath. Lady Salter was unimpressed. As I said, provincial. Go to Salon Hortense, give those other dresses to your maid, or burn them. Burn her lovely wedding dress over her dead body. M gritted her teeth and tried to think of something polite to say. Thank you for your advice and your recommendation, Aunt Agatha. The girls and I will certainly consider Salon Hortense. The old lady's fine plucked brows rose. Consider? Her voice was brittle ice. Yes, indeed, we will consider her. The thin breast swelled. You do understand that I am held to be one of the best-dressed ladies in London. I can see that for myself, M said pleasantly. She could see that Lady Salter didn't think much of a compliment from a country nobody with apparently no dress sense. But tastes differ after all, and the girls are young and are bound to have ideas of their own. Young people should have no opinions, Lady Salter declared magisterially. They should be guided by their elders. Do you think so? I like hearing young people's thoughts and ideas. They're often less rigid and hidebound than their elders, I find. As for finding the girls a suitable dressmaker, what suits an older lady, fashionable as she might be, is not necessarily flattering to a young one. Lady Salter had no difficulty detecting the barb in that one. She glared at M. You should be grateful if Salon Hortense even gives you an appointment. As I said, thank you for the recommendation. We will definitely consider her. For all M knew, Hortense might be the perfect choice for her and the girls. But M was not going to be bullied. All three girls were being launched at the same time. All were rich and titled. They'd make a splash on the London scene if M were any judge. Rose was a beauty. Dressmakers would be falling over themselves to outfit her for the season. George was tall, slender, and very pretty, and would wear any dress with grace, as long as she was prevented from wearing her breeches under it, a habit M had not yet broken her of. Lily was not so simple. She was very pretty, but she needed the kind of dressmaker who would appreciate her curves and make the most of them, not try to drown them in frills and flounces, as she had seen happen to some girls. Dressed properly, Lily could shine, and M was determined to find her a dressmaker who would appreciate her potential and make the most of it. She very much doubted Hortense would be that person. There was a short, tense silence in the sitting room. With gratitude, M heard male voices outside in the hall. Cal must be back. Thank goodness he could deal with his aunt. She had had enough. And the girls were looking restless as the scent of breakfast wafted in. They'd been very good. 
M rose to her feet and said brightly, We were about to go in for breakfast, Aunt Agatha, and, judging by that delicious toast and bacon smell, it must be ready. Would you care to join us? Thank you, no. I have broken my fast already. Probably wasps on toast, George muttered. M pretended not to have heard. Then you will not wish to stay any longer, she rose. Delightful, as always, to see you, Aunt Agatha. Over breakfast, the girls related the conversation to Cal, with much laughter and joking. At least she acknowledged George's legitimacy this time, M said. George laughed. Yes, today I was a Rutherford, though not one who met with her approval. He frowned. What do you mean? She called me Henry's bastard the first time I met her. George reached for another piece of toast and spread it lavishly with marmalade. Cal turned to M. You didn't tell me that. To George, he said, she knew you were entirely legitimate. I informed her weeks ago long before we came to London. George shrugged. I've been called a bastard before. Not in my house, Cal growled, clenching his fist. And never again. M could see from his expression that he was quietly furious. He leaned across the table and took his niece's hand. My late brother did you a grave injustice, Georgiana. The way he treated you and your mother was disgraceful, shameful. You should have been known to us, to the family since your birth, if not before. You should not have had to struggle to support yourself and others. Should not have been so alone. He broke off, his voice a little ragged, and took a mouthful of coffee, recovering his composure, M thought. In short, George, this family owes you a massive apology, and I will do everything in my power to make it up to you. She glanced at George, who was regarding Cal gravely, her grey eyes so like his shining with liquid emotion. Thank you, Cal, she said huskily. M was glad now that she'd mentioned it, glad Cal had taken the opportunity to say what he felt, show what he felt to George. She didn't think he'd truly explained to the girl before. He tended to do things quietly and not draw attention to them. Now, hearing him like this, nobody could doubt his sincerity. It was clear to them all that his fine sense of honour had been flayed by his brother's neglect of his daughter. Once probate is finalised, I've instructed my lawyer to arrange the same settlement for you that my father made for my sisters, a sum of money that will be yours, to be kept in trust until you marry or turn five and twenty. You mean if I don't marry, I will still have money? He nodded. You will never go hungry again. The other two girls looked at George in surprise. Hungry? She saw their shocked expressions and laughed. Don't look so horrified, aunts of mine. It's not as bad as he makes out. I'm pretty good at shooting rabbits and catching fish, so we never did go really hungry. George didn't realize it, but her casual admission had only underlined the desperation of her former situation. I thought you hated hunting, Lily said. I hate hunting for sport. Fifty men and a hundred hounds chasing one little fox. It's beastly. Hunting for food is different. It's natural. Well, you'll never need to do that again. Cal's face was grim. And in the meantime, I'll have a word with Aunt Agatha. She only said it that once, Em reminded him. I don't think she'll do it again. She looked meaningfully at Rose and George. Unless she's provoked, of course. Cal nodded. He addressed himself to the girls, but M knew he was including her as well when he said, I know Aunt Agatha can be outrageous and unbearably rude at times, but I'd be grateful if you at least tried not to antagonize her. She is one of the leaders of the ton, you know, 
and has enormous influence. Like it or not, with all of us knowing hardly anyone in London, we're going to need her help. The girls exchanged glances but said nothing more. After breakfast was over and the girls had gone upstairs to change, Cal said to Em, I'm sorry Aunt Agatha is being so difficult. I'd hoped she would help you launch the girls. For some reason I can't quite understand, she's a very popular member of the Ton. I'll try to be good, Em said, but if she rips into Lily again... She goes on about her being fat, and honestly, Cal, if you had seen the poor girl's face, and she's not fat. I know. Rose has Aunt Agatha's naturally slender build, as does George, but Lily is built like Aunt Dottie and has her affectionate nature as well. He gave her his arm, and they climbed the stairs together. It seems so wrong that your Aunt Agatha married three times, and yet sweet-natured Dottie never married at all. She mused. I know. According to my father, Dottie had a tremendously successful season and had more than a dozen extremely eligible offers. Really? Then why do you think she didn't marry? No idea. I gather she didn't much like London, because my grandfather had to rail and storm to get her to do a second and a third season, which she did and had even more eligible offers. A duke, a marquis, all sorts of quite brilliant matches were offered her. She was quite a beauty, you know. But she turned them all down and couldn't wait to get back to Ashenden. And later she moved to Bath? He nodded and has lived there happily on her own ever since. I know it seems odd, because she's not the least bit shy or antisocial, but then Aunt Dottie has always been an original. They reached the landing and heard a gust of laughter coming from the girls' rooms. Cal said ruefully, I fear Rose might have inherited Aunt Agatha's pithy way with words, too. Em laughed. She's quick-witted and very sharp, I agree, but she's fundamentally a kind girl and, at the moment at least, lacks your aunt's arrogance. Shortly afterward, Cal left for Whitehall to check on developments. Em and the girls went shopping, piling into the carriage with Hawkins driving. Lady Salter's criticism of her clothing notwithstanding, M urgently needed evening dresses for the events to which she and Cal had been invited. They visited Salon Hortense first. No sense being prejudiced against the woman because of her number one client. The salon was austerely elegant, furnished in many shades of grey with gold highlights. There was a deep silver-grey carpet, a large gilt-edged looking-glass some spindly black and gilt chairs, a small black marble-topped table with gilt legs, and not much more. Grey silk and velvet curtains were draped across the back of the room. Several elegant, aristocratic-looking middle-aged ladies loitered, chatting quietly, presumably waiting for someone. They slid M and the girls' curious, sidelong glances, but otherwise pretended not to notice. A thin assistant dressed in black and white approached them. M gave her Lady Salter's card and asked to speak to Hortense. The woman murmured that she would inquire. Ten minutes later, a brisk, bony Frenchwoman dressed all in black appeared from between the draped curtains. She was holding Lady Salter's card. You wish to speak to me, my lady? M introduced herself and indicated the girls, who were gathered at the window looking out into the street. She explained that their aunt, Lady Salter, had recommended they visit Hortense with a view to ordering some gowns for the forthcoming season. Hortense's deeply plucked brows practically disappeared. This season? I don't know such a thing can be done. Hortense, she is the foremost mantua-maker in London, you understand. 
All the ladies come to her because they know she is the best. The order book is full. She glanced at the girls, just as Rose turned around. The dressmaker's eyes widened, her gaze fixed greedily on Rose. Almost full, I meant. On the other hand, Hortense might be able to fit you in. If the young ladies would approach. M gestured them forward. Hortense gushed over Rose's beauty, lavishly praising her bearing, her coloring, her complexion. The narrow black eyes gleamed at the sight of George. Hortense can see the resemblance to Lady Salter in this one, a dark beauty, the perfect foil for your golden beauty. Then she turned to Lily, pursed her lips, then gave a very Gallic shrug. And I'm sure we can do something with this little one. Hortense is up to any challenge. Lily, whose eyes had been shining with excitement, seemed to droop a little. Thank you, madam, M said briskly. We'll let you know. Girls? And she swept them out of the shop, leaving Hortense with her mouth most unfashionably agape. But I thought, Lily began, we should visit a number of dressmakers, don't you agree? M said and then choose the one we like best. Rose slipped her arm through M's and squeezed. I didn't like skinny old old tents at all. Besides, I cannot bear people who refer to themselves in the third person. Lily's brow furrowed worriedly. But do we know any other dressmakers in London? M stared at her blankly a moment. Not a single one. Then she recalled the box her beautiful wedding nightgown had come in. The House of Chance. Rose looked as though she didn't quite believe her. The House of Chance? Yes, M said triumphantly. Do you and Lily remember Sally Destry from school? Rose laughed. How could we forget? She became one of Miss Mallard's famous Five countesses, not counting you, of course, Em. I remember Sally, Lily said. She was nice. She certainly was, Em said. And Sally, who is now the Countess of Malden, patronizes the House of Chance. And that's good enough for me. She always had excellent taste, and I have no doubt she's become quite dashing and fashionable. They climbed into the carriage. The House of Chance, Hawkins, please, M said. It's off Piccadilly, I think, she hoped. What famous five countesses, George asked, and Lily and Rose explained. M was amused to hear that they also finished with, and a partridge in a pear tree. M leaned back against the leather upholstery and prayed that the House of Chance wasn't one of those places that specialized in naughty nightwear. In a few short minutes, the carriage pulled up in front of an elegant shop with a large picture window. It looked very discreet, with green velvet curtains draped behind the window, a simple white and gold painted daisy on the glass, and Chance, lettered in elegant gold script. Taking a deep breath, M pushed open the door. Inside it was light and airy, with creamy walls and a soft green carpet. There were several large gold-edged looking glasses, and though it wasn't dissimilar to Salon Hortense, it felt much less oppressive. A young woman came out to greet them. M explained that she had come on the recommendation of the Countess of Malden and wondered whether the House of Chance made evening gowns. The woman assured her they made day dresses, ball gowns, night gowns, and everything in between, except for gowns for a young lady's royal presentation. You'll want to talk to Miss Chance. She does all the designing. I'll fetch her. Would you like some tea? Relieved, M agreed that tea would be most welcome, and she and the girls sat down to wait. 
In two minutes, a small, smartly dressed young woman limped out. Lady Malden sent you, did she? That's good of her. How do you do? I'm Daisy Chance, the proprietor. Welcome to my shop. Polly will be back in a minute with some tea, so ladies, how can I help you? To M's surprise, the woman had more than a hint of a Cockney accent. M decided she liked it. It was a refreshing change from all those false French ones. She explained what they wanted. Miss Chance looked at each of the girls in turn. She gave Rose a long, thoughtful look. You're a few years older than the usual, young miss. I reckon something a little different for you. What's your style, Lady Rose? Sweetly pretty or bold? Bold. All four of them answered at once, and Miss Chance laughed. The young woman had returned with a tea tray, and Miss Chance said, Polly, love, fetch out the night sky fabric and the ice blue, and the lavender. This young lady wants to stand out from the crowd a little. Polly hurried off, and Miss Chance pulled out a pad and made a few sketches. M, a little surprised but rather charmed by the odd little woman's warmth and brisk informality, poured the tea. Polly came back with an armful of fabrics and a couple of half-finished dresses. The girls gathered around and examined the fabrics and dresses excitedly. Rose was unable to hide her pleasure. That one she calls night sky is gorgeous, M, she whispered. It was a soft, dark azure blue gauze, with tiny sprinkles of glitter dotted through it. Rose draped it against herself. What do you think? It was perfect. The same thing happened with George. Miss Chance seemed to know instinctively the kind of thing that George would like and seemed quite understanding of George's awkwardness. It was the first time she'd ever shopped for dresses, but at least she wasn't sullen and uncooperative about it. The presence and excitement of her youthful aunts had made a difference to her attitude, like Hortense, Miss Chance thought George and Rose would contrast and complement each other beautifully, but M was most impressed that she didn't turn a hair when George announced she preferred breeches. She told George not to worry. She'd make her some nice long drawers that would feel just as comfortable as breeches but wouldn't spoil the line of her dresses. Now came the real test. Lily. M could feel them all tense up as the woman turned to Lily and examined her the way she had done Rose and George. Oh, I'm going to have fun with you, Lady Lily, she said with a grin. You're just luscious, you are, like a ripe peach. Oh, the men are going to be panting after you when I've finished with you. I hope that's what you want. Lily blushed rosily and nodded. Yes, please. What sort of thing do you plan for her? M asked, pleased with the woman's kind words, but not yet convinced it wasn't empty flattery. As I said, Lady Lily has the sort of luscious figure that a lot of men go wild for, Miss Chance said. All those curves. I'm going to frame them. Not show them off vulgarly, but hint at what's there. Polly? She called. Bring out the dress we're making for Mrs. Huntley Briggs. She made a quick sketch on her pad. Yours wouldn't be exactly like this one, but it'll give you an idea. In a few lines, she sketched a lavishly curved woman. Polly brought her out the dress, and M could immediately see that it was the sort of thing that would suit Lily perfectly. She looked at Lily. Her eyes were shining. Well, girls, M said, what do you think? Shall we order some dresses from Miss Chance? They nodded eagerly, and Miss Chance sent them behind the green curtains with Polly to have their measurements taken. Now you, Lady Ashenden, would you be wanting anything? They discussed M's needs, and Miss Chance said it would be tight, but she could get an evening dress to M in the next two days, and another two days later. But there won't be time for fittings, mind, with such a rush job. Aren't you all booked up for the season? 
M asked, suddenly worried, that Miss Chance's easy acceptance of new customers might indicate a lack of business. Lord, yes, the orders are piling up, but we can cope. I got a waiting list of skilled seamstresses wanting to work for me. When fresh orders come in and my regular girls can't manage, I hire more. She grinned wryly. I'm the slow cog in this machine, keeping up with the designing, but I love it, and I'm going to enjoy dressing your girls. Something special they are, all three of them. Now. She became businesslike again. Let's talk about these two dresses for you, Lady Ashenden. I'm thinking green gauze over silver tissue. Does that sound like something you'd like? It was, and when they finally left the House of Chance, their order had grown enormously. The girls were thrilled with everything they'd seen, even George. They all liked Daisy Chance, who, they discovered, was actually married with the sweetest little girl who was in the back room with her nursemaid. And when Miss Chance was measuring M up, she had told her how much she loved the wedding nightgown that Lady Malden had sent her. Oh, that was you, in Bath, wasn't it? The little woman grinned. She said she wanted something special for a favourite teacher who was getting married. Glad you liked it. Now, with the carriage headed home, M sat back, a little dazed at all they'd ordered from Miss Chance. She hoped she hadn't made a terrible mistake. Chapter 20 They come together, like the coroner's inquest, to sit upon the murdered reputations of the weak. William Congreve, The Way of the World There was no news at Whitehall. Joe Gimble had made no attempt to communicate with anyone, made no attempt to come forward. A discreet round-the-clock watch was being conducted at the aunt's house. He hadn't been sighted there either. The women and children were still in custody. Frustrated, Cal found himself an hour later staring across the road at the house in Whitechapel where Joe Gimble's aunt by marriage lived. He waited for an hour, saw nothing suspicious, saw the drunken former sharpshooter whose bottle of gin was now gone, Again the man saw him and spat. He was a pathetic sight. Cal turned away. He didn't know why he'd gone to Whitechapel in the first place. There was obviously nothing he could do. He couldn't exactly magic Joe Gimble out of thin air. In any case, according to Gil Radcliffe, Joe Gimble and the Scorpion were no longer Cal's business. He was wasting his time to no purpose. Cal decided to visit Aunt Agatha and beard the dragon in her den. Until they'd arrived in London, Cal hadn't realised Emmeline had never even visited the capital. She would need help launching the girls. You bring me a badly dressed nobody of no particular beauty and no wealth, a girl who has no aristocratic connections, no connections at all as far as I can see, and you expect me to launch her and your two pert half-sisters as well as Henry's impossible tomboy all in this coming season? No, I expect you to help M launch the girls. You are their aunt, after all. I hope you will also help my wife find her way in the ton. You know you could if you tried. There's no one better connected or more fashionable. He finished, laying it on with a trowel. She considered his words pouting a little. The girls are one thing. Of course, I will do all I can to assist Rutherford's born. That goes without saying. But this woman you have married. Lady Ashenden, he interrupted in a hard voice. He was pleased to hear her refer to George as a Rutherford born but he had had enough of her complaints against Emmeline. His aunt gave him a baleful look. I will admit, she has a certain raw potential for elegance, if she would take advice from one who knows, but she won't. She's stubborn, willful, and headstrong. Tautology. She held up her lorgnette and withered him through it. 
I beg your pardon? Apology accepted, Aunt Agatha, he said smoothly, ignoring her swelling indignation. A tautology is when all the words mean the same thing. Stubborn, willful, headstrong, two of those words are redundant. There's no need to list all of them. You, Sirrah, are being frivolous. Aunt Agatha, there is no use continuing to rail at me for my choice of wife. What's done is done, and I am well content. She sniffed. He decided to try a different approach. Are you saying it is beyond you to assist her in launching the girls? There was a short, pithy silence. I'm sorry. It was thoughtless of me. I'd forgotten how much you'd aged since I left England. Things must be getting more difficult for you, and... She cut him off. Nothing is beyond me, she said with lofty hauteur. Excellent. Then I'll leave you to get on with it. Thank you, Aunt Agatha. He kissed her hand and made a hasty exit. To M's great relief, the dress arrived from the House of Chance in plenty of time and proved her fears to be groundless. It was stunning, and it fitted perfectly. In the two days previous, she and the girls had embarked on an orgy of shopping, gloves, Scarves, shawls, shoes, boots, dancing slippers, habits, hats, the list was endless. And the season hadn't even begun. But tonight was to be M's first appearance in London society, and she was understandably a little nervous. She stood in front of the long cheval looking glass and gazed at her reflection. Oh, my milady! You look lovely, Millie murmured behind her. I never seen such a beautiful gown. M hadn't either. She had certainly never worn one. The gown was made of silver tissue that shimmered through the green gauze overdress like a wintry lake gleaming through the mist. The neckline was scooped low but was modest enough not to make her feel uncomfortable. She felt beautiful elegant and yet deeply feminine. She pirouetted slowly in front of the mirror. Millie had dressed her hair, piling it high at the crown and letting soft ringlets fall at the sides. A whistle at the door made her jump. Her husband stood there, immaculate and dazzlingly handsome in formal dress. His eyes devoured her. Lady Ashenden, you are a sight to behold. That dress. He whistled again. M smoothed the fabric with nervous hands. Will it do, do you think? More than do. It's going to make me the envy of every man there. Then he frowned and stroked his chin thoughtfully. There's just one thing missing. What? She whirled around and examined her reflection in the looking glass. I can't see anything, miss. Oh, she broke off as from behind he slipped a delicate gold chain around her neck. A dainty pendant hung just above the shadow between her breasts. It glittered, one large emerald surrounded by a host of tiny diamonds. Oh, Cal, it's beautiful. This? He was trying to sound offhand but she knew he was pleased with her reaction. This is just a small thing, a part of the Ashenden Emerald Ensemble. It's part of the entail and is handed down from countess to countess. He placed a heavy box on her dressing table. The full set is in there, for grand occasions. A proper necklace, several pairs of earrings and a bracelet, also a tiara, but you won't want that for an affair like this. This is a small party, so you just want something pretty and tasteful. But you might want to wear some earrings. She selected a pair of emerald teardrop earrings and fastened them in her ears. Emeralds. She had never worn anything so grand in her life. Pearls were all she had owned before, and she had left hers behind when she had left home. 
Her husband's eyes met hers in the mirror. Would a kiss be permitted, Lady Ashenden, or is it hands off until tonight? The slate grey eyes burned with promise. She stood on tiptoe and kissed him. Later, she whispered. It was all going beautifully, M thought. If this was a small informal party, there was quite a crowd and even a musical ensemble, she would hate to imagine what a big formal one was. She had been introduced to a host of people, all of whom had been very kind. There had been dancing, which she hadn't expected. Her hostess, Lady Peplow, explained that the young people had begged for it, and confided that she thought it a good idea for girls about to make their come-out to acquire a little town bronze before the season started by attending informal parties like this. And where are your young ladies, Lady Ashenden? I understood you were launching three this season. Three? You have my sympathy. I've fired off two girls, both now married, I'm glad to say. And the third and last Penelope there, she indicated a robust-looking red-headed girl dancing with a laughing young dandy, will make her come out this spring, after which I will no doubt hie me to my chaise long and go into a decline. M laughed. I didn't realize the girls had been invited. She glanced around the room. It's a lovely party. I'm sure they would have loved to come. Men, Lady Peplow shook her head. I told my husband I should have followed up his casual invitation with a proper written one, but he assured me it was all in hand and that I fussed too much. What a pity. I thought your three might like to team up with my lone chick. It's more fun for girls if they have friends. M knew very well that Lady Peplow's lone chick had no need to have friends found for her. She obviously knew most of the young people at the party. Her hostess's kind consideration was for M's girls, who knew practically no one. She thanked her warmly, and they made plans to meet for tea the following afternoon. M lowered her voice. Lady Peplow, who is that lady in the yellow gown? The tall one with the dashing turban? M had caught the young woman staring at her a number of times. But, as far as she knew, she had never seen her before in her life. Lady Peplow squinted across the room. Oh, that's the Carmichael girl, married that fellow Jeremy Oates last season. Do you know her? Would you like an introduction? M shook her head. No, thank you. I was just curious. The name rang no bells at all. It was very odd. Just then, a gentleman came to ask M for the next dance, and for the next half hour, she was well occupied. After the dance finished, M thanked her partner, and feeling rather warm, wandered out onto the balcony. There were plenty of people there, so she felt quite comfortable. You're Emmeline Westwood, aren't you? She turned. It was the woman in yellow. I was. But I'm married now, and I'm Lady Ashenden. Yes, I'd heard that. The woman tilted her head, watching M with an odd little smile. Incredible. Have we met before? M asked, puzzled by the woman's behavior. She shook her head with a little laugh. Oh, no, but you were pointed out to me once when I was a girl and visiting my cousin. What is your cousin's name? She's married now, you wouldn't recognize it. Her smile was sly as she added, but she used to live in Bucklebury. Bucklebury? A sour taste flooded M's mouth. My cousin knew all the best gossip. Some quite shocking scandals happened in the sleepy little village of Bucklebury. You'd be amazed. 
Her smile was now openly malicious. Or perhaps you wouldn't. So nice to chat, Lady Ashenden. M didn't say a word. From being overly warm a few minutes before, she was suddenly chilled to the bone. Bucklebury was her home village. She breathed in the chill night air, taking deep, slow breaths until she regained a semblance of composure, then returned to the party. She felt it the minute she stepped back into the light, the attention of a small knot of young women, heads together whispering. They turned to look at M, their expressions avid, almost gleeful. Then they returned to their whispering. It was starting again. Are you feeling unwell? Cal asked when he saw her. You're very pale. Do you want to leave? M nodded. She was feeling sick, but not the way he thought. Gossip had ruined her life once, and now it was back. She had thought she had been able to put it behind her, move on. She had been wrong. She was going to have to tell him, tonight, before someone else did. Take me home, please, Cal. In minutes, they'd made their farewells to their host and hostess and were in the carriage heading home. Cal looked worried, his eyes dark and full of questions, but M didn't want to talk, not here, not in the carriage. She closed her eyes and leaned against him, finding refuge in his strength and warmth and the dear, familiar smell of him. She loved him. She had resisted it from the first, but hadn't been able to help herself. She had fallen head over heels, and it was as unlike her first experience of love as anything could be. She knew now the difference between infatuation and love. But of course, she couldn't tell him. They'd made a marriage of convenience. He had made it perfectly clear what his expectations were, and they didn't include love. So it was not for her to burden or embarrass him with unwanted emotion. Besides, if she told him now, and then he heard what people were saying, he'd probably think she was saying it out of desperation, that she was lying to save herself. They arrived home, and he walked her up the stairs. Is there anything I can do? I don't like to see you so pale. Shall I fetch your maid? No, just give me a few minutes and then come in. We need to talk. Talk? She felt another pang of guilt, remembering the unspoken promise of lovemaking after the party. Lovemaking was the last thing on her mind. I'll just take this coat off. He left her in her bedroom and went through to the dressing room. M stripped off her jewellery and the lovely dress, pulled out her hairpins and pulled a brush quickly through her hair, then slipped on her thickest, warmest, most unseductive flannel nightgown, wrapped her lovely cashmere wedding shawl around her, for comfort as much as warmth, climbed onto the bed and waited. So, what's this about? he said when he returned wrapped in his favourite dressing gown. I take it you're not actually sick. No, sit down, she indicated the end of the bed. It's going to take a while. He sat, closer than she had intended. You asked me once why my father disowned me. He waited, his eyes somber. It's hard to explain. I didn't even understand how it happened myself until long afterward, when it was all too late anyway. She took a deep breath. But somehow suddenly everyone in Buckleberry, that's the village closest to our, to Papa's house, was talking about me behind my back saying, she swallowed, unable to force the hateful words out, saying, saying that I was, that I, that I'd been fornicating with stable boys and grooms. 
she looked at him anguished. This was more than two years after Sam had left the country, you understand. Not that I'd ever... She shook her head. They weren't talking about Sam. Papa had kept that very quiet. But somehow it came out two years later only, vilely twisted and horribly exaggerated. They said... She broke off, her voice shaking. Her whole body was shaking. She forced it out. They said I'd been acting the whore for anyone in breeches, all over the parish, preferring farmhands to the attentions of gentlemen. He made a small sound. She didn't look at him. She couldn't, not until she had told him everything. It wasn't true, I promise you. But everyone seemed to believe it. Everyone was talking about it. Someone told Papa. Well, half the village seemed to have told Papa, including the vicar. But in particular, our neighbour, Papa's friend, Mr. Irwin, passed on all the dreadful stories. But they weren't true, none of them. Tears were rolling down her cheeks. None of it was true. Cal, I promise you, I never did any of those things. They were... Hush. He reached forward and placed his finger over her lips. I don't need you or anyone else to tell me those rumors were a pack of filthy lies. She blinked at him through her tears. Really? You believe me? I think I know you a little by now. His voice was gruff. Her mouth wobbled. Do you? Papa didn't seem to even after a lifetime. He nodded. I know you give yourself with reckless generosity, and I'm not talking about that swine who seduced you when you were seventeen. I'm talking about agreeing to marry a man you'd met a bare handful of times. None of them particularly auspicious. His voice deepened. You married me. You took on my wild girls, became their guide, their friend, and their defender. You took me on and showed me how to be a brother and an uncle and a husband. Her face crumpled. The tears were flowing faster now. You're reckless. You're loyal and you're true. I couldn't have found a better wife if I'd searched for a decade. Even if those vile rumours were true, and don't look at me like that, I know they're not. But even if they were, it would make no difference to me. He cupped her face in his hands and wiped away the tears with his thumbs. Marry in haste, Aunt Agatha said to me, but marrying you is the best thing I've ever done in my life. Oh, Cal! Tears flooded her again, and he drew her into his arms and started kissing them away. Don't worry about the rumors. We'll fix everything. How? I don't know yet, but we will. We'll face them down together, my dear, don't worry. There was a little pause, and then he said in quite a different tone, Now, since you're not feeling ill... How do I get to you through this amazingly thick and voluminous nightgown? She gave a tremulous laugh and showed him. He was such a gift, this dear, kind, trusting, honorable man. M ate to tell him how much she loved him, but it wasn't part of their arrangement. And though he'd made it clear he was pleased with their marriage and with her, he had never said anything to make her think he felt anything deeper towards her. It was gratitude he was talking about, and satisfaction with his choice of wife. She would hate to spoil everything by spouting words he could never return. She showed him instead. The next morning, despite their late night, they rose early, as usual, to go riding. At that hour, the few other people in the park were those who were also actually riding their horses instead of walking them in order to be seen and admired, as people did 
during the fashionable afternoon hours. It was fast becoming their family habit, as long as it wasn't pouring with rain. As soon as they reached the park and had a good gallop in the morning mist, the three girls rode off, their groom Kirk, a phlegmatic middle-aged Scotsman, following behind to keep an eye on them, while M and Cal walked their horses and talked. You said you didn't understand how the gossip happened until long afterward, Cal said, showing that it was on his mind as much as hers. So what did happen? I think it all came from Mr. Irwin, Papa's friend and our neighbor. Why do you think that? He wanted to marry me. He was younger than Papa, not quite forty, but of course to me at the time that seemed quite old. He'd asked me before and I'd refused every time. Cal gave her a sharp glance. He asked more than once? Oh, yes. She gave a humorless laugh. Easily a dozen times. But I wasn't interested. He didn't love me. I don't even think he liked me, really. He just pretended he did, flattering me and protesting undying love until it became quite irritating. You're sure he didn't love you? She shook her head. No, though at the time I took him at his word and tried to be kind but firm. Afterward, I realized he wanted my inheritance. I was Papa's only child, you see, and the estate is not entailed, so I was something of an heiress. So what changed? Why would he think spreading vile and untrue gossip about you would entice you to marry him? I suspect he was desperate for money. As for why he spread the rumors, I think his plan was to force me into marriage to save my reputation. It's what he urged Papa and me to do when the scandal broke, nobly offering to save me, saying that I would be able to hold my head up in church again once we were married and under his protection. Cal swore under his breath. I refused, of course, but I expected Papa to, to... To believe you? She nodded, close to tears again. But he didn't, because of Sam, you see. Nobody else knew about Sam, but I think Papa must have told Mr. Irwin at some stage, and that's what gave him the idea, and so Papa had precedent for believing in my bad behavior. They walked on a little. It was when he asked the vicar about it, and the vicar confirmed he too had heard the rumors. I think that's what tipped the balance. In the end, Papa gave me an ultimatum. Marry Mr. Irwin or leave his house. So you left? She nodded. I don't think Papa expected that of me at all, but I don't take kindly to being bullied, and I certainly wasn't going to be bullied into marrying a man I disliked because of something I didn't do. And so your father disowned you? She nodded. And then he died, and it was too late to mend things with him. It's the thing I most regret not being able to explain, to have him understand that I did nothing wrong, not since Sam. Tears clustered on her eyelashes. She blinked them away. Is this Irwin fellow still around? Cal asked in a voice that boded nothing good for the man. No, he married a rich widow from Manchester and went to live in the north. Strangely, he was the one who told me Papa had died and left me nothing. He was visiting Bath on his honeymoon with his new wife, and we bumped into each other in the street by accident. He had no idea I was living there, of course. She pondered the memory for a moment. I think it pleased him to tell me that. He was quite vindictive in the manner of telling me, as if it served me right for not marrying him. She shuddered. A vile man. A complete villain, Cal said quietly. He tried to destroy your life. She lifted her head and said resolutely, But he didn't succeed then, 
and I won't let it ruin my life again. She saw Rose waving in the distance. Come on, race you to where the girls are, and she took off on her lovely Arab mare. The gossip was spreading. When, later that day, M and the girls met Lady Peplow and her daughter Penelope for tea and ices at Gunter's, George had never eaten an ice before, Lady Peplow drew her aside, saying, I don't know if you've heard, my dear, but there is a nasty tale circulating about you. She gave M a clear look and added, I don't believe a word of it, of course. Anyone who has met you can see that, but it's quite nasty, and I thought I should warn you. For a moment, M was so surprised and touched, she couldn't say a thing. Lady Peplow laid a gloved hand on M's arm. I'm sorry I've shocked you. Perhaps I shouldn't have. No, you did exactly right, M smiled at the older woman. Very few people would have had the courage to tell me to my face, and I'm very grateful. More than grateful, in fact. Especially for your belief in me. You could not know the gossip was untrue. Of course I could, don't be silly. It seemed she had found a friend. M blinked away incipient tears. She was becoming a veritable watering pot. She straightened her spine and set herself to explain. They were lies, deliberately spread to discredit me and force me into... Oh, it is a long story. Lady Peplow glanced at the table where, despite the cold weather, the four girls were spooning up ice cream and nattering non-stop. They're happily occupied, and we can be quite private. Now, my dear, tell me what happened, and let us see what we can do to scotch these vicious rumours. The following day, Cal, M, and the girls returned home after their morning ride to find Aunt Agatha waiting for them. I wish to speak to you in private, she told M. Cal sent the girls on their way with a jerk of his head took M's hand and sat with her on the chaise long. What is it, Aunt Agatha? She gave M a narrow look. Are you sure you want Ashenden here? Quite sure, M answered. I have no secrets from my husband. Not any more, she thought guiltily. Aunt Agatha's brows rose. Very well, then. There is a disgraceful tale circulating that you had a lover, multiple lovers, in fact, before you married my nephew. Is it true? It's partly true. I had a lover just one, long before I met Cal. Outrageous! I knew you were unworthy of my nephew, but never did I imagine you were that kind of female. I'm not, M snapped. She'd had enough. She might regret Sam, might have been imprudent and reckless giving herself to him, but she would not go on being punished for it for the rest of her life. Her husband had accepted it, and that was good enough for her. She went on the attack. Did you never fall in love, Lady Salter? Never take a lover? To her amazement, the old lady flushed. None of your business, Miss Impertinence. M twirled her wedding ring. Mrs. Impertinence. Lady Impertinence, Cal interjected with a wink at M. Something settled inside her. She was not alone. He was here supporting her against all comers. Just as your past is your business and nobody else's, Lady Salter, so is mine except when it's your husband's and his family's and the whole wide world's besides. I went to my wedding a virgin. To your first wedding, perhaps, her nephew reminded her. In any case, Emmeline told me about her lover before the wedding, so what does it matter? If it hadn't already done so, 
Em's heart would have melted at the gallant lie. So you admit it brazenly, do you, Gell? Showing no remorse, no shame, no guilt? Em shrugged. What's done is done, spilt milk. Of course she regretted it, but she wasn't going to bear her soul to this horrid old tartar. The rumours say multiple lovers, grooms, stable boys, and farm boys, that you lay down in the fields and rutted whoever wanted you like a bitch on heat. Filthy slanderous, Cal exploded. M gripped his hand tightly and he calmed. It's not true, she said coolly. It was all a vicious campaign to force me into a marriage I didn't want. All the stories came from him. And for the third time in two days, M found herself explaining, only this time to a stiffly judgmental and hostile listener. When she'd finished, Lady Salter said nothing for a long time. Most edifying, she said at last. The truth of the matter is neither here nor there. It is the damage it can do now that matters. You've been invited to the Braxton's party the day after tomorrow, have you not? Cal confirmed it with a nod. You will not attend it. Send your apologies. Take your wife back to Oxfordshire, Ashenden. Keep her and the girls there until the season is about to start. Give it all time to blow over. Another newer scandal will have taken its place by then. No, M said. I'm going to the party. I won't run away and hide. I will face down these cowardly spreaders of old muck. I know from whom the story started this time. Who? Lady Salter demanded. A Mrs. Oates, nay Carmichael, who had it from her cousin, who lived in Bucklebury, the village I came from. I met her the other night. She's a nasty, spiteful piece of work, and I will not be bullied into leaving. I have nothing to be ashamed of. The old lady made a scornful noise. Confronting the mischief-makers would only give people more reason to believe there was truth to the tales. No smoke without fire. M gave an angry shrug. They will believe it anyway, and if I retreat, it will certainly confirm their suspicions. Lady Salter lifted her lorgnette and gave M a long, steady look. M lifted her chin and stared back, refusing to be cowed. Well then, Lady Salter folded her lorgnette with a snap and glared at M. If that's going to be your attitude, it is. The old lady gave a brisk nod. Excellent. Couldn't be better. Keep that up. I'll do my part and we'll see what we can do. Storm in a teacup. Stupid oats woman got the wrong end of the stick. Family solidarity. Ashenden, your arm. M blinked in shock as her husband helped his aunt rise. Had Lady Salter just said she would support M? At the door, the old woman paused and turned back. She pointed her cane at M. Never apologize, never back down. Show one shred of shame or fear, and the vultures will be on you in an instant. Ashenden, my carriage. As the carriage steps were let down, Aunt Agatha turned to Cal. She might be a nobody, but at least she has a spine. Chapter 21 but having done whate'er she could devise and emptied all her magazine of lies, the time approached. John Dryden, Iphis, and Ianthe. Cal, would you frank some letters for me? Letters, Rose? She gave a careless shrug. Just writing a few old school friends, exchanging news, that sort of thing. But if you don't want to frank them for me... She held a slender sheaf of letters, half a dozen or more. No, it's all right, I'll take them. There was something about the way Rose had asked, the almost 
ostentatiously casual nature of the request that raised his suspicions. Was she up to something? Had the weeks of good behavior come to an end? He took the letters into his office and checked them. They seemed harmless enough, all addressed to females, and most of them in London, Mayfair actually, so there was no need to put them through the postal service, let alone frank them, which, strictly speaking, was for government business. I'll send them off with a footman, he told Rose, who was hovering in the doorway. So they'll arrive today? Good. Thanks, Cal. She hurried off. He blinked. Regular exercise, shopping, and a social life seemed to have wrought a miracle in his sisters. Long may it last. Speaking of government business, it was time he checked on the status of the assassin affair. He handed the letters to Burton on the way out, who promised to have them delivered immediately and headed for Whitehall. Joe Gimble and his family were not Cal's only concerns this time. He wanted to ask Radcliffe's help in dealing with these vile rumours that were causing his wife sleepless nights. The Braxton's party was the following night. Radcliffe knew everyone. He was discreet and could keep confidence. No news of Gimble, Radcliffe said the moment Cal arrived. He was deep in paperwork. One thing you might be interested in, though, your drunken sharpshooter friend is dead. Dead? How? No suspicious circumstances. Fell down drunk in a gutter the other night. It's a toss-up whether he froze to death or drowned in a puddle. The state he was in, the fellow wasn't long for this world anyway. Cal agreed. Radcliffe looked up from his papers. Something else you wanted? Yes, but it's personal. Ah, those rumors about your wife, yes, nasty stuff. Bloody hell, that spread fast. Gill looked complacent. Everything comes to my ears. Now what can I do to help? Four boxes from the House of Chance had been delivered. Burton informed the Rutherford ladies when they returned from their morning ride the boxes were upstairs in the relevant bedchambers. Each box was clearly labelled with the name of the recipient. With squeals of excitement, the girls raced upstairs, breakfast forgotten. M gave Cal a rueful look. We won't be able to stop them going to the Braxton's party now. At her party, Lady Peplow had spoken to her friend Mrs. Braxton, who immediately sent a written invitation that included the three girls in M and Cal's invitation. At that stage, the nasty rumours about M hadn't surfaced. Naturally, the girls were excited to be invited to their first London party, but M had demurred, privately hoping Miss Chance wouldn't get the girls' gowns finished in time. She knew there would be some kind of scene at the Braxton's, had been metaphorically girding her loins for it, and she didn't want the girls to witness it, especially not for their first society party. We're going to have to tell them, Cal said. I know, but let's let them enjoy their dresses first. She wasn't in a hurry to see hers. She was dreading the night too much. So she and Cal went into the breakfast parlour and shared a quiet, companionable meal. Ahem. <clears throat> Burton stood at the door and cleared his throat portentously. His face was its usual bland self, but his eyes were dancing. May I present Lady Rose Rutherford? Rose, a vision in long white gloves and a gown of soft, dusky blue, glided in her head held high as if she were about to meet royalty, or as if she were royalty. The dress was perfect for a young lady who was not an ingenue, but who was nevertheless making her first appearance in society. It was simple yet sophisticated and floated around her body like dark flame. Oh, Rose, that's... M began, but Rose raised her hand as if to say stop, her expression stern. 
Clearly, they were to admire in silence. Rose looked at the butler and inclined her head graciously. A duchess in the making, Cal murmured in M's ear. He was rewarded with a ducal frown. Lady George Rutherford, intoned Burton from the doorway. George paced in like a lithe young leopard, not exactly the glide that Rose had achieved, but with a charm all of its own. She looked splendid in the gown of rose-tinged bronze, the gown cut to emphasize her high bosom, upright bearing, and slender legginess. By George, she's a stunner too, Cal murmured and M chuckled softly at his inadvertent pun. Hush, Rose hissed and turned to the door. And finally, I would like to present Lady Lily Rutherford, Burton said. M took one look at Lily framed in the doorway and clapped her hand over her mouth. Oh, my Cal, will you just look at Lily? She blinked away tears as Lily, proud and straight as a young duchess, glowing like a candle lit from within, glided into the room. Her dress was the softest, palest shade of peach, cut simply yet cunningly to frame her unique beauty. She looked as Miss Chance had promised, round and feminine and utterly delicious. Oh, Lord, my baby sister! I'm going to be beating them off with sticks, Cal groaned. Lily heard him, blushed, and gave a happy little twirl. Don't we all look pretty, Em? I think I love Miss Chance. Em nodded. She did too. So we can go to the party after all, Rose said. Now that the dresses have arrived, Em sighed. Yes, but run upstairs and change into a day gown first. There's something I need to explain to you, warn you about, actually, seeing as you're going to the party. Do you mean about those horrible stories people have been spreading about you? Rose said. Em's jaw dropped. You knew? All three girls nodded. Rose said. Penny Peplo told us the other day... Everybody knows. That's why we were so desperate to come, Lily added. Cal said, I thought all the subtle nagging was because you wanted to go to the party. We do, of course, George said. At least Rose and Lily do, though I don't think I'm going to like parties much. But you don't imagine we'd let M face those bitches alone, do you? M had a large lump in her throat. The dear, sweet, loyal girls. But you're not allowed to punch that oats woman, George. Remember you promised, Rose said severely. Or slap her, Lily added. No matter how much she deserves it. All right, but I still don't see why, George grumbled. Because we are family now, and what one family member does affects the reputation of the others, Lily said, echoing something that M had said an age ago. If you punch that horrid woman, it will reflect badly on M. M's mouth trembled. She pressed her lips together, striving for composure, unable to speak, deeply moved by their unquestioning support and their faith in her. Seeing her dilemma, Cal slid an arm around her. That's what happens when you're a family. We're all going to be there tonight, even Aunt Agatha. Aunt Agatha, the girls chorused. He nodded. Facing down the hounds of hell, George corrected him. Not the hounds, the bitches. There was a sudden hush in the Braxton ballroom when M and Cal entered, followed by the three girls. Their names hadn't been announced. It was just an informal party. But the hush, followed by a buzz of conversation, showed that people knew 
that either they had or hadn't expected M to show up, and that now they were speculating as to what might happen. Cal led them to a line of seats opposite the entrance. M had told him she wanted to be there if and when Mrs. Oates arrived. She intended to have words with the woman. He seated them and then went to fetch champagne for her and the girls. M smoothed her skirt. Miss Chance had sent her a dress in pale jonquil silk. It was beautiful, but M was wound up tight as a spring and couldn't enjoy it as she wanted. She sat up suddenly, spying a familiar face. Look, isn't that Sally Destry? Lady Malden, I mean? Sally was looking very different from the sensitive young schoolgirl M remembered, very dashing and fashionable and confident-looking. I hope she hasn't heard what's been said about me. I must have a word, oh. But then I might miss the guests arriving. She hovered indecisively. It wasn't like her. And there's Susie Morton from school as well, Lily commented. She married some Viscount, I forget his name, Viscount Burford, Rose said. And see who she's with tonight, Julia Hampton. Goodness me, what a lot of former Mallard girls there are here tonight, M exclaimed, noticing several more. I had no idea they were all in London, and what a coincidence that they're all at the same party. Of all the nights, oh... I almost wish we hadn't come. An amazing coincidence, Cal said. He recognized some of those names from certain letters recently delivered. Rose smiled at him. Isn't it just? M stiffened. There she is, Mrs. Oates. She handed Cal her glass. Right, I want this over and done with. I'll just... Oh, for as Mrs. Oates entered the room on her husband's arm, a group of dashing and elegant young women, led by the former Sally Destry, linked arms with her and bore her gaily off to an adjoining anteroom. She went with them, flushed and laughing. M counted five former Mallard girls. M sat back down with a thump. They must be friends of hers. How very disappointing. I'll have to wait until she comes out. I don't want to involve anyone else. Cal handed her a champagne glass. She emptied it in one gulp. There's your aunt, Cal. Aunt Agatha entered, dressed magnificently in silver and deep claret. She gave M and Cal a gruff nod and started to move toward a group of her cronies. Then she noticed her three nieces and stopped in mid-step. The elegantly plucked brows drew together. She pulled out her lorgnette and gave each one of them a long, unnerving scrutiny. Her forehead furrowed a moment, then she turned away. All three girls heaved a sigh of relief. I thought for a minute she was going to come over and yell at us for not getting our gowns from all tents, Rose said. Yes, and if she had told me I looked fat in this, I would have had to kill her, Lily said. Rose laughed. Silly, you don't look fat. Haven't you noticed the admiring glances you've been getting? Cal had. He was torn between wanting to protect his wife from the vicious rumours and wanting to lock his sisters and niece in a tower, or at least throwing a blanket over them to stop all those fellows from staring. Lily's dress was perfectly modest and covered her quite adequately, and yet... He gritted his teeth. Rose and George's dresses were no better. Cal speared an icy glare at a pair of dandified young fellows who looked as though they were nerving themselves to come over and meet the girls. The boys blanched, straightened their cravats and strolled away, trying to look unconcerned. 
One of them glanced back. Cal bared his teeth, and the lad recoiled, bumping into a dowager who gave him a blistering rebuke. Served him right. It was just a taste of things to come, Cal thought gloomily. The season was going to be hell. They're out, M jumped to her feet. The dashing young women emerged from the anteroom with Mrs. Oates. Now, but just as they released her, Lady Peplow, Mrs. Braxton, and some of their friends took Mrs. Oates's arm and led her back in. What's going on? M gave Cal a puzzled glance. Cal shrugged, snagged another glass of champagne from a passing waiter, and gave it to his wife. You don't think they're... No, she sipped thoughtfully. I don't suppose... And shook her head. Cal didn't know what was going on, but he was pretty sure the nasty young woman was getting an earful from Lady Peplow and her friends. As for the fashionable young women who'd carried her away so gaily the first time, whatever they'd said to her hadn't been anything gay or frivolous. She had emerged from the anteroom, looking quite shaken. From the corner of his eye, Cal noticed Radcliffe was here. Even as he watched, Radcliffe casually drew Jeremy Oates into their group. Oates, a pushy fellow at the best of times, looked very flattered to be included in such company. So he might. The group included several of the most important and influential men in London and the city. As he watched, they drifted quietly out onto the balcony. Interesting. He would love to hear what they said, but his place was with his wife. Ten minutes later, Mrs. Oates emerged from the anteroom, looking rattled and sulky. She glanced around the room, looking for her husband, he supposed. Finally, M set down her glass for the third time. It was very wearing, waiting, nerving herself for the confrontation, and then having to put it off again, knowing all the while that people were watching though pretending not to. She would be glad to get it over with. But what was this? Lady Peplow and Mrs. Braxton were escorting Mrs. Oates toward her. The crowd in the middle of the floor parted, like the Red Sea. M rose a little shakily to her feet. What was going on? It wasn't what she'd planned at all, not a public confrontation like this. She wanted the privacy of the anteroom. Nerves fluttered in her stomach. She straightened her shoulders. Get it over now and be done with it. She took several deep breaths, not too many or she'd feel dizzy. An expectant hush filled the room. People edged closer, the better to hear and see. Lady Ashenden? Lady Peplow said. Her voice was clear and well modulated. It also carried. This misguided young woman repeated a number of false and nasty stories about you last week at my party. She's admitted it here tonight. And at my party she wishes to apologize, Mrs. Braxton said. Don't you, Mrs. Oates? Mrs. Oates looked trapped and furious, and anything but remorseful. She wrenched herself out of the two-society matron's grip and tried to escape. She moved to the left. A steely line of grim-visaged dowagers stepped forward, blocking her escape. Aunt Agatha and her cronies. She turned to the right. Five former Mallard girls linked arms and blocked her way with ferocious gaiety. Behind M, Rose and Lily chanted softly. Three duchesses, two marchionesses, five countesses, six viscountesses, and George joined in, and a dowager with a lorgnette. M blinked rapidly. She would not cry, she would not. 
Mrs. Oates looked around the room looking for support. She found none. Oh, what's the fuss about? It was just a bit of harmless fun. Everyone gossips after all. Nobody said a word. All right, then, she said pettishly. I'm very sorry I gossiped about you, Lady Ashenden. My cousin knew it wasn't true, by the way. Most people did. Stuck up and straight-laced, that's what we called you. She turned to Mrs. Braxton. There, will that do? Can I go now? It was a travesty of an apology. M itched to slap the nasty creature silly. Her fingers had curled into fists with the effort of not doing so, but she occupied the moral high ground. Dignity and grace in victory was what she must strive for now. It was what she'd taught the girls. We are a family now, and what one family member does affects the reputation of the others. Lady Peplo and Mrs. Braxton were waiting, as was the entire room. The apology was blatantly insincere, but indirectly it had cleared M's name. Stuck up and straight-laced, that's what we called you? Nobody could mistake the petty adolescent jealousy in that. M stared at Mrs. Oates with her coldest teacherly withering look. After a moment, the woman reddened a little and dropped her gaze. It would have to do. M gave Lady Peplow and Mrs. Braxton a stiff nod. They released Mrs. Oates, who flounced away and seized her husband's arm. Jeremy, these women are... Shut up, Fanny. You're an embarrassment. We're leaving. Everyone watched as her husband led her from the room, his face beat red and furious. She looked sulky and petulant. This party was a dead bore anyway, she said loudly as they exited. I left something in the cloakroom, Rose said suddenly and hurried toward the exit. A moment later, M, and everyone in the ballroom heard Rose say, Mrs. Oates, a moment, please. Then the sound of a loud, stinging slap followed by a howl of pain and outrage. Nobody moved or spoke. An instant later, Rose entered the ballroom head high, looking like the cat that ate the cream. She crossed the ballroom, a young Boadicea dressed in flames of dusky blue. There was a spatter of applause quickly hushed and everyone immediately started talking and trying to suppress smiles. Rose rejoined her family. You said I wasn't allowed to punch her, George said indignantly. You made me promise. I didn't punch her, Rose said with dignity. I slapped her. And then she grinned like a mischievous urchin. A good hard one it was too. Did you hear the bitch yell? M, caught between laughter and tears, just shook her head. Aunt Agatha arrived. You handled that well, Emmeline. She turned to Rose. But you? Rose raised her chin defiantly. You have something to say to me, Aunt Agatha? Her aunt sniffed. You, young lady, have possibilities. And that's all I'm going to say. That's a relief, George murmured. I might be old, but I'm not deaf, Georgiana. Lily? She turned the lorgnette on Lily's dress. They all tensed. Pretty dress, it suits you. Leaving them all breathless with shock, Aunt Agatha stumped regally away. Suddenly, it was as if a weight had been lifted off the entire party. The musicians struck up a lively country dance, and in moments the floor was full of laughing, twirling men and women, dancing as if they had not a care in the world. M 
relieved and a little dazed at the way events had turned out, sat for a moment watching her girls dancing, her dear, dear girls. All eight of them, Rose, George, Lily, and the girls from Miss Mallard's, who'd rallied around to support M in her hour of need. She would talk to them later, thank them, and catch up with their news. She sipped champagne and smiled to herself. Three duchesses, two marchionesses, five countesses, six viscountesses. She looked across to where Aunt Agatha was laying down the law to some hapless minion, and a dowager with a lorgnette. She smiled at Lady Peplow and Mrs. Braxton, and some friends she didn't know she had. She felt the warmth of a large hand on her shoulder. And throughout it all, standing quietly in the background, her rock, her love, her husband, he bent over her. Do you want to dance? She shook her head. Later, you go on and circulate. I just want to sit for a while. She tried not to be disappointed when he took her advice and moved away. Chapter 22 Take hope from the heart of man, and you make him a beast of prey. Guida, Marie-Louise de la Ramee. Cal found Radcliffe and thanked him for coming. What did you and your friends say to that harpy's husband? Radcliffe smiled. Oates and his foolish wife are dedicated social climbers, and Oates has been angling for a knighthood but he's also a businessman to the core. When we pointed out to him that his wife's so-called harmless gossip could endanger his business prospects as well as the knighthood, well, I'd be surprised if we heard much from her in the future. He's quite ruthless in business. At home. He shrugged. Thank you. Radcliffe waved his thanks away. Not sure it was necessary. The ladies carried it, I think. Those young women, Lady Malden, Lady Burford, Hampton's girl, and the rest make up a set she's long been trying to become part of. The dashing, younger set, future leaders of the ton. They took her aside and threatened to ostracize her. How could you possibly know that? Radcliffe smiled, sphinx-like which was all the answer Cal knew he'd get. You put on a good show there, family and friends rallying around, public show of support for your wife. Well done. Surprised your father-in-law didn't show, though. Cal frowned. My father-in-law? If you mean my wife's father, he's dead. Ratcliffe gave him a sharp look. Sir Humphrey? Dead? I didn't know that. When did he die? Cal looked at him oddly. Years ago. Ah, I thought you meant he'd died in the last week or so. But now I come to think of it, if that were the case, your wife wouldn't be dancing at parties, would she? He's not dead. Cal glanced over to where his wife was now dancing with some fellow. He lowered his voice. Are you saying my wife's father... Sir Humphrey Westwood of Bucklebury in Berkshire is alive. Radcliffe nodded. Became something of a recluse in the last seven or eight years, I believe, but otherwise, as far as I know, he's hale and hearty. Cal's brain was spinning. Would you mind not mentioning that to my wife or anyone else, just until I can confirm it? Radcliffe gave an indifferent shrug. You know me, I'm a vault. Thank you, I'll call on you tomorrow. What for? I can tell you now, there's no news of the assassin fellow. I'm beginning to think we were mistaken about him. I think he's fled the country. No, it's not about him, Cal said. I'm coming in to formally resign my commission. You were right, I'm needed here. Cal and his family rode out the morning after the Braxton party, a little later than usual, 
not only because of the party, but because his wife had been in a strange mood, emotional, exhilarated, and several times on the verge of tears, and very, very affectionate. They'd made love three times during the night, and each time she had made love to him, taking the lead, lavishing on him every skill he'd taught her, and a few she was making up as she went along. They were so attuned to each other's bodies now, the experience was deeper, more intense, and after the triumph of last night, more joyous. Cal would have been happy to spend the morning in bed, but she rose bright and happy and eager for her morning ride. He had offered her a different kind of ride, and she had laughed a joyous peal of delight and reminded him the girls would be waiting. In this mood, she was irresistible, and Cal had crawled out of bed and was now glad he had. It was a glorious morning, crisp but clear, and to see his wife and sisters and niece laughing and chattering as they picked over the evening's events made him feel... Well, he couldn't name the feeling, but it filled his chest. He hadn't yet told Emmeline of the decision he had made a few days before, the decision to resign his commission and take up his life here. He'd never really considered the future before. By necessity, he'd lived more or less from day to day. Now... He looked at his wife on her spirited little grey mare. He had a future now, and a purpose. They raced at first, and George won. She was a sight to behold on horseback. His sisters were good, but she... She had mastered the side saddle and was now teaching Sultan to jump with it, starting with fallen tree trunks. And whenever she jumped, he caught a glimpse of breaches beneath her smart London habit. The girls cantered off, their groom following, and as had become part of their morning routine, Cal and Em walked their horses quietly and talked. I didn't expect to be supported, she told him. Not like that. I knew you'd support me. She reached out to him and they held hands for a minute before the horses parted them. I've been so alone for so long, surrounded by people yet essentially on my own, and facing a lifetime alone. And I thought I was content with that, honestly I was. But last night, when people, the girls, the Mallard girls especially, most of whom I thought had forgotten me the moment they left school, and Aunt Agatha, and, oh, everyone, came forward to support me. I was un... unwomaned by their generosity, Cal. He nodded. It had renewed his belief in basic human goodness. Cal, she said abruptly, in quite a different voice. What is that man doing? She pointed. There's a man crouched in that tree, and he's got a... Several things happened at once. Just as the man in the tree swung a rifle up in an action that curdled Cal's blood, George, screaming like a banshee, galloped up to the tree and flung something. There was a loud bang, and the man overbalanced, flailing wildly. He twisted to grab a branch, dropped his rifle, and fell to the ground with a loud thud. He didn't move. Cal swung around to his wife. Em, are you all right? She was pale, but nodded shakily. Fine, you? Cal breathed again. He missed, thank God. Stay here, I'll see to it. He galloped toward the tree, shouting, George, stay away, to his niece, who was about to dismount. He's alive, I think, she said, but he doesn't seem to be able to move. Cal flung himself off his horse and bent over the man. His eyes were open, but he was breathing with difficulty. 
From the angle at which he lay, Cal thought he might have broken his spine. Joe Gimble? The man tried to nod, couldn't, and grunted. It confirmed Cal's suspicions. This man was dying. Keep everyone away, George, he said quietly, and turned back to Gimble. You're the scorpion. There was a short silence, then the man rasped. Dying, ain't I? A bubble of blood came from his mouth. Yes. There was no point pretending otherwise. Soldiers were realists. Wanted you. My last kill. Bastard. Gimble gasped. Lock up. Wife. Children. Not me, Cal said. I had no part of that. Jerry. Told me. You. Jerry was the name of the drunk who'd died. It all fitted. It wasn't me, but don't worry, your wife and sister-in-law and children, they'll be released. They will be all right, my word on it. The man swore. Going to America, brother. I know about your brother Bert in America. I'll make sure they get there. Gimble struggled for breath. There was blood in his mouth. His eyes were desperate. Promise? I promise. Gimble looked at him. Money in pocket. Give. Wife? Cal felt in the man's pocket and found a thick roll of notes. He held it so Gimble could see it. I'll make sure this goes to your wife and no one else. My word of honor. Again, Gimble tried to nod and couldn't. He was fading fast. Tell her. Love. Blood bubbled from his mouth as the man who'd been the scorpion breathed his last breath. There was a long silence, broken only by the breeze in the bushes and the far distant sound of the city waking up. Is he dead? Cal looked around. It was M. She sounded shaken. The girls waited a short distance away, watching with somber eyes. Em's horse took a few steps closer. He straightened. Don't come any closer, Em. It's not a pretty sight. I'll wait here with the body while you and the girls go for help. Her horse took two more steps toward him. The thing is, Em said in an odd voice, she was as pale as parchment. He didn't miss after all. I love you, Cal. And she toppled off her horse in a dead faint. Cal leapt to catch her. He lowered her to the ground and, frantic, ripped open her jacket. The shirt beneath was soaked with blood. Cal ripped open M's blouse. Somebody screamed. Her whole chest and shoulder was covered in blood. He found the source of blood, a shoulder wound, and breathed again. It was serious, but not necessarily fatal. Not if she got good, swift medical attention, and if no infection came afterward. Infection was usually the killer, not the wound itself. He yanked off his coat and waistcoat and ripped off his neckcloth and shirt. He bared her shoulder, folded his shirt into a thick pad, and tied it on with his neckcloth. He looked around. The groom Kirk stood holding the reins of Cal's and his own horse. Cal waved him closer. I'm going to take Lady Ashenden up with me. Wouldn't a carriage? Rose began. No time. Cal mounted his horse. Lift her up to me, Kirk, gently. He held out his arms. Kirk bent and carefully scooped M up, then placed her in Cal's arms. She was as pale as paper. Cal's heart thudded painfully in his chest. She wasn't dead, and she wasn't going to be, not if he had any say in the matter. Not until next century or longer. Rose, George, you two ride ahead and let Burton know what's happened. Tell him to fetch a doctor. 
one who understands bullet wounds. The girls galloped off. Lily, I want you to walk your horse beside me and help me. If she needs anything, if my horse stumbles, my hands are full. I'll do whatever is needed, Cal, don't worry. And Kirk. I'll stay with this fellow's body, my lord, Kirk said. Off you go. Lily took his horse's reins and led them toward the park exit. A part of Cal wished they could ride ventre a terre and get a doctor as soon as possible. But of course, they had to walk so as not to jolt Em's wound any more than necessary. He cradled her against his bare chest. Her stillness, her pallor frightened him. He told himself she would recover. A shoulder wound wasn't so bad. He had had two himself. But this was M, his wife, the convenient wife he was now sure he couldn't live without or wouldn't want to. I love you, Cal, the first time she had ever said it. Why? Because she thought she was dying. Joe Gimble had asked Cal to tell his wife he loved her, was that what people said when they thought they were dying? He gazed down at the face of his pale, frighteningly still wife. Maybe it took death or the threat of death to jolt people into the realization that they loved. Because in that moment, when he'd ripped open her coat and saw her awash in her own blood, it had struck him like a thunderbolt that he loved her, loved this dear, precious woman with every part of his body and soul, and that he'd never told her. He bent and put his mouth to her ear. I love you, Em, he said. Do you hear me? I love you. You're going to be all right. And I love you. Lily looked over and said gently, she knows you do, Cal. How? he said, anguished. How could she know? I've never told her, Lil, never once. He hadn't even realized he did, let alone how much, until now. His little sister smiled. We know you love M, Cal. And if we do, she must. And when she wakes up, you can tell her. Oh, God, he hoped so. Did I happen to mention that I love you? M, propped up against her pillows in bed, smiled. Only about a dozen times. And that was just this morning. I think it was more like fifty yesterday. Cal bent and kissed her gently. Just so you remember. It was three days since she had been wounded. There was no sign of fever or infection. She was making a good recovery. The doctor who'd attended her was physician and surgeon both, a rare combination, and had attended troops in the war. He'd extracted the bullet, skillfully, and had given M laudanum for the pain and some powders for the fever that usually followed bullet wounds. He'd also given the nod to Cal's sister's suggestions of willow bark tea, reputed to be good for counteracting fever. Apparently, they'd picked up a smattering of sick room remedies from conversations in the pump room. Would you mind if I left you now? I have some business to attend to. She nodded sleepily. I'm ridiculously tired. I think I'll have a nap she grimaced. Another one. Cal went first to Whitehall. So, you meant it about resigning your commission, Radcliffe said. I did. Cal handed him the signed papers. Because you have a family to care for now. How's your wife, by the way? Recovering well, thank you. Cal blamed himself for her injury. If he hadn't come hunting for the assassin in the first place, he'd never have met and married her. He just wished she and the girls hadn't been there when Gimble shot at him. But if they hadn't, 
Cal would probably be dead. Have the Gimbel family been released? Radcliffe nodded. A few hours ago. Not yesterday? Or the day Gimbel was killed? Radcliffe shrugged. There were things to follow up, the funeral to arrange. I'll pay for it. Radcliffe looked up in surprise. The funeral? Cal nodded. They don't have much. They'll need every penny they have to get to America. He hadn't told Radcliffe about the money Gimbel had on him. Radcliffe would want to confiscate it. I'm going to pay their fares to America, too. Good Lord, what's gotten into you? Founding an Assassin's Benevolent Society? Just balancing the score. The wife and children weren't responsible for what he did. Radcliffe gave him a shrewd look. You're not feeling guilty, are you? Because guilt is pointless for the likes of us. Cal didn't agree. I think the likes of us haven't been doing as good a job as we should. That's partly why I've resigned my commission. Europe is one thing but there are things to be done in England, a future to be forged. Very laudable. Cal didn't bother trying to explain the deep disillusion he'd felt, seeing what had become of England's former soldiers. For so long he had hated Gimbel, hated him with a righteous passion. But as his enemy lay dying, Cal saw that he was just a man like any other, who loved his wife and children and worried about their future. A murderer, but not wholly evil. And perhaps it wasn't entirely Gimbel's fault. This country had taken men like Bert and Joe Gimbel and the others Cal had met, taught them to shoot and to kill, and then, when the war was over, tossed them back to their former lives, into a country in dire economic turmoil, without care whether they starved or not. Could he really blame Gimble for using the only skill he had to try to earn enough money to give his family a fresh start in a young country? But Radcliffe would never see it like that. They'll be at the aunt's house then? Radcliffe nodded, occupied with his paperwork again. Cal saw himself out. The Gimbel family received Cal's visit with suspicion, if not outright hostility. He couldn't blame them. The woman who answered the door wouldn't open it more than a crack until he said, I was with Joe when he died. I didn't kill him. He fell from a tree and broke his neck. But I was there. And before he died, he gave me a message for his wife and children. Would that be you? Grudgingly, she opened the door and gestured for him to come in. Her eyes were red with weeping. The three children gathered around her, the little ones clutching her skirt. The young boy stood stiffly apart, his eyes full of grief and anger. I'm sorry for your loss, he said to Joe's widow, though in all honesty, he couldn't be sorry Joe Gimble was dead. Joe died quickly and in no pain. He didn't know if the latter was true, but he was comforting the living. I have made arrangements to pay for Joe's funeral. He won't be going in a pauper's grave. Why? Mrs. Gimble said bitterly. Feeling guilty? Not guilty, but partly responsible. What was between Joe and me was nothing to do with his family, and I'm sorry you were imprisoned. I had no part of that. She eyed him skeptically a moment, then gave a reluctant nod. You said Joe had a message for us. Cal pulled out the roll of notes to which he had added tickets for a passage to America for two women and three children, not steerage either. He gave me this to give to you. She stared at the roll of money, likely more than she had seen in her life. She gave him a disbelieving look. 
Cal nodded, and she reached out a trembling hand and took the money, clutching it to her chest as if frightened he'd snatch it back. Tickets to America are in there for you, your sister, and the children. She nodded, her mouth working. Joe's last words were to tell you he loved you. Her face crumpled, her eyes flooded with tears. She gave a loud sob and fled the room. Cal looked down at the boy. I watched you, the day they took you all away to prison. The way a person behaves in a crisis is very revealing of character. The boy watched him from narrowed, suspicious eyes. You took care of the little ones, and you helped your mother and aunt. Gotta, the boy muttered. I got to be the man of the family when Dar's away. His face struggled as he remembered his father was never coming back. Your father said he was very proud of you. The boy turned away abruptly, his hands over his eyes. You're a son any man would be proud of, Cal said, and quietly let himself out. He told M about it that night. She lay snuggled against his chest. She wept a few tears when he told her about Mrs. Gimble and the money, and about what he'd said to the young boy. You're a good man, Calborn Rutherford. No wonder I love you so much. They kissed then, but softly, because her shoulder was still painful and he didn't want to jar her. He ached to be able to make love to her again, this time in the full knowledge that he loved her and that she loved him. The glow in her eyes told him she felt the same. So you're not going back to Europe? No, I've resigned my commission. What are you going to do? Become the Earl of Ashenden? You already are the Earl of Ashenden. He shook his head. In name only, I'm afraid. There's a lot more work to be done. Speaking of which, I have to go out of town for a few days. I hope you don't mind. No, of course not. I'm stuck in this bed until Dr. Duncan says I can get up. Bed rest? For a shoulder injury? When Cal was shot in the shoulder, he had been back at work the minute the fever had passed. But probably women were more delicate than men. Where are you going? He rose from the bed and stirred up the coals in the fire. It didn't need tending, but he couldn't lie to her face. To the country, just some estate business. I hope to be back in a few days. The village of Bucklebury was quiet and pretty. At the local inn, Cal asked directions to the home of Sir Humphrey Westwood and was soon bowling up the driveway of Westwood House, a rather grander place than M had led him to believe. He presented his card at the door, the elderly butler took it with a sorrowful air. Sir Humphrey rarely receives visitors these days, my lord. I think he'll want to see me, Cal said. I'm his son-in-law. The butler's eyes widened, then his face lit up. You have news of Miss M? She's Lady Ashenden now, Cal said proudly. The butler's hopeful gaze shifted to the travelling carriage. She's not, no, but I'm hoping to bring Sir Humphrey to her in London. The butler's eyes filled with tears. He hasn't been off the estate since he came home nearly seven years ago after combing the country for weeks, looking for signs of her. Broken-hearted he was, to come home alone. Cal's sympathy was limited. The man should have had more faith in his daughter in the first place. But he wasn't here to rake over old coals, but to heal old wounds. Take me to Sir Humphrey. 
Chapter 23 The voice of conscience is so delicate that it is easy to stifle it, but it is also so clear that it is impossible to mistake it. Madame de Stahl, Germany M was upstairs getting dressed when Cal arrived home four days later. Burton told him the doctor had just left. He had given her permission to be out of bed and moving around again. When she saw him, she ran toward him, flung her arms around him and then winced. Forgot my stupid shoulder. Kiss me, Cal, darling. I know it's only been a few days, but you wouldn't believe how much I've missed you. He proceeded to demonstrate that he had, in fact, missed her much more. She drew him toward the bed, saying, The doctor said it's all right. Cal abruptly recalled himself. He drew back. Not yet, I forgot to tell you. You have a visitor downstairs who's very eager to see you. She sighed. People have been very kind. You have no idea how many callers and flowers and succession house fruits I've received. I didn't even know I knew so many people. In fact, I don't. I think it's mostly because shortly after I weathered a horrid scandal, I was shot by a notorious assassin, and thus I have become something of a celebrity. It's all a bit overwhelming. Let us hope people soon find something else to fuss over. She paused and said mischievously, Do I really want to see this visitor? I could still be confined to bed, you know. It was tempting, but this couldn't wait. Besides, when he finally took his wife to bed, he wouldn't want to leave it for a week. He offered his arm. You do want to see him, and he very much wants to see you. Come, my lady, I'll escort you downstairs. Oh, very well, if I must. She took his arm. She was still holding Cal's arm when he signalled for Logan to open the sitting room door, and Cal was glad of it, because when she saw the stiff, pale-faced gentleman who rose nervously to greet her, she stumbled and almost fainted again. Papa? she whispered. Papa, is it really you? But I thought... Oh, Papa! and she ran across the room and flung herself weeping into her father's arms. An evening followed then of tears, apologies, explanations, and forgiveness. Sir Humphrey was so obviously grieved at the breach with his daughter, blamed himself so savagely by being taken in, was so remorseful at not having more faith in his daughter, and so very apologetic, that even Cal forgave him. M, of course, had forgiven him long ago. Just one thing now puzzled her. Papa, when you were searching for me, why did you never think to look for me in Bath? Did it never occur to you I would seek refuge with Miss Mallard? He shook his head. Why would it? You hated that place. You wrote me long letters every week, begging, pleading, imploring me to rescue you from that dreadful place and bring you home. And don't shake your head at me, Em. I still have every one of your letters, a large stack. He indicated how large with his hands. Yes, of course, I kept them. I've read them over and over since you left. They were all I had left of you. His voice broke and when he had mastered himself, he added almost to himself, you hated that place. Yes, when I was first sent there, I did, she agreed gently. But I was thirteen then, and after a while I got used to it. I didn't know. You never said, not in any of your letters. I suppose I didn't. She gave him a tremulous smile. But we've found each other now. He took her hands in his. Yes, we've found each other now. When the girls came home from their outing, they were amazed to discover they had a new relative. 
dinner lasted a long time, with reminiscences, happy ones now, and plans for the future. When M escorted her father up to the best guest bedroom, for of course her dear papa was not allowed to stay in some horrid hotel or club when his home was here with his family, he was a man who looked ten years younger than the man Cal had first met a bare handful of days before. And M? M just glowed with happiness. A few weeks later, Cal received a note from Gil Radcliffe. Dear Ashenden, took the liberty of inquiring into the situation of that Irwin fellow. It might gratify you to know his situation is far from happy. The widow he married is a harridan of the first degree, a grim-faced harpy with the disposition of a peevish rat. She was and is immensely rich, but the fool didn't make any further inquiries before he married her. He got nothing. It was all tied up in trusts. She holds the purse strings. He has to ask her for every penny, and she keeps him on a very tight rein. I'm told he's about as miserable as a man can be. She is as healthy as a cow, and no doubt he would dream of killing her except that she's made it known far and wide that he gets nothing in her will. I don't know what Irwin was like when your wife knew him, but these days he's a miserable whipped dog of a man. Of course, if you still wish to track him down and give him the thrashing he deserves, you could— but I hardly think it's necessary. It might actually gain him some sympathy. Revenge might be a dish best eaten cold, but sometimes it's just not practical. Yours, etc., Radcliffe. Epilogue Thou art my life, my love, my heart, the very eyes of me, and hast command of every part to live and die for thee. Robert Herrick, to Anthea, who may command him anything. Three months later It was the night before the grand ball to launch the three Rutherford girls, for weeks the household had been a frenzy of preparation. Cal lay in bed with M. I should have just auctioned off those dratted girls, he grumbled. There's been more planning and fuss over this one ball than there was for an entire campaign against Boney. It's completely exhausted you. She laughed. No, you've exhausted me, she stretched languorously. They'd made love, dozed off, woken, and made love again. And now they were in that post-coital state of quiet bliss. It's all working out, isn't it, Cal? Couldn't be better. Even Aunt Agatha approves of you now. She gave him a shocked look. Who, me? The badly dressed nobody who dared to marry into the Rutherford family? You might be a nobody he informed her loftily, but at least you have a spine. He'd told her about that one, of course. She laughed. I'm glad she approves of my spine. I approve of it too, he said, demonstrating. After a while, she said, I didn't mean that. I meant our marriage. Are you happy with how it's all going? He wrapped his arms around her. Do you even need to ask? Not really, it's just... Everything changed so quickly, and I know it's not what you wanted when you asked me to marry you. So sometimes I wonder, I mean, 
I'm happy, and you seem happy enough, but... Well, now you come to ask me, I have to admit that things haven't turned out the way I wanted them at all. Not at all, he said severely. You were supposed to be a convenient wife. I married you for one reason and one reason only. To look after the girls, I know, and I did, I do. You did, you do, he acknowledged grudgingly. But what of all the other things you did that were not part of the bargain? You mean all the trouble I caused you? Exactly. You turned my big, gloomy house into a home. He fixed her with an indignant look. What's more, you filled it with laughter and flowers. I'm sorry, she said humbly. So you should be. And then you turned a lonely man and three unhappy girls into a family, turned my life upside down you did without so much as a by your leave. She clapped her hands to her cheeks in dismay. Oh dear, did you want to buy your leave, Lord Ashenden? Lady impudence, I didn't know what I wanted. He kissed her. But you gave it to me anyway. He kissed her again. You gave me a purpose in life, a home, a family, and most of all you gave me yourself, my strong, loving, loyal, beautiful, not beautiful. Don't argue. I said beautiful and I meant beautiful. Now where was I? Oh yes, I thought I was one of the cold-hearted Rutherford men, immune to love. But you, my beautiful precious one, are the love of my life. He cupped her face in his hands. I love you, Emmeline, Margaret, Westwood, Rutherford, with all my heart with all my body and all my soul, and I, thee, worship. He punctuated each word with a kiss. Oh, Cal, she said tremulously. After a long, loving interlude, when they lay quietly in the aftermath, M said quietly, There's something else you should know. What? Remember how I've been getting tired a lot lately? And how I've been weeping at the drop of a hat. She took his hand, placed it on her stomach, and said mistily, I'm afraid I'm going to turn your life upside down again. This concludes Marry in Haste by Anne Gracie. Narrated by Charlotte Ann Dorr. Copyright 2017 by Anne Gracie. This unabridged audiobook is recorded by arrangement with the Berkeley Publishing Group, an imprint of Penguin Publishing Group, a division of Penguin Random House LLC, and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor. Dot com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers.